Welcome to Learn It Training. The exercise files for today's course are located in the video description below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hello everyone, I am Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to Tableau Video Training Course. Tableau is a visual analytics platform that makes it easier for people to explore and manage data and faster to discover and share insights that can change businesses and the world. It helps people and organizations be more data-driven. Tableau supports data prep, analysis, governance, collaboration, and more. As a continuation of the Tableau introduction video training course, this advanced course is designed to boost the student's competence when it comes to creating visualizations and creating dashboards. The course goes into considerable detail on these two subjects and explores, among other areas, how to create a range of different charts, maps, user-defined fields, as well as a host of advanced features and abilities. We'll start by connecting to a variety of data sources. This will leave you with some great workbooks to practice on and develop on your own after this course. Then we'll move into creating a wide variety of charts, including univariate. Looking to support our channel and get a great deal? Become a member today to unlock ad-free videos. That's right, your favorite courses without a single ad. Interested in a specific video? Purchase one of our ad-free courses individually. Looking for even more? Gain access to exams, certificates, and exclusive content at learnitanytime.com. More information can be found in the video description below. The first module will focus on connecting to data sources. Now, it has eight lessons in this module, and we'll start by connecting to text, Excel, and access files. I have the files for you in the video description and they're listed on this slide. So you're gonna want to grab US cities population. That is a text file. Airline comparison is an Excel file. And there is an access database file called Northwind that you're gonna to wanna to grab as well. But wait, hold on, there's more that you're gonna grab before we're done with this slide. In the second lesson, you're gonna learn how to paste in a data source from the clipboard. And we'll be using two different Excel files for that. They're named vehicles and pricing. We're gonna use those same two Excel files in lesson three, when you learn how to merge multiple data sources. And in lesson four, we're gonna to connect to other databases. That's the title of the lesson. We're actually gonna to connect to a SharePoint list um, if you have access to SharePoint, um, if you want to, you can take a moment and go create a quick list on SharePoint that we will connect to later in this module. The other thing is in order to connect to a SharePoint list, you're going to need a specific driver. There is a Word document in the video description called Useful Links, and it's a link to the driver that you will need. We'll move on to lesson five you'll, where you'll get introduced to the Tableau interface. Lesson six, you'll learn about changing data types and metadata, and we're gonna use a built-in Tableau file for that one, so you won't find it in the video description. In lesson seven, you'll learn about applying filters. And in lesson eight, you'll learn about dimensions and measures. And I should also mention that this slide deck is also in the video description for your future reference. Now, if you wanna take a moment and pause the video and go grab the files that are noted on this slide, including the useful links Word document, go ahead and do so, and then resume. Before we get hands-on in Tableau, I have a couple of other slides I'd like to review with you, and I will be referencing this slide deck throughout the course. So during this module, you're gonna learn how to copy and paste data into Tableau. And you can do that easily from a variety of office applications, including Excel, Word. 
You can also copy and paste HTML tables from web pages. And tables that are copied as comma separated values or tab delimited can be pasted into Tableau. So there's two things that could happen when you paste data into Tableau. If you paste data on the data source view, Tableau will create a new connection in an existing data source, if any. If you paste data on the sheet view, Tableau will create a new data source that you can begin analyzing. So a connection versus a data source. And that data source would be saved as a text file to your Tableau repository when you save the Tableau workbook. So just keep that in mind. We're going to get to that in this module. I've added a slide here about the data sources that are supported in Tableau Desktop. And there's an active link on the slide where you can go in and look at the supported connectors on your own. Um, you'll see them when we get into Tableau, but I just wanted you to have this slide for future reference. So go ahead and launch Tableau now and we'll get started. So I'm in Tableau desktop and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to connect with a text data source. So it, just a little bit about this home screen interface here in Tableau, okay? You have your toolbar at the top as usual. You have a couple of menu items there. Um, we have the connect area on the left, the connect pane, where you can look on Tableau server, you can connect to a file, to a different kind of server. There's even more. So I told you there's a lot of different data sources also known as connectors that you can connect to and this is where you can find them by doing the arrow next to to more and then you have some saved data sources that come with tableau desktop and you'll see the sample superstore one that we're going to connect with a little bit later um, you also have accelerators and they're pre-built dashboards that you can play with. And on the right side, you have a more accelerators link, which you can get to if necessary. Um, if you have an existing Tableau workbook over on the right at the top, there's an open a workbook link that you can use to access that. So what we want to do in the connect pane under to a file, we're going to select text file, and then you're going to navigate to wherever you put the files that you bought in from the video description. The text file is US cities population. At this point, I only have one text file in my folder, and I'm going to just double click it to be able to connect with it in Tableau. We'll go into a deep dive on the Tableau interface in just a little bit in this module. But what I want to draw your attention to right now is this data grid on the bottom. You're actually seeing the data that is in that text file that we just connected to. So that's all the data in the text file right there. Um, it's showing 100 rows at a time, as you'll see over here on the right. And it actually has like nine fields and 304 rows showing here on the left. Um, we're not going to do anything with this file. This is one of the files that you will have that you will be able to come back to and build up later after you learn a bunch of cool things in this advanced course. So what we want to do is we just want to save this file. So there's this little bit of a toolbar here where you can click on save or you could do control S. And if it doesn't take you there automatically, you want to navigate to your documents folder and look for a folder called my Tableau repository. When you locate it, you're going to double click it and then you're going to double click workbooks because this is a Tableau workbook. And we're just going to name this workbook US cities population and then save. We can go to the file tab there, the file menu and choose close. 
And then what you want to do is right under the word file, right under the file menu, you have the house icon. You want to go back to the start page, which is your home page. When you're saving workbooks, they will show up here automatically for you. You can pin them there so they never disappear. Or in our case, we're going to do the X to say, don't show this workbook. The point of that one was how to connect to a text file. Now we're going to connect to a Microsoft Excel file. Um, you've already grabbed this file from the video description, but when I went over that slide, I said we we're going to use a file called Airline Comparisons. I've changed my mind, and we're going to use the Vehicles file that you brought in from the video description. So in your Connect pane, go ahead and click on Microsoft Excel underneath to a file, and then I'm going to double-click Vehicles to connect to it. So you'll notice um, a couple of things here. Um, on the left side, it's showing you the connection. So it's the vehicles file. That's a Microsoft Excel file. And then that file has a worksheet in it called inventory. So what you're seeing is the data that's on that inventory sheet. Now, we will be using this file again in just a little bit. So we're going to save this one, but we'll reopen it in just a little while. So go ahead and do your save and we're going to name it vehicles and pricing. And what, once it's saved, we can go to file and close. And I'm going to go back to my start screen by using the home icon. So I'm going to leave the vehicles and pricing tile here because we're going to reopen that Tableau workbook in just a little while. And the last type of file that we're going to connect to right now is the Microsoft Access Database named Northwind. And before I do that, I'm going to just get this airline comparison file off of my start screen. And under to a file in the connect pane, I'm going to select Microsoft Access. Now this one is a little bit different when you go to open it. It doesn't just take you to where you want to go. You have to click the browse button at the top and you'll see that Northwind database that was in the files from the video description. And I'm going to just double click it. So we don't have a database password. That's not necessary. We don't have any work group security that we have to work through. At the bottom, we're going to go ahead and click on open. You'll notice it was processing the request and then it opens it up. And this is in data source view, like we saw earlier. And again, you're going to learn more about this, but it, it made the connection. If you look at the top of the left pane, it lets you know the connection that you have here. And it's showing all the tables in the data in the database as well as queries that are in the database as well so what we're going to do is what we've been doing so far again you're going to have these three files that you can play with on your own to build them up after you learn what you're going to learn in this course so we're going to go ahead and save it and we're going to call it northwind and go ahead and close it and go back to your start screen. Now we're going to paste data into an existing workbook. Um, I got rid of my Northwind tile here and I'm gonna use the vehicles and pricing tile to reopen that Tableau workbook. And when you open a workbook, it takes you to a different view. This is called sheet view. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that it's on the sheet one tab there. And what we want to do is we want to switch over to the data source tab, which is to the left of sheet one. So go ahead and click on data source to get to that tab. And this is what you've been used to seeing. So what we're going to do here now is we're going to just switch over to the directory where you brought in the files from the video description. 
and open the file named pricing in Excel. And now I'm gonna just click anywhere in this data and I'm gonna do control A, C to select and copy all the data. And then I'm gonna switch back over to Tableau. If we were to use control V here to paste in data source view, let me show you what would happen. Let's go to the data menu. And you'll notice that in data source view, you have two paste data options. The one with control V is what makes a connection. Now, technically you could paste it in as a data source here, but the default behavior is pasting it as a connection here. And let's go back to sheet one for a moment and look at the data menu. And you'll see that there's only one paste option. And when you're in sheet view, it will only paste it as a data source, not a connection. You don't have an option here. So control V here means paste it as a, another data source. Let's go back to data source view. And I'm gonna just do control V here. And you'll notice on the left that I have a new connection. It's called clipboard and it has a string of numbers after it. The first numbers before it gets to a letter represent the date that you copied it to your clipboard. And so that's one way of getting more data in if you had it, if it was an HTML table from a website, it would come in as another connection along with the connection that you have existing. Let's do the drop down arrow next to that clipboard item and choose remove. So we added it as a connection, we removed the connection. Now let's go back to sheet one. And in sheet one, we're gonna do control V So it's still on the clipboard for us. And if you look on the left side, we're on the data pane there, we have a clipboard entry, the same name, but it puts it in here as a new data source instead of a new connection to an existing data source. And you could tell the data source because it has the database icon in front of it. So, if you paste it into using the default control V, if you paste it in sheet view, it's going to become a new data source. If you paste it in data source view, it will create a new connection. So what we're gonna do here now is we're gonna close this file, but we're not gonna save the changes because we're gonna marry these two files in a different way in our next lesson. So let's go ahead and go to file close and then say, no, you don't want to save the changes. Before we move on um, to merging multiple data sources in Tableau, there's some slides I want to go over with you. But before I forget, switch back over to the Excel pricing file and close it. The first slide I want to go over with you is doing a deeper dive into data source view. So we've seen this view several times when we have been connecting to our data sources so far. But what I wanna just do a deeper dive in, just so you get familiar with what things are called and so on and so forth as you work in Tableau. On the left side of the screen where you have the letter A, that is known as your left pane. It displays details about your data. So it's letting you know what connection is there, what sheets are there, so on and so forth. And then in the upper center, where it says sample superstore in big letters there, that is known as the relationships canvas. And you'll see that there is a relationship between the orders and the returns table in that sample superstore file. 
And the line between those two table panes is known as a noodle. Underneath that layer, okay, the relationship canvas, there's another canvas called the joins canvas or the joins unions canvas. And that's indicated by the letter C on this slide. So right here, this is your joins canvas. It's not visible when you first go in. You have to do something to make it show up. And you'll see what that's used for in just a little while. On the bottom of the screen in the background, you have your data grid. That's when we, where we've been looking at the data that we've been connecting to. And to its left is another grid called the metadata grid. Here's some useful information for you in terms of the data types that are supported in Tableau. And you can change the data types of your data that you're connected to in Tableau, which you'll see in this module. So I said that when you're in data source view, the default view is the relationships canvas. That's also known as the logical layer. And you use that layer to combine data using relationships. When we looked at that return table, that was kind of like a pop out on the slide. That's the other layer that you can get to. So there's a physical layer underneath the logical layer. And you use the physical layer to combine data between tables using joins and unions. Each logical table contains at least one physical table, and it's also known as the join union canvas. So this one talks about the difference between relationships, joins, unions, and blends. Relationships do not merge the data, but keeps it separate. And it's based on a common field. Joins are also based on a common field, but they actually merge the data from the same source. Joins will combine the data and then will aggregate it. Unions also merge table data, but unions append the related fields as rows in the merge data set. And then you have blends. And that's an approach to combine data from multiple varieties of sources and display them on a single screen. Blending will aggregate the data and then will display the combined data. Now, because we're talking about relationships in this module, there are two relationship terms at the bottom of the slide, cardinality and referential integrity. Don't worry about them for now. You'll get to see what they mean as we work with relationships in just a little bit. There's another slide here for your future reference with the cardinality and referential integrity options available in Tableau. And I've included a few slides indicating the join types that are available to you so back in Tableau, I am going to reopen our vehicles and pricing workbook. And I'm going to make my way to the data source tab. So at the top of the data tab on the left, next to connections, I'm going to go ahead and click add. And I'm going to choose Microsoft Excel and navigate to where you have your files and open the pricing file. So now I have two connections in here. I have vehicles and I have pricing and vehicles has the inventory sheet. And if you look under sheets here, you'll see there's a pricing sheet, which is from the pricing file. So what we're going to do is we're going to drag that sheet right onto this relationships canvas. And so it creates a relationship based on a common field, or it's going to create a relationship based on a common field. Now, both of these files have a then column in it. 
And so if you look at your data grid at the bottom, it's showing you the VIN column from the pricing file. And that file also has dealer cost and manufacturer suggested retail price. If you hover your mouse over the noodle joining those two tables, inventory and pricing, you'll see that the relationship is inventory to pricing. The cardinality is many to many. So many inventory items are defaulting to many prices. And then you have your related fields there. So VIN from the inventory table equals VIN from the pricing table. And if you look down here in your data grid to the left, there's you learn more link how the relationships differ from joins. Well, relationships is not combining or merging the data. It's just relating it. And you see that it's using the VIN number from inventory equals the VIN number from pricing. And so it created that relationship. Now, Tableau is really good about that as long as you have a matching field with the same name. Now, the fields don't have to have the same name. If they don't, Tableau probably will not be able to create the relationship for you automatically like it did here. So right now, we're looking at the relationship canvas. And this is also known as the logical layer. To get to the physical layer, we're gonna double click on that inventory table on the canvas. So when I double click it, it goes to the physical layer where is where you, which is where you create your joins and unions. It's also known as the join union canvas. It lets you know that inventory is made of one table. So remember from the slide, even if you're only using one table, it will show in both the logical and the physical layer. Now we want to create a join between the inventory and the pricing tables. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna grab the pricing sheet and drag it and drop it into the canvas. And it automatically creates a join between the two tables. So it's saying, if I hover over the join symbol, it's an inner join of inventory. Notice it appended the pricing table with the number one, right? And it's based on the VIN field in both tables. So an inner join. In the inner join, only the common matching data between the two tables is displayed. And that's what we're gonna have here. Now, if I wanted to change the join type, I can just click right on that join symbol and you'll see the other join types that are there. We're not changing it, but I just wanted to let you know that you could if you wanted to. And I'm gonna close that join type window. And now if I look at the bottom, it's merged the data, right? So you'll notice in your data grid down here, it's letting you know underneath the data type symbol, it lets you know which table it's pulling from. So there are your inventory tables, the first, the your inventory tables are the first set of fields. And now you have your pricing tables as your second set of fields. And since we don't want the VIN showing twice, I'm going to hide the VIN column from the pricing table. And I'm going to just right click on the column header and choose hide. So there's our merged data set. Now, if we want to go back to the logical layer at this point, we can do the X in the upper right hand corner of that physical layer and it brings you back to the logical layer. And again, in your data grid, you can see your combined merged data set. Also, if you notice up here in the canvas, it lets you know if you hover over inventory, 
Um, it lets you know its logical table and its physical tables, and it also gives the symbol for the join there. So you know that those tables are joined. So the automatic relationship that happened is because the different tables have a common field. It was able to automatically create the relationship for you, but that did not merge the data together. That just related those tables to each other. We use the join from the physical layer in order to be able to merge the data together. And then we got rid of the redundant VIN column that we didn't need in our merge data set. Go ahead and save this file and you can go ahead and close it. So now we're ready to connect to a SharePoint list. So I'm gonna go back to my home start, my home icon to get back to my start screen. And I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of my vehicles and pricing tile here. And this time where it says connect on the connect pane on the left, we're gonna go to the more arrow. So we saw this a little bit earlier. These are all the connectors or the data sources that you can connect to. And on that list in the middle, toward the bottom, you will find SharePoint list. And that's what I'm going to select. So this is the one that you will need a driver for. Now, if you don't have the driver, it will let you know as you go through this process. So you have to give it the URL to your SharePoint site and the addition of SharePoint. And then you're going to, I'm using a username and password for authentication. And I'm gonna go ahead and put in my password and then click sign in. Um, you have the Word document from the video description that gives you a link to the driver, but in the pop-up that comes up, if you don't have it, it will also have a link to that driver. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my password in. And then I've clicked sign in, so it's executing the query. So now on the left side in the data pane, it's showing all of my SharePoint list library, stuff like that. So I have one here that I called Tableau Training, and I'm gonna just drag that onto the canvas. So when I look at the data pane, it's bringing me every field, even the ones that are not showing in my SharePoint list, every field possible in that list. So there are only two of them that I'm interested in. The best way to see this is to go to sheet one. And the only two fields that I'm interested in are the region title field, and then I have total sales 2021. Those are the only two fields I'm interested in. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag region title to the rows shelf up top. And then I'm gonna drag my total sales 2021 to columns. And now I actually have a visualization showing by region the total sales for 2021. And we'll be doing more on the sheet tab and getting an overview of it in just a little while. So what I'm gonna just do is I'm gonna double click the sheet one tab and I'm gonna name it 2021 sales by region and press enter. And it also gives me a title on my sheet with the same name. Now I can do those independent of each other, but by default, when you name the sheet, it's gonna apply whatever you name the sheet to the title. So now what I'm ready to do is just go and save this one, this workbook, and I'm gonna call it um, 2021 sales by region. And I'll do a dash SharePoint so I know where it originated. And I'm gonna go ahead and save it and close it. 
So we're going to be working in a built-in Tableau file for the rest of this module and into subsequent modules. And we're going to be spending a lot more time in sheet view, which you just saw briefly when I created that visualization from my SharePoint list. So before we get into that, let's go over some definitions and roles that will be useful for you as we proceed in this course. So the first thing is a pill. When we dragged, when I dragged from the data pane on the left in sheet view, the fields into the rows and column shells, those are called pills, the fields that we drag. They're known as pills. You can call them anything that you want to. We basically have two different types of fields in Tableau, dimensions and measures. So a dimension is a field that can be considered as an independent variable. So any field containing qualitative categorical information as is a dimension in Tableau. So for example, a region field or a state field. Dimensions can categorize, segment, and reveal the details in your data. And then you have measures, which is a dependent variable. Its value is a function of one or more dimensions. So Tableau treats any field containing numeric or quantitative information as a measure. For example, sales. When you drag a measure into the view, Tableau applies an aggregation to that measure by default, and it typically defaults to the sum aggregate. And then you have roles for your fields in Tableau. They're either continuous or discrete. They're color coded, which will help. So continuous fields are green and it forms an unbroken whole without interruption. Without interruption. Um, generally, continuous fields add axes to the view, for example, sales. And both dimensions and measures can be continuous. And then you have discrete fields, and that means individually separate and distinct. They're represented as blue in Tableau. And generally speaking, discrete fields add headers to the view. So you might have a heading for region in your view. Both dimensions and measures can be discrete. So here's our breakdown of sheet view in Tableau. And we're just going to point out a few things in this view. So starting at the top, of course, you have your workbook name. Um, so where it says pages, filters, marks. So this panel here, I'll draw an arrow to it or attempt to. So this panel here, as well as columns and rows up top. Those are either called cards or shelves. Technically speaking, columns, rows, pages, I believe, and filters are known as shelves. And then the marks card is known as a card. The terms are used interchangeably. Again, doesn't matter what you call them as long as you know how to use them. We also have a little bit of a toolbar right underneath your menu bar here. So where you have your icons um, showing, running underneath your menu bar. That is your toolbar. In the middle of the screen, which would normally be called the canvas area, right? That is actually known as a view here. You can call it the canvas. It's where you create your visualization by using the cards and shelves. You have an icon on your toolbar. The first icon on your toolbar will take you to your start page here. On the left side underneath that, you have your data pane. It has two tabs. It has the data tab and it has the analytics tab up top. And you'll become familiar with both of those as we go through this course. At the bottom, well, you already know how to get back to data source view by using the data source tab there. 
And underneath all of that, you have a status bar. So in this screenshot, it's showing there's 192 marks in the visualization. Each different point is known as a mark. Three rows by 16 columns, and it's giving you the sum of profit there in the status bar as well. And then you have your sheet tab. So this screenshot shows sheet one. To the right of sheet one, you have three buttons. The first one is to add a new worksheet, another sheet, and it would name it sheet two by default. The second one is to create a dashboard sheet. And the third one is to create a story sheet. And there are other ways of getting those new sheets into your file as well. The marks card is critical for how your visualizations are going to look. So here's an example here. Um, Tableau displays data by using marks, where every mark cor corresponds to a row or group of rows in your data source. So on the marks card at the top, you can change the shape of the marks on your visualization. Um, it defaults to automatic depending on the data that you have, but you do have the ability to change the shape from that drop down. In this particular screenshot here, they're using a field called segment, and that's a color range on the visualization. The region has the shape on the visualization. And the size of the marks on the visualization are represented by the sum of the quantity. That's what it's showing in this example. I have a more detailed table here of the settings for the mark card for your future reference. So we're gonna get into changing data types and metadata now, and we're gonna use a Tableau built-in data set for this. The first thing I'm going to do is get rid of my 2021 sales by region SharePoint tile. And by the way, if your tile is not there again on the right side, you can open an existing workbook from the link on the right. What we're going to do on the connect tab on the left, under save data sources, you'll see sample superstore. It's built into Tableau. So I'm going to just click on that and it opens up in sheet view. I'm going to go back to data source view. So it opens with the relationships. There's a relationships between orders table and the people table and a relationship between orders and the returns table based on a common field. And again, I can hover over those relationship noodles to see what type of relationship it is and the related field. So that's one thing. Now, <clears throat> this data comes in, and if I look at my data grid at the bottom, you'll see that I'm seeing the data for the orders table there's some additional fields on the right and stuff like that. And so that's in the data grid. And then to the left of that, this is your metadata grid here. So let's start by doing a couple of things here. In the metadata grid, it shows you the data type and it's, you know, some kind of symbol. So ABC means it's text. You have a calendar looking icon, that means it's a date. Um, you have one that looks like a globe, right? And that means that it's data that can be used in maps, so on and so forth. You have one that's numeric data. You have a group which is represented by a paper clip and you have a bin which is represented by a series of vertical lines. So those are the data types over there. It lets you know the field name has a drop down next to that. So you might want to review some of those things on the drop down. And it lets you know the physical table that it's pulling from. 
And it also has a remote field name column as well. Now in your metadata grid, scroll down until you can see the postal code field. And you'll notice that that has the globe as a data type. So it's a, it can be used on the map. It has a geographic role assigned to it. If you click on that globe to the left of postal code, you'll notice the field is actually a string, right? Um, it doesn't have the ABC there because it's been assigned a geographic role. If you hover over geographic role, it's been mapped to zip code postcode. So it can be used on a map right? But, you know, sometimes when you bring data in, if your postal code, your postal codes could be read as numeric. Now we never want our postal codes numeric unless we want to do some kind of math on them. I don't think the sum of postal codes or average postal code will make any sense. So you want to make sure your postal code always comes in as a string. Just wanted to point that out. Let's scroll up in our metadata grid and click on the little calendar icon to the left of the order date field. So it comes in as a date. Now Tableau is pretty good about this. If the original data was in the form of a date and time, it would bring it in as date and time, but it's bringing it in as a date. Now let's say you decide one day you want to change it to date and time. I'm going to show you what happens and why you would not want to do that. If the original data doesn't have a time, it's unable to give you a time. So let's just click on date and time from that drop down. And notice the calendar icon now has a little clock on it in front of order date. But if you expand the order date field in the grid, all of the times are going to be 12 a.m. because there's not a time in the original data. So go back to your order date data type and change it back to date. Unless your original data has times in it, don't try to use date and time or you'll just get 12 a.m.s for everything. Unless you have a need to do that. Another thing we can do from our data grid is we can split a column. So if you look at the customer name column, it has the first and last name in there and we want to split it. So we have a customer first and a customer last column. So the way we're going to do that in your metadata grid, go to the drop down next to customer name and you're going to choose split. And if you scroll all the way to the right in your data grid, you'll see that it created. So it, when you do a split, it will put the new columns all the way on the right side. So you have a customer name split one and a customer name split two. It was able to do it kind of like automatically. So what we're going to do here is we're going to rename those columns. So I'm going to right click where it says customer name split one and I'm going to rename it and I'm going to call it customer first. And press enter and go ahead and rename customer name split two to customer last. And once they're both renamed, I'm going to Go back to the left to I can see the original customer name column. I can right click on its header and I can hide it. So it won't show in our data set. And by the way, it's good to know how to unhide things. If you accidentally hide things all the way to the right, right above your data grid, you will see a gear symbol. And if you click that gear, you'll see that you can show hidden fields. We're not going to show the hidden fields. And the last change we're going to make to the data here is we want to rename a field. So the segment field, we want it to say market segment. So I'm going to just right click on its header and choose rename and put the word market at the front of it and press enter. 
So that's the way the field will show up when we start visualing, when we start doing visualization. So there's one area of data source view that I didn't talk about so far, and it's in the upper right hand side of data source view. And that's this connections and filters area. So by default, I would say most of the time when you connect to a data source, it will be a live connection, meaning that if you're working with a live connection and you're creating visualizations and that original source is being updated, you will get the new modified information automatically and your visualizations will update automatically. Now, when we did the join, excuse me, not when we did the join, when we connected to the SharePoint list, and I didn't point it out when that was open, but when we connected to the SharePoint list, it connected as an extract. And if you go up and you do the option button in front of extract, you'll see that automatically it says extract will include all data, right? Unless you filter it. And what happens when you're working with an extract, like the SharePoint list was an extract. So when we connected to it, it gave us the list at that time. If that list is being updated, then we would have to refresh to get the changes for that list. And we'll revisit the connection type a little bit later in the course. So change it back to live. You can filter a live connection. You can filter an extract as well. So when it's on live and you use the filter area, it is going to be filtering your data. It's not actually filtering the source data, but it's filtering your view of the data for use in Tableau. Because you're filtering in here, and you're on the data source tab, the information on all of your sheets will be filtered by whatever filter you do here. So we're gonna go ahead and apply a filter here. Let's go over to the add link under filters. And then we're gonna click add. And we're going to use the state province field and then click OK. So now we're just going to filter for five states. We're going to go ahead and do a check mark in front of Arizona. We want to grab California. We're going to scroll down and grab New Mexico. And we'll do Oregon and Washington states. So down at the bottom, it lets you know that you have selected five of 59 values and we're going to click OK. You'll have more opportunities of filtering throughout the course, not necessarily at the data source level, but at the visualization level. And we're going to click OK. So now it's only showing those five states. We can look at our data grid and see that it's only showing those five states. And now let's go to sheet one and we'll build a quick visualization so you can see that it's only going to show the states that we filtered for. So on the left side, on the data pane, You'll see we have our customer first and customer last fields that we split. We have segment renamed to market segment showing there, right? Um, we have the original customer name field not showing because we hid it. And so, and you'll notice the, the blue and the green coding, right? So we're going to expand. You notice we have um, an expansion arrow in front of location and in front of product. We're going to expand location. And we're going to drag state province to rows, to the rows shelf. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So you can see it's only bringing in those five states that we filtered for because we filtered at the data source level. And then what else are we going to do for this visualization? We're going to add the orders count measure. So it has a measure in this data set called orders count, and we're going to drag that up to columns. So for each state, we're seeing a count of the orders. Easy breezy. Let's go back to data source view. And in the upper right hand corner, it now says we have one filter applied there and there's an edit button. We're going to click on edit. We're going to select our filter in the list here, state province filter, and we're going to remove the filter. Click OK. Go back to sheet one and notice that you're seeing all of the states now. So when you apply a filter at the data source level, it's going to apply to every sheet that you have in your Tableau workbook. And that's not really practicable most of the time. So I'm going to show you how to do the same filter, but at the sheet level. So what I'm going to do is I want to, we want to filter by state province here. So I'm going to click, I'm going to hold down my control key, click and hold on state province in the rows shelf. Oops. I clicked a little bit too hard and drag it to the filter shelf right above your marks card and let it go. So now from here, we're going to select none. And then we're going to select our five states. So that would be Arizona, California. You had New Mexico, Oregon, and Washington. And then we're going to click apply at the bottom. And you can see that the visualization is now filtered again for just those five states, but at the sheet level or the visual level filter, we can click OK. So let's do to the right of your sheet one tab, do a plus sign. And I just want to show you this and we're going to drag um, orders count to columns again. And we're going to drag state province to rows again. So on this sheet, we're getting all of the states because we haven't applied a filter on this sheet. And we're not going to keep this sheet. We're going to right click on your sheet two tab and choose delete. And then we're going to double click sheet ones tab and we're going to name it Mm, w and SW order count by customer. And now would be a good time to go ahead and save this file. So I'm going to go to save and I'm going to call it sample superstore live. So we know it's a live version. Later on, we're going to use this file and make an extract out of it and go ahead and save it. So let's take a look at that field list on the left again. And you notice the, the green and the blue coloration there, right? So typically your numeric fields will show with the green symbols and non-numeric fields will show with the blue symbols for the most part in your field list. But blue and green also represent, when you're looking at it in the rows and columns shelf, it also represents whether the field is continuous or if it's discrete. So continuous is green, Blue is discrete. Remember, both measures and dimensions can be either continuous or discrete. So let's see what that means and what it looks like. Um, 
in your column shelf, go to the drop down next to count of orders. Notice it's in, it automatically is continuous and we're going to choose discrete. So now the count of orders become like headings, right? Notice that there's no longer an axis, an X axis going across the bottom. And that just doesn't kind of make sense for what we're trying to ascertain from this data. So we're going to go to the drop down arrow next to count of orders and change it back to continuous. And now you get your X axis back, which is a measurement of the count of orders. Now we could do the same thing with, um, well, not continuous and discrete here. It's not going to let us do that for state and province. It's a different reason for that. And I don't want to go into that rabbit hole right now. So now you're seeing the definitions from the slide come to life and seeing the differences of them. Let's just do another save on this sample superstore live file. And we're going to leave it open because we're going to use it in the next module. By way of recap in module one, we focused mostly on connecting to different data sources. So we started by connecting to a text file. Um, we used a different Excel file than the airline comparison one on the slide. We used vehicles and we connect it to the Northwind Access Database. So you have those Tableau workbooks saved, which means you can go into them, play around with the data, make changes to the data and create visualizations for more practice for yourself. In the second lesson, we learned how to paste from a clipboard. So we had connected to the vehicles file and we pasted the contents of the pricing file in, and you saw the different behaviors of pasting depending on where you paste, whether it's data source view or sheet view. Then we learned how to merge multiple data sources. We actually use the vehicles file and this time we created a join with the pricing file. So you had a merged data source that you could use. After that, we connected to a SharePoint list, which required a driver if you didn't already have it installed. And along the way, you got introduced to the Tableau interface. So we started with data source view, and ultimately you got an overview of sheet view as well. In data source view, you learned how to change data types and metadata once we connect it to the Tableau Sample Superstore data source. You also learned how to apply filters both at the data source and the sheet level. And we ended up with an exclamation, which you could actually see in the file of dimensions and measures. And you also learned about discrete versus continuous. Module two, we'll be focusing on creating univariate charts. So we have multiple lessons in here. Um, we're going to start by creating tables, bar graphs, pie charts. You'll learn how to sort your charts and graphs. Um, we're going to create histograms and line charts. You're going to learn how to use the show me toolbar. We're going to create stacked bar graph and box plots. You're going to learn how to show aggregate measures and also how to show the top 10 items. So what in the world is a univariate chart? Well, it means looking at one variable at a time, trying to understand its mean, median, variance, distribution, etc. And then I have a list of the common types of univariate charts as well as another slide that gives you an idea of when to use each type of chart. So that's in here as your future reference slide. Let's go back over to Tableau and get started. So 
in Tableau, let's go ahead and bring up a new sheet. We can use the plus sign icon to the right of our West and Southwest order count by customer sheet. That's one way of getting that new sheet. And even though we used the sheet two before, we deleted it. So it's going to repeat that name here, sheet two by default. So we're going to start by creating a table and we're going to drag our market segment field to the columns shelf. And notice it gives us the framework of a table. You'll see a little bit later in this module why it does that. And in the meantime, we're going to grab the sales field. And this time we're going to use our marks card. We're going to drag sales and drop it on the text box in the marks card. So now you're seeing the text in the table are the sales for each market segment. Now let's see what would happen. So we have a table here, right? Really simple table. Let's drag text from the marks card. Now notice at the bottom of the marks card, it has that text icon in front of summer sales. So you know that that field is occupying the text in the table. We're going to drag that sum of sales from the marks card and let's put it in the rows box. And so when you, once you put it in rows, it's going to generate a column chart for you. So let's drag it back from rows to now it says label for where text used to be. Right. So now it puts it back as text really simple to do. Right. Um, and so what we want to do though, is we want to change the average aggregate. We want the average sales by market segment. So in your marks card, you can right click on some of sales and you're going to hover over measure some, and you're going to select average. So now it's showing the average sales by market segment. And we can go ahead and make those columns wider. If you see where I am, I'm in between the consumer and the corporate column. And I'm going to just drag to the right a little bit and it will adjust all columns. So a very simple table. Congratulations. And now we're going to name this sheet by double clicking it. Average sales by market segment. Well done. Now let's go ahead and save. We want to save frequently while we're working in this file. We're going to be working in this sample superstore file a lot. So now I'm going to have you create another table on your own. You're going to create a new sheet. And you're going to create a table that's going to show the sum of sales by, and if you expand your product field, you'll see the category field. So we want to see the sum of sales by category on a new sheet. Go ahead and do that on your own. So just so you can see my work on that one. Up, uh, let me switch to the right tab and then you'll be able to see my work. This time I put category in rows and I use sales as text and it defaults to sum. So I have my table of the sum of sales by category and I named the sheet tab, which thereby named the title on the page as well. Go ahead and save. So now we're going to create a bar graph and we're going to do that by adding another new sheet. Another way that you can get a new sheet because the first, again, the first plus sign is new worksheet. The second one is new dashboard. The third one is new story down there, but you can go to the worksheet menu and choose new worksheet and also learn the shortcut key control M. So multiple ways of doing the same thing. 
And so for this sheet, what we're going to do is we're going to drag our sales field to columns. And we're going to drag category, which is under product to rows. Right? So we did this in table format a moment ago, but this time we put both sales and category on the columns and rows shelves. So we didn't use the text or label field in the marks card for this one, which would make it into a table. And so what we're going to do is we're going to click on label in the marks card, even though we didn't drag a field there. And we're going to do the checkbox in front of show mark labels. So now at the end of each bar, we have the sum of sales number. And if you hover over any bar, it'll show you the tool tip, the category and the sales amount. And we decide we want to add another field to this visualization. So under product, I'm going to grab subcategory and drag that to rows to the right of category. So now, and I'm going to actually just widen this area here between the two so I get a little bit more space. Well, that was a bit too much. But anyway, so I have my category, my subcategory, and then for each subcategory, you're seeing the sales. And again, you can hover over each bar to see the tooltip. So now you're seeing category, subcategory, and the sales values. And let's say we don't want the default blue bars. We want orange bars. So I'm going to go to the color on the marks card and I'm going to choose orange. And now all of our bars are orange and go ahead and name this sheet sales by category and subcategory. And now on your own, go back to the West and Southwest order count by customer sheet and change those bars to orange as well. And I should say, if orange is not your color, pick the color of your choice. But what we're starting to do here is get some consistency in coloration, um, which will ultimately lead for better dashboards at the end of the day. So I'm gonna stick with my orange color as much as possible, but you can pick the color of your choice. Go ahead and save your file. I'm going to go back to my sales by category and subcategory sheet, and then I'm going to bring in a new worksheet. And for this one, we're going to create a pie chart. So we're going to drag market segment to columns and sales to rows. So it's going to give us a column chart, right? A column graph. And we want to change that to a pie chart. So what we're going to do is over on your upper right hand corner, you will see the words show me. And you're going to click on show me and it opens up a panel. And so the show me panel, it will only allow you to select the appropriate type of visualization based on the data that you've dragged into your view. So some of these things are dimmed out because they don't meet the criteria for those types of visualizations. For example, if you hover over Right underneath your table, there's one, it's called a symbol map. It's not available to you. And it says you need to have one geographic dimension at the bottom, one zero or more dimensions and zero to two measures in order to be able to do a symbol map. But you'll notice that the pie chart is available for us. If we hover over that, it says that you just need one or more dimensions 
and one or two measures at the bottom. So we meet that criteria. So we're going to go ahead and click on the pie chart. And now we have a little teeny tiny pie chart, right? Okay. So first things first, let's make it not so teeny tiny. If you look at your toolbar, there's a section where it says standard. You're going to do the drop down arrow there and choose entire view. So it kind of centers it in the view and it enlarges it. In the meantime, I'm going to click on show me again, just to collapse that panel. And you'll see quite a few things happened when we changed it into a pie chart. First of all, there's nothing in columns and rows shelves anymore, but look at your marks card. So it took market segment and it made that the color. So that's why each one is a different color. And notice you have the color legend on the right side of your screen. Whenever it does that, it gives you the appropriate legend there, right? And then it took some of sales and it put some of sales. Well, first I'll start with the bottom one. It put it in the size area, right? So each slice of the pie is size based on its sum of sales. And it also did something else with sum of sales. It put it on the angle on the marks card. So you can see these corresponding icons here, right? One is for size. The first one is for angle. The second one is for size on the marks card. So, and because we have some of sales as the size, it gives you another legend over here, just showing you the range, you know, you have up to over 2 million for sales. And so if we hover over any slice of the pie, you'll see the market segment and you'll see the amount of sales for that market segment. On the marks card, we're going to go ahead and click on label and show mark labels so we can see them outside of every slice of pie. And you can go to size on the marks card if you want to increase or decrease the size of the slices. We're going to go ahead and name this sheet. And this is going to be sales by market segment. So we have an average sales by market segment and we'll just call it sales by market segment for the sheet and the title. And actually just to be a little bit more clear here, I'm going to make it say total sales by market segment. And then I'm going to go back and rename the one that's called sum of sales by category. And I'm going to rename that to total sales by category just to be a little bit more specific and consistent and go ahead and save your sample superstore live workbook. So let's go back to our sales by category and subcategory sheet. And we're going to sort this visualization. If you go to the subcategory heading, um, you'll see a little A to Z and button that you can use to sort. But what I'd like us to do is go to the drop down arrow to the right of your subcategory heading on your visualization. And you can see you can sort it in data source order, alphabetic order. You can sort it by a field or nested. We're going to hover over field and choose sum of sales. So now you'll see that it's sorted by sum of sales in descending order that way. And we can hover over it again. And if you see the lines with the drop down arrow, it lets you know that it's sorted descending by sum of sales across all the values of the subcategory. So not too difficult to sort 
in a tableau visualization. Now, if we want to reverse the order to ascending by sales, we can just click on those lines and now it's sorted in ascending order by sales. Now I'm going to have you go to the West and Southwest order count by customer sheet. Oops, didn't mean to do that. And I'm going to have you sort this by the count of orders. And actually ignore me for that one. Go to total sales by category sheet instead and sort in descending order by category. So it'll look like my screen when it's done. And to the right of category, you'll see the Z A for descending order. Go ahead and save. Let's go back to our total sales by market segment sheet with our pie chart and bring up a new sheet so we can create a histogram. A histogram shows how data is clustered and it can compare categories. So for this one, we're going to just drag the quantity measure to columns and we're going to go to our show me pane and we'll see the histogram is available for us on here. It's the one that looks like a, a up and down column chart. Um, actually I can do this. I'll point to it for you. So the green one with all the columns is the histogram. So that is available for you by just dragging one measure onto your view. And so if you hover over histogram at the bottom, it tells you, you just need one measure, right? So it creates these bins for you that will allow you to be able to see how your data is clustered. So let's finish building this one up. So I'm going to go ahead and select histogram, right? And a couple of things happened. If you look up at your columns and rows shelf, we have a quantity bin and now a count of quantity. So if you look at your X axis on the bottom, it's the bins, right? So the first bin is that first column, right? And it goes from zero to, it looks like, 1.99 and then the second bin is in the next column so on and so forth so if i hover over the third column there are four items in that bin right it's letting you know how many items are in that bin there are four items in that bin there are two items in the bin previous to it none in the first bin the fourth one has five items, fifth one has seven, and the sixth one has nine items. So your bins, really when it comes to a histogram, those are the clusters of your data. Now, because we're using a histogram and it creates bins, you'll notice in your field list on the left, you have a quantity bin and we can change the bin size. So right click on the quantity bin in your field list and you're gonna choose edit off of the list that pops up. So it defaults, right? It gives you a bin size of 1.77. We don't want that. We're gonna select that and make the bin size two and click okay. So it adjusts a little bit. You saw the adjustment, it flickered just a little bit. And now you're seeing we have these other bins over here that barely show on the axis. For more analysis, let's go ahead and drag market segment field to the color on the marks card. So now we can see the quantities 
based on market segment, right? So in the first column, if you look at the red, right, that's the home office market segment. Orange is corporate, blue is consumer. If I collapse show me, I'll have that legend over on the right that's showing that. So I have, for the consumer one, for the second one, you can see the blue column there. Consumer segment has 2,581 as a count of quantity, two of which are in that bin. It's kind of how that's working. And we want to copy that count of quantity. We want to copy that to label on the marks card. So I'm going to hold down my control key, click and hold on the count of quantity in rows, and drag it over to label on the marks card. So now we're seeing that count of quantity on the histogram columns. And we'll name the sheet Market Segment Histogram. And save your file. So I've already created a new sheet so that we can create a line chart here. That's our next task. And what we're going to do is we're going to drag the order date field to columns. And we're going to drag both sales and profit to rows. So we now have two separate line charts and we would like it to be not separate. So we're going to use show me and we're going to select the dual line chart. So this one is for lines continuous. This one is lines discrete. And this one is dual lines. And notice the requirements. It just needs one date on the bottom, zero or more dimensions, and two measures. So we have one date and two measures. I'm going to click dual line. And now we have one visualization and I'm going to collapse show me. And we have a dual axis because the numbers for profit and the numbers for sales are very different. So it automatically creates a dual axis double line chart. Another thing I'll point out is the marks card. You'll notice that it put measure names on the color, right? So that's why we have the differing colors for each measure. And we also get our legend on the right-hand side. It also notes down at the bottom that we have the sum of profit and sum of sales measures. And it's showing the marks. So all marks here are automatic. Let's go ahead and name this sheet Sum and Profit by Year and go ahead and save. And I've set up a new sheet for our stacked bar graph. This time we're going to select our fields a little bit differently. So far we've been dragging and dropping them. This time we'll use the double click method. So in your field list, go ahead and double click order date and it puts it in columns automatically. And that's cool, that's where we want it. If we wanted it in rows, we could move it manually. So we're good with that one. And then on the product, we're gonna double click category and subcategory. And we actually want the category and the subcategory to be in the columns as well. So I'm gonna just drag and drop them where we want them. And then go ahead to your field list and double click sales. So it puts sales in text and we want it in rows. So I'm going to just drag it and drop it there. It's like six of one half dozen of the other. Um, sometimes I just like to do things a little bit differently. Now we want to use show me 
to change this into a stacked bar chart. So if you look at the stacked bar chart, it requires one or more dimensions and one or more measures. So we meet the requirements. I'm gonna go ahead and click on it. And when we do that, it changes everything around from where we had it. So it made subcategory color on the marks card. It flipped category and year of order date in the columns and it retained sales in rows. And so it does those changes so that the visualization will make more sense. And you can hover over any of your stacked bars. You have the legend on the right side, since it made it color, it gave everyone as color coded. And you can see the legend shows category, subcategory, the year, and the sales. We're gonna go ahead and name this sheet annual sales by category and subcategory. And as usual, save your file. The next type of viz that we're gonna do is a box and whisker chart also known as a box plot. And we are going to first review what it will look like. So on the left side of this slide, you have a full box plot. And then I pulled out one section of it on the right side, just to give you some information. So anything that is outside of the box itself is considered an outlier. And so you'll see at the top of this broken out piece here that we have, oops, and I just zoomed in on that, but we have an outlier at the top, right? So it doesn't fit into the box. It's an outlier, it's outside the range. And so then just to know what this is composed of, this part up at the top is the upper whisker. You'll learn more about that in a little bit. You have the median line, which is really one of the most important lines, and that's here. And then you have your lower whisker. So I've also included a slide in the deck telling you how to analyze a box plot, also known as a box and whisker plot. But I'll be going over to you, this with you when we do this next chart. So I'm gonna switch back over to Tableau. So we're gonna go ahead and create a new sheet in our sample Superstore Live. And for our box plot, we're gonna drag subcategory to columns and we'll drag sales to rows. So we get our column chart here. Now we can change this into a box and whisker plot a couple of different ways. The way we're gonna do it right now is on the marks card, we're gonna change the mark from automatic to circle so that it lays the framework for our box plot. We're also going to drag the order date field and we want this field on detail in the marks card. So I'm gonna just drag it and drop it on top of detail. So now if I hover any over any of the circles, you'll see that the year of the order date is showing. But we want to see the month of the order date. So in the marks card, you're gonna do the drop down arrow next to year order date, and you're gonna select month and I'm just selecting just May. There's another month down below with the month and the year, but we just want the month. So now if you hover over any of the circles, you'll see the month. So we can make this into a box plot by right clicking on the Y axis where your sales values are and choosing at the bottom, add reference line. 
So you have a line, you have a band, you have a distribution, and you have box plot. Let's go ahead and select box plot there. And you'll see the whiskers extend to data within 1.5 times the IQR. Now I have this on that supplemental slide for you, but I'll just tell you that IQR stands for interquartile range. And those would be the data points between the first and third quartile. So anything outside, and it does a calculation, if you will, this is the default option. So what this 1.5 times means, it's telling Tableau to make all of the data points on the box and whisker plot fit into 1.5 times the IQR. Anything outside of that is an outlier. Now our only other choice here is the maximum extent of the data. We're gonna leave it on within 1.5 times the IQR and go ahead and click OK. So now you have your box plot or box and whisper plot. And we're gonna just take a look at one of the boxes so I can explain, and this is stuff that you saw on the slide and I'll give you a further explanation. So this is the one that I drew out by itself on the slide. So it's like the fourth one over from the left. And if you hover into like a shaded gray area there, it gives you some information. So it's letting you know the upper whisker, the upper hinge, which I'll explain, the median, the lower hinge, and the lower whisker. So the median is the most important point. You can look around all of the members of this dimension, the subcategory dimension, and you can find the median by looking for the line that's in the middle of the box. That's your median line here. So when I hover in a gray area and it tells me the median is almost 14,000, if I look at the Y axis, I'll find the line closest to that, which is here, and that represents the median. Now let's talk the other ones. Analytically speaking, this, you know, once you get used to it, and if you have a need to use box and whisker plots, they could be helpful for you, but they could be a little confusing at first. So each line on the box itself is a marker and it provides a piece of statistical content. And we already located the median line, which is important because you can look across the members of this dimension. So the members of subcategory and you can easily find the median lines on your other boxes. So let's talk about some more definitions. What is the upper whisker? The upper whisker is 50% higher than the IQR. The lower whisker, let me hover again, get my little guide up. The lower whisker would be 50% lower than the IQR. Any data points outside of the box and whisker are considered the outliers. So that's that circle at the top. I may have mentioned that one already. That's an outlier. And the lower and upper edges of the box are known as hinges. So the upper hinge, so the box is like that gray box the upper hinge for this fourth one over is 21,407. And the lower hinge, the lower edge of the box is, would be the smallest data value that is larger than the first quartile. The upper hinge, by the way, is calculated as the largest data value that is smaller than the third quartile. So all of that information is in your slide deck for future reference, but congratulations, you've created a box and whisker plot or a box plot. Now we're gonna go ahead and name this sheet tab. 
And the name is going to be total sales by subcategory. And we'll call it box plot at the end. Go ahead and save your file. So we created this box plot by adding a reference line. I'm going to show you another way of creating it, but this will be a more traditional box and whisper plot, whisker plot. And so this one is a box plot and it does have its whiskers and everything as you see when you hover over the box. So what we're going to do instead of recreating the wheel from scratch is we're going to copy this sheet tab. And the way I'm going to copy it is I'm going to hold down my control key, click and hold on it and just drag to the right until that downward pointing arrow is to the right of the original tab. And then I let go. So I get a copy of it. Let's start by renaming the tab. And instead of calling it a whisk, a box plot, we'll add the word box and whisker plot. So you'll be able to distinguish between the two. And at the end of that, we want to get rid of the number two because it's a copy of the other sheet. Sorry, my OCD just clicked in when I looked up and saw the title. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the reference, the box plot reference line that we added. And we can do that by right clicking on the Y axis again and remove the reference line. So it's back to the state where we just had the circle mark showing. Now we're going to go over to the right and expand our show me pane. And on your show me pane, you have a box and whisker plot viz, and we're going to select it. So this one looks a little bit cleaner than the first one that we did. This is a traditional box and whisker plot. And sometimes the terms are used interchangeably. You'll hear box plot, you'll hear whisker, box and whisker plot. So this one, you can actually see the lines more clearly. The outlier circles are not as big. And you have your gray shaded area there where if you hover over that box, you'll see the same information as on the previous one. So it's just a matter of which is your personal choice. You can create a box plot by adding a reference line, or you can create the box and whisker plot by using the show me feature. Let's go ahead and save again. So now you're going to learn how to show multiple aggregate measures on the same visualization. Let's go ahead and bring up a new sheet. And let's go ahead and drag market segment to the columns shelf. We'll drag sales to rows. And we'll drag category underneath product. Let's see what we want to do with category. We're going to actually drag category to color on the marks card. So you get your legend because it's color coded, right? And right now we're seeing the sum of sales. Sum is the default aggregate in here. So let's say we also wanted to see the average of sales and maybe even some more aggregates. So there's a couple of ways we can do this. So let's go and grab sales again from the field list and drag it up to rows to the right of the existing sum of sales. Now you'll notice you have two sum of sales. Now, if your viz doesn't look like mine, go to show me. And I chose the, I have the um, stacked column chart here. So the one I'm hovering over right now is the one that I'm using. So they're showing the exact same thing. On the second instance of sum of sales, do the drop down arrow, hover over measure, and choose average. 
So now you have sales and average sales. Let's do another. We'll do this one a little bit different. Let's hold down your control key and click and hold on average sales in the rows shelf and drag it to the right to make a copy of it. On the second instance of average, do the drop down arrow, hover over measure, and choose median. So now we're seeing the median sales per market segment here. And we have the categories as color coding. So what I'm gonna have you do now on your own, I'm gonna have you display the max and the min of the sales and any other aggregates that you want. So now I'm looking at five different sales aggregates based on the market segment and the category. And let's just name this sheet sales aggregates. And go ahead and save. Now let's say that the sales, the sum of sales aggregate is the one that's most important to you. And so you really don't want all of the other aggregates to show in the visualization. There's something else you can do. Let's go to the worksheet menu and you're gonna choose show summary. And you'll notice on the right, you'll have a summary pane where it's showing you the aggregates that you have in your visualization. And so that means that you can see all of these aggregates and others without having them in the visualization. Let's go ahead and click on average sales in the rows column and press delete. You're gonna do the same for everything except sum of sales. Because if you look at the summary card now, you can see the other ag aggregates. So this is a really great feature to use if your focus is on the sum and you don't wanna overwhelm the visualization, you can still see the other aggregates on the summary card. And so if you go to the drop down to the right of the summary card heading, you'll see that you can even show more aggregates here. So whatever you want to show, I'll pick a uh, standard deviation and I'm going to widen the width of that panel so I can see the entire number. So that's just another way of seeing aggregates. Go ahead and save again. The last lesson in this module is showing the top 10 items. So the example that we want to see are the top 10 products by sales value. So let's go ahead and bring up a new sheet. And by the way, there is another way you can do that. On your toolbar, you have your new sheet icon. And you also have the ability to duplicate a sheet and clear a sheet from there. So I'm going to use the icon this time just for variety's sake. And so you learn a different method of doing what we've been doing. And we're gonna go ahead and drag sales to columns. And we're going to drag product name to rows. And we have a lot of product names, so it's gonna become a scrollable chart at this point. And I'm gonna go ahead and collapse show me and you can see the scroll bar on the right side. But we're gonna fix that because we're actually gonna narrow it to just the top 10 product names based on sales values. So a couple of ways we can do this. Um, you can, in the rows shelf, you can right click on product name and choose filter. And so this is a filter that's only gonna apply to this sheet because we're doing it at the sheet level. And you saw an example of that earlier. So notice at the top, we used the general tab when we filtered earlier. You also have a wildcard tab. 
So you can actually create a filter by saying it contains something, starts with, ends with, or exactly matches. You have a condition tab where you can set conditions. So for example, by fields, the sum of sales is equal to or greater than and equal to or not equal to a certain value. I'm going to put that back on none. And we want to go to the top tab. So we're going to do the option button in front of by field. And you're going to make sure it says top 10 by sales. And it's the sum of sales. And so the top is a drop down. So you can choose top or bottom. We're going to leave it on top. For 10, you can create a parameter. Um, you can use a profit bin that's already there or top customers. We're going to just leave it on the number 10. So we're in the product name filter and we want to see the top 10 product names based on their sum of sales. And we're going to click OK. So a couple of things happened. I mean, it actually applied the filter so we don't have that scrollable list here. We have our top 10 product names based on their sales values. And the other thing that happened is it put product name in the filter shelf. And so we right clicked on product name where we did the arrow and we went to filter from the rows shelf. Um, we could have also dragged product name from the field list into the filter shelf. So many different ways of doing the same thing. So we want to go to label on the marks card and show our mark labels. So we can see the values of those bars at the end of them. We also want to click on color and I'm going to go with my orange color like we did earlier or whatever color you would like to go with. And on the toolbar, we're going to do the standard drop down and choose entire view. And so it makes it a little bit larger by doing that with this type of chart. Now I'm also going to put my mouse pointer between the first product name and the first bar click and hold. So when you get that double arrow and I'm just going to expand it so it shows most more of the product name there. It will word wrap the rest of it. And we're going to last but not least, we're going to name this sheet top 10 products by sales value. And save. This is the first of several modules where you got to create a bunch of different kinds of visualizations. We started with creating tables. And by the way, a table is a great companion visualization on a dashboard. So imagine having a map and then having an accompanying table or a pie chart and an accompanying, accompanying table. Then we learned how to create bar graphs and pie charts, and you learned how to sort your visualizations. We went on to creating histograms that show how data is clustered and using them as a comparison for categories. And then we moved on to creating line charts. Initially, when we chose two measures and one dimension, it created two separate line charts as part of the same visualization. And then we used the show me toolbar, which allowed us to select the dual line chart visualization, which created a dual axis in one visualization for our line charts. We then created stacked bar graphs using the show me toolbar to select that option as well. We moved on to creating box plots two different ways. The first way we used the reference line of box plot to add to our visualization. And the second way we used the box plot from the show me toolbar. 
You also learned how to add multiple aggregate measures to a visualization. And then you learned how to just have one and use the worksheet menu to show the summary card so you can display as many other aggregate measures for that particular visualization that you would need. And we ended by learning how to use a top filter where we showed the top 10 items. In this extensive course, we started by connecting to a variety of data sources, in particular text, Excel, and access database data sources. In that module, you also learned how to paste in data from a clipboard and how to merge multiple data sources. We went on to connect to a SharePoint list, which you may have needed to install a driver in order to be able to do. And then we went over the Tableau interface. So you learned what everything is called on the screen. We started changing data types. You saw what happens when you change it to date time and there are no times in the data source. And we changed some metadata and we started working with the sample superstore Tableau file. We split the customer name field into customer first and last on the data source view. And then we hid the original customer column so it wouldn't show in our field list. We even renamed the segment field to market segment. You learned how to apply a filter at the data source level, which means that every sheet will be filtered in that way. And you learned how to clear a filter at the data source level and add a filter at the sheet level. You learned the difference between dimensions and measures and their coloration. And then we moved into module two where we just started creating univariate charts. So we created tables, bar graphs, pie charts. You learned how to sort charts. We learned how to create a histogram and a line chart. You were introduced to the show me toolbar. And then we created stacked bar graphs and box plots. You learned how to show aggregate measures and the top 10 items by filtering. Hello everyone. I am Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to Tableau video training course. Tableau is a visual analytics platform that makes it easier for people to explore and manage data and faster to discover and share insights that can change businesses and the world. It helps people and organizations be more data-driven. Tableau supports data prep, analysis, governance, collaboration, and more. As a continuation of the Tableau introduction video training course, this advanced course is designed to boost the student's competence when it comes to creating visualizations and creating dashboards. The course goes into considerable detail on these two subjects and explores, among other areas, how to create a range of different charts, maps, user-defined fields, as well as a host of advanced features and abilities. We'll start by connecting to a variety of data sources. This will leave you with some great workbooks to practice on and develop on your own after this course. Then we'll move into creating a wide variety of charts, including bivariate, multivariate, and maps. In module three, we're going to focus on creating bivariate charts. We have six lessons in this module. We're going to start by creating a bivariate table, and then we're going to move on to creating scatter plots. You're going to learn how to swap rows and columns in visualizations, and also how to add trend lines. You'll learn about selecting color palettes 
and effective ways of using dates. Bivariate analysis means analyzing and exploring two variables at a time, and common types would be tables and scatter plots. So I've mentioned that tables are great as a supplemental viz. Scatter plots give an option to display a lot of data in a small area with relatively low confusion rates. So it's typically used to determine whether two measures are correlated. And because we're going to be adding trend lines in this module, I have a follow-up slide for you here giving you the five types of trend lines that you can use in Tableau. So back in Tableau, I'm going to use my tab scrolling arrows, which I'm pointing to on the screen, just like in Excel. I'm going to use those to go backwards until I find the sheet that we named average sales by market segment. So I'm going to just use the second scrolling arrow there. And I've located the sheet average sales by market segment. This is where we did our univariate table. And we want to make a copy of the sheet. So there's a couple ways of doing it. I'm going to just hold down my control key click and hold on the sheet tab, and you'll notice that my mouse pointer has a plus sign underneath it. And on the left side, you'll see a downward pointing arrow. I'm gonna drag to the right, all the way to the right as far as I can go, and let it go. And now I have to scroll to the last sheet on the left, and I can continue dragging that sheet without holding control going to continue dragging that sheet so it's at the very end after our top 10 products by sales value. So we have a copy of that sheet, which is indicated and you'll see the number two. And again, the sheet tab name is showing as the title on the sheet. So we'll fix that when we're done creating this particular table. So all we have to do here on our copy is go ahead and add the sales measure to columns. So of course it changes it into a bar chart. We're gonna use show me and we're gonna select the text table, which is the first one on a show me list. So now you have a table that's showing the average sales and the sum of sales. And notice how it put measure names in columns and they're showing the measure values at the bottom of the marks card. You have that little drop down, And then it shows that both measures were put in the text box here. And so now you have a bivariate table and we're going to name the sheet average and total sales by market segment and get rid of the two indicating that it's a copy. And as usual, after you've renamed it, go ahead and save your file. Now we're going to create a scatter plot. So let's go ahead and bring up a new sheet. And we're going to just put profit in columns and sales in rows for this one. So this is not useful at all, right? Just looking at the one little circle on this. Let's go to add more information. So let's put category in color and region in detail on the marks card. Region and detail. So we have our legend on the right showing our colorations there. If we hover over any of the circles, you'll see the category, the region, the profit, and the sales. But this is not a scatter plot quite yet. Let's go to our show me panel. And on the show me panel, you're going to select the scatter plot. It's the one that has the pluses and the, the circles on it. And notice at the bottom, as I'm always pointing out, 
For scatter plots, you need zero or more dimensions and two to four measures. So we have two measures on this, which is why it's eligible. I'm going to go ahead and select that. So this is giving you the ability to visualize the relationships between numerical variables. Let's collapse our show me panel. And you'll see now that you have a legend showing the different shapes that are being used for the different categories, right? So the circle is now representing furniture, the square is office supplies, and the plus sign is technology. That is a scatter plot. Let's go ahead and name this sheet Sum and profit by category and region. And then save. Now Tableau gives you the ability to swap rows and columns in a visualization, which is really cool. And so I already have a new sheet up. Let's go ahead and Put subcategory in columns, category in rows, and drag quantity to the text box on the marks card. So it gives us a table, right? And we use that text field on the marks card. And that's cool, but the point of this one is showing how to swap. But before I do that, my OCD will not allow me to ignore the column widths here. So I just needed to fix that so I can see all of the column names clearly, the column headings clearly, as opposed to them being truncated. So now that I have that going, how do you swap? Well, there's a shortcut key for it. You do control W and now you can see that the category is in columns and subcategory is in rows. So it depends on how you want to see the data. This gives you the flexibility to look at it a couple of different ways without you having to drag the fields around and you can do control W to swap it back again. So we're going to go ahead and name this sheet uh, quantity by subcategory and category. And I'm just going to abbreviate quantity, QTY, by subcategory and category. I really do know how to type most days. So control W is your swapping mechanism. And if you were to forget the shortcut key control W, you can go to the analysis menu and swap rows and columns is the last choice on that menu. Go ahead and bring up a new sheet and we're going to start we're going to create a visualization and we're going to add trend lines to it. Now, if you go to add trend lines and it doesn't allow you to do so, it's because you need to have some kind of numerical field on each access in the visualization. So either a date or a measure. That's the only way it'll allow you to add trend lines. So let's go ahead and put our sales measure in rows and we'll use the year of order, the year of the order date in columns for this one. So we have a date numeric and we have a measure numeric. So each axis has a numeric value on it. And so it gave us a line chart. Let's go to show me and let's choose the horizontal bar chart for this one. And I'm going to collapse show me and I'm going to change it from standard to entire view just to make it larger. And I decide I don't need this year of order date title at the top. 
So I'm going to right click on it, year of order date, it's kind of cut off, and I'm going to hide field labels for rows. It's obvious those are the years. And so how do we add the trend line? Well, there's a couple of ways, but let's do it this way. Um, on the left side, you're on your data tab in the field list, right? Up top, there's another tab called analytics. We're going to go there. And under model, you will see trend line. Now, when you start to drag it and drop it on your visualization, that's where you get to pick the type of trend line that you want. So we're going to drop it on linear and it adds the line to the visualization. Now, if you hover over the line, you'll see it has a tooltip of its own where it's giving you the calculation for sales and the year of the order date and the R squared value and P value. And you can also get additional information for your trend line by going to the analysis menu, hovering over trend lines, well actually, yeah, hovering over trend lines, and then selecting describe trend model. And so it gives you this whole dialogue of information, the model formula, the number of modeled observations, all of the stuff that you may or may not need and you can scroll across and see more values. And you can even copy that information and paste it somewhere else as necessary. So I'm gonna close describe trend model dialog and I'm going to go ahead and let's just call this um, sales trend by year. That would make sense for a name. And save your file as usual. Now let's say we selected the linear trend line and we really want an exponential trend line. Well, this is an easy fix. We can go back to the analytics tab and we can drag trend line over again and this time drop it onto exponential and notice the shape of that trend line changed a little bit, right? So you can, you can easily swap it by doing that. Now, at some point you might decide you don't want to show the trend line anymore and I'm actually going to swap it back to linear. Um, and for that, you can go to the analysis menu, hover over trend lines, and uncheck show trend lines. So it disappears off of your visualization. If I go back to analysis and hover over trend lines and click on show trend lines again, it will reappear. Go ahead and locate using your scrolling arrows the total sales by market segment pie chart sheet. So this is going to show you how to select color palettes and assign colors to the slices in this pie. So the reason why the pie slices are colored by market segment is because we had dragged market segment to the color box on the marks card. And it dis assigns it default colorations. We want to change that. So we are going to click on the color box on the marks card and choose edit colors. And notice on the left, it shows you the colors that it automatically assigned to each market segment. And on the right, under select color palette, it says automatic. We're going to do the drop down arrow there. You can see that Tableau has a host of color palettes available for you to use. And I'm going to choose one called traffic light. So now you see the colors that are available in the traffic light color palette. And so I'm going to just move it off of my pie chart a little bit. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to assign the colors from this palette to each market segment. So on the left, I'm going to click on consumer 
and that has the largest slice. So I'm going to give it a green color. So I click on the green color underneath our traffic light palette. And then I'm going to select corporate and corporate looks like it has the lowest amount. So I'm going to give that a deep red color. And then for home office, I'm going to do yellow. And now I can apply on the bottom right and you'll see the changes take place. So if you'd like to use a different palette, go ahead and select a different palette on your own and then assign the colors to each market segment like we just did and apply it. So I did the same as you. I switched my palette and I switched my colors and you can see my end result for this. And save. I've navigated back to my quantity by subcategory and category sheet. This is the one we did the swap on. I'm actually going to, we're going to use this for something else. I'm just going to expand my column headings a little bit so they're not cut off. So this portion is using dates, right? So we don't have any dates on this sheet, but we want to see varieties of the order date on here. So what we're going to do is go ahead and drag order date up to columns and drop it before subcategory. So it's the year of the order date. And then what we're going to do is you notice there's a plus sign in front of year. Click on the plus sign and it gives you the pill for the quarter of the order date. So now we see year and quarter. Go ahead and do the plus sign in front of quarter and you get month and so on and so forth. So you can add the same date field multiple times and show a variety of dates. Now, I think that what I want to do is make this look a little bit better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag subcategory in front of year of order date in the columns row, and it makes it a little bit more readable. So I'm seeing the year and then under each year, I'm seeing the quarter. And then under each quarter, I'm seeing the month. And this is showing furniture and office supplies don't look like they had anything going on in terms of quantities for 2019 and 2020. If I scroll over to the right a little bit in my visualization, I can see that it's not, well, yeah, there's 2019 for office supplies. It's coming in. So we're starting to see the data as we scroll to the right, but you can use, and that's a nice way of doing it. Um, if I do the minus sign in front of year order date, it collapses everything because all of the other date breakdowns are underneath year. So I would have to do the plus sign on that one plus sign on quarter again in order to be able to see the quarter and the month. Now, if I do the plus sign on month, it's going to show the day, but I don't want that level of detail. So I'm going to collapse. I'm going to do the minus sign on month to get rid of day. You can go ahead and save your file. Compared to our first two modules, module three, was fairly simple to get through. Um, we covered creating bivariate charts. So we did a bivariate table. Again, a table on a dashboard would be used as a supplement to another visualization. And then you learned how to create scatter plots. You learned the shortcut key as well as where it resides on the menu to swap your rows and columns in a visualization. You also learned how to add trend lines and remember the five different types of trend lines. There are descriptions of them in this slide deck, which is also in the video description for your future reference. 
you also learned how to hide the trend lines and how to change them. Then we got to select the color palette for our pre-existing pie chart, and you learned how to assign the colors to each slice of the pie. And you got to do that with me and on your own. And then you learned how to add different levels of the date to a visualization. In our fourth module, we'll switch our focus to creating multivariate charts. This module has six lessons. We're going to start by creating facets and then move on to creating area charts and then bullet graphs. You're going to learn how to create dual axes charts, how to create Gantt charts, and how to create heat maps in this module. Multivariate simply means analyzing and exploring more than two variables at a time. And I have the common types, which are our lessons, um, listed on this slide. So facets are effective at comparing categories within a single measure. It especially is effective when you have data that can be split into multiple categories and the bars will display side by side. You also have heard of facets referred to as small multiples. So that's what a facet is in Tableau. Area charts are powerful for adding detail to other visualizations, but they're not as effective on their own. They're kind of like supplemental, like a table. Bullet graphs show where your data is clustered and can compare categories. Gantt charts connect several distinct data points, presenting them as one continuous evolution. It's a simple, straightforward way to visualize changes in one value relative to another. And then we have heat maps, also known as density maps. They can be used when you want to show a trend for visual clusters of data. For example, which areas of Manhattan have the most taxi pickups? That would be an example of something that you might want to show on a heat map. And now we're going to create a facet or small multiples visualization. I'm on the last sheet in the workbook and I'm going to do my new sheet button to get a brand new sheet to build this on. And on this sheet, we're going to drag subcategory to columns. And we're going to drag both sales and then profit to rows. So now that we've done that, we have multiples. We have within the same visualization, we have sales and we have profits. And notice that both of them show up on the marks card saying that they're all, both of them are using the automatic mark, which is the column in this particular instance. Now we're going to, I'm using control drag. I'm going to hold down control, click and hold on profit in the rose shelf and drag it to color on the marks card. So made a copy of it. So both facets are going to have the color, but the legend over on the right is going to be for profit because that's the facet that we put on the color card. So then we want to change the colors. You can do it a couple of different ways. I'll show you both ways. We can click on color in the marks card, choose edit. And then for the palette that says automatic, we're going to drop down and we're going to choose red, green, diverging and we're going to click apply. So you see that the colors are going to apply to everything in the visualization, but the legend is just showing for profit. We're going to click OK. Now, another way you can change the colors or make other settings changes regarding them is from the legend. Go to the drop down next to the legend and you can go into edit colors and you'll see the same box as when we clicked on color in the marks card and we can cancel that. Just wanted to show you the other way of doing it. Now we're going to create another facet by adding the quantity field to rows. So now we have another section. 
in our visualization, sales, profit, and quantity. Now, if we sort any of these facets, it's going to cause the other ones to sort because they're arranged by subcategory, right? So we're going to go to the Y axis on profit where it says profit and we want to sort it. And so from lowest to highest, I clicked it twice, the sort icon. So we see the negative profit at the beginning of its facet. And then we're going to go ahead just to be able to do a little bit more analysis on this. We're going to grab the category field and add it to column shelf before subcategory. So now you have your categories, right? And your subcategories are showing at the bottom. So we can see the way that we have it sorted from lowest to highest, especially particularly if you look at the profit facet, you'll see that furniture is where most of the negative profit is. And then office supplies has a little bit of negative profit as well. And we're going to name this sheet and it's going to be sales profit and I'm going to use QTY for quantity by category and sub category. And as usual, save. Now we're ready to create our area chart. An area chart is really a line chart with the area filled in. And again, it's a useful companion visualization for another visualization. So let's go ahead and bring up a new sheet for this. And on this sheet in the field list, we're going to use control click and we're going to select ship date and profit. And then expand your show me. And in the show me pane, you're going to select the area chart. And so you have, I'll show you, I'll point to it here for you. This is the area chart that we want to select. So when you go ahead and click on it, so another way, this is a different way of doing things. We selected the fields that we wanted, and then we selected the visualization type and it placed those fields on the column and the rows shelf for us and built the area chart. And by the way, if you look at the bottom, when you have your area chart selected, you need one date, zero or more dimensions, and one measure in order to be able to use that type of chart. I'm going to go ahead and collapse show me. So you notice this is really a line chart with the area filled in. We're going to give it some more context. So let's drag category to color on the marks card. And now you'll see it's split up by different categories. The blue one, you can see the legend on the right is furniture, orange is office supplies, and that palish pink or rose color is technology. So we're giving it more depth. And for the ship date, we want to change it to quarter. So I'm going to do the drop down there next to year of ship date in the columns shelf. And I want to select the quarter with the year after it. Now, is there another way I could have done that? I could have done the plus sign in front of year. So now we're seeing it by quarter. We're giving it more depth. And we also want to see some profit in here. So we're going to use profit as a label. So drag profit to the label box on the marks card. And now you're seeing the labels on this area chart.
Now notice in the marks card at the top where it typically says automatic, it now says area. We can go to the drop down there and choose line and it changes it to a line chart. We're going to go back to the drop down and change it back to area. So area charts are really line charts with the area filled in. And go ahead and name the sheet profit by category. So again, an area chart is good, similar to a table as a companion chart for another visualization on a dashboard. So I've saved my file and I have a new sheet ready to go where we're going to create a bullet graph. So let's go ahead and drag sales and profit to columns for this one. Sales and profit to columns. And we'll drag subcategory to rows. And now let's use our show me panel to select the bullet graph. And the bullet graph is the center one in the bottom row. I'm pointing to it now. And when you hover over it, you'll see that you need one or zero or more dimensions, two measures. And then it says right click the continuous axis to swap reference lines. And you'll see what that means in just a moment. Go ahead and select your bullet graph. And then go up to the toolbar and change it from standard to entire view. And I'm going to collapse my show me panel. So how do I read this? Let's start with the vertical lines that you're seeing on your bullet graph. When you hover over a vertical line, it's going to show you the average sales value for that particular subcategory. Now to the left of that, you'll see a shaded gray area. And that shaded area, if you hover over any of the shaded gray areas, this one I'm seeing 60% of average sales value. So it gives you these markers along the way, right? There's 60%. Another one, 60%. So the shading matters here, right? So... You can see the average sales value, 60 and 80% of the average sales value. Here's another one for art. Here's the 60% of average sales. And then to the right of that vertical white line that's coming down, it's showing 80% of the average sales. For appliances, it would do the same, 60 and 80, depending on what side of that white line you're on and then the average sales. So let's see what happens when we swap the reference lines. We're going to right click on the profit axis and we're going to choose swap reference line fields. And so the whole thing looks a little bit different now. When you hover over one of those vertical lines, you're getting the average profit again. So that is the same. And then you have your shaded areas that you can get to and see your 60 or 80%. So it just swapped the reference lines and we can swap them back. So notice when we swapped it now at the bottom, it's saying sales, right? We're going to swap it back. So by right clicking on the sales axis, swap reference line fields, and now it's back to profit. So it's kind of similar to swapping rows and columns, but different. And that is a bullet graph. Now, the only other thing we want to do is let's go to color and choose an orange color for this. And then we're going to go ahead and name our sheet. Let's see. We're going to name our sheet for this one. It really is sales and profits by subcategory. So we can, yeah, we'll name it sales and profit. By subcategory. and save. 
we saw an example of a dual axis chart in an earlier module when we created the double line chart, right? And so it had a dual axis by default when we did that. Now I'm going to show you how to create one using a slightly different method. So let's go ahead and drag order date to columns and sales to rows. And we also want to include quantity in here, but the quantity values are really different than the sales values. So what we're going to do is we're going to click and hold on the quantity field, drag it onto our visualization and over to the right until you see a dashed black line and then let it go. It automatically creates the dual axis double line chart right? Do a line chart. And so we can still have a dual axis chart without it being a dual line chart. I'm going to go to show me. I'm going to use the horizontal bar chart for this one. And notice it gets rid of, so it separated the two of them. Well, how can I fix this? I'm going to get rid of the sum of quantity from columns. I'm going to just click on it and press delete. And then I'm going to drag quantity onto the visualization. Oops, before I do that, let me collapse show me. I'm going to drag quantity onto the visualization all the way over until I see a dashed line. And so I still retain my bar but I have a dual axis going on on this chart. So by dragging it over until you see the dash line, that will automatically create a dual axis chart for you. And then we don't want to see it by year of order date. We want to see by quarter of order date. So I'm going to do the plus sign in front of year and it's showing the year and the quarter. And then I'm going to delete the year pill from the rows shelf. So now I'm just seeing the information by quarter of order date. And we can go ahead and name this sheet sales and quantity by quarter. And you can save. Now we're going to create a Gantt chart. And remember, that's a straightforward way to visualize changes in one value relative to another. So let's go ahead and bring up a new sheet. And for this one, we're going to drag order date to columns. And we're going to do the drop down arrow to the right side of that year order date pill. And we're going to hover over more and select week number. So you'll see the week numbers of the order date. And let's grab subcategory and ship mode and put them both in rows. Subcategory and ship mode. Now we're not done with the fields we're going to have that we're going to be using here, but let's go ahead and go to our show me and your Gantt chart is the first one in the bottom row. Notice it requires one day, one or more dimensions and zero to two measures. We're going to go ahead and select it. And now what we're going to do next is we want to size the marks on the Gantt chart according to the length of interval between the order date and ship date fields. And we're going to do that by creating a calculated field. So we're going to go up to the analysis menu and we're going to choose create calculated field. And the first thing we're going to do is name this calculation. So we're going to name it days to ship. And then we're going to click in the box and we're going to use a diff function here. So I'm going to start typing date. And when it shows up on the list, I stop typing, 
I use my arrow key to highlight it or I double click it so I can avoid typos. If I highlight it, I can tab it in or you can double click it. Now, of course, at the bottom, it says the calculation contains errors because we haven't finished it. It's showing you the syntax of the date diff function right underneath where we're going to put the function. So right now it's looking for the date part argument. So we want to see the difference between order date and ship date in days. And then it has an argument of start date and another one of end date. So we're going to build that up now. So it's inside the parentheses after date diff. And we're going to start typing day or the letter D. I see day on the list, so I'm going to dump it in. Oops. And actually backspace, I made a huge mistake there. We don't want to use the day function here. We want to tell it the date part of day. So for that, I'm going to type a single quote, the word day, and then close the single quote and type a comma. So now it's ready for the start date. For the start date, you're going to start typing order and you'll see order date on the list and you can double click it or tab it in. After order date, you're going to do and at your outside the closing bracket on order date, you're going to type a comma and then you're going to start typing ship. So you get ship date in. So we want the difference in days between the order date and the ship date. And the only thing we have to do is type a closing parentheses after ship date. And down at the bottom, it lets us know that our calculation is valid and we're going to click OK. So now in our field list, we have our days to ship calculated field. And we want our Gantt chart marks to be sized according to the days to ship. So we're going to drag our days to ship field onto size on the marks card. And you can see how it's showing different sizes. We have a legend over here because the subcategory is now in color. All right. So our sizes of the marks are based on the days to ship. If you hover over standard class, the bottom standard class one, the blue one, right? You'll see that it's in the accessories subcategory. It gives you the week of the order date and then 86 days to ship. If we look at the next one to the right, that one has 206 days to ship in this one, depending on the category. We're going to change this a little bit. We don't want the sum of the days to ship. We want to see the average days to ship. So on the marks card, I'm going to do the sum of days to ship drop down, hover over measure and choose average. So this chart is kind of overwhelming right now. So we're going to apply a filter so it'll make more sense. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold down our control key. And in the column shelf, we're going to click and hold on the week of order date and drag it to the filter shelf. And we're going to select range of dates and next. We're going to put in January 1st, 2021 for the first date. Let me get in there. And we'll do December 31st, 2021 for the second date. And we will apply the filter and click OK. 
So it's doing it by the week of the order date, but it has a range of dates. So it's not all four or five years of the data that we have in here. And so when we hover over any of the marks on the Gantt chart, you'll see the ship mode, the subcategory, the week of the order date, and the average days to ship. And let's drag ship mode to color on the marks card. So now we get, it looks a little bit better, right? First class, right? Average days to ship is changing depending on the week of the order date. We're seeing second class. It looks like same day, which makes sense because they have the least amount of days to ship. Although there's one same day in there, it took one. Most of them are zeros for days to ship. For second class, depending on the week, we're seeing some fours, fives, threes, so on and so forth. And that is a Gantt chart in Tableau. Now to give the end user some more flexibility, we're going to show the order date filter so they can look at different date ranges. So I'm going to right click on order date in the filter shelf and I'm going to choose show filter. So it shows up over on the right and it shows up as like a sliding bar, right? So your end users can go ahead and drag for different ranges of dates. Or we could do the drop down arrow next to it, right? And we could change it to relative date, start date, end date, browse periods. We're going to leave it on range of dates with the slider. And we're going to name this sheet days to ship. Ah, before we actually name it, let's drag subcategory to detail on the mox card. And now we can name it days to ship by sub category. And ship mode. And save. So I'm all set up on a new sheet so we can create our heat map. Heat maps are also known as density maps. So let's start by dragging profit to columns and changing it to average from sum. We're going to drag sales to rows and also change it to average from sum. So we have our average profit, our average sales. And we're going to drag state province to detail on the marks card. So now in the marks card, we're going to go to our marks drop down where it says automatic. And we're going to select density at the bottom. And so it gives you a heat map of sorts. Now, the other thing I want to point out here is if I go to the show me pane and I select heat maps, it's the second one on the top. It makes it look more like a table with the stuff in there. So I'm going to do control Z, which is undo. I want it to look like this where you're actually seeing by the shape, the density. So if I hover over one that's dense, it's showing me the average profit and average sales for Ontario. Looks like in Canada, that has a lot more density. Um, New Hampshire, you'll see the ones with the darker circles are kind of like the denser ones, it looks like. So let's go to color on the Mox card and do the drop down next to automatic. And we're going to select one of the density color grids that they have there. Um, we're going to do density multicolor light. And so you can see it looks more like a traditional heat map when you're doing it that way um, by using the density colors. 
let's change the intensity to 85% for that. Ooh, so now you can really see the more dense areas. And to make it really stand out, we're gonna do something here. Right click anywhere on your visualization and choose format. And the format pane opens on the left side of your screen where your field list is normally. Underneath where it says format font, you'll see a series of icons. We wanna select the paint bucket, which is for shading. And for our worksheet, where it says under default, for our worksheet, we're gonna make it black. So the colors really pop there. And then underneath where it says format shading, we're gonna go to the lines icon. And for grid lines, we're gonna do the drop down and select none. So we're getting rid of the grid lines, which makes it look more like a heat map. So you can close that format pane. There's an X to the right of format lines and it brings you back to your data and or analytics pane. And so you have an example of a heat map there. We're gonna go ahead and name this sheet Average sales and profit by state province and save. So since we changed our worksheet shading to black, um, we can go ahead and we can't really see the title of the worksheet or the axis title. So we're gonna fix that. I'm gonna start by right clicking on the title of the worksheet up top and choosing format title. And on the format pane on the left, I'm gonna change the shading to white, just so it can be visible. And then I'm gonna right click on the average sales Y axis and choose format. And I'm gonna change that shading to white as well. And I'm gonna do the same thing, do the same thing for your X axis at the bottom. You'll learn more about formatting later in the course, but for right now, just so those are visual, visible, we'll do it that way and go ahead and save again. In module four, we created several multivariate charts. We started by creating facets, also known as small multiples, where we ended up having sales, profit, and quantity by subcategory in our small multiples graphs. Then we moved on to creating an area chart, which is a great supplemental chart to another chart on a dashboard. And it really is just a line chart with the area filled in. So you were shown how to do that. And then we added a field to create colors on the area chart and we had them colored by category. We moved on to creating a bullet graph and you learned how to create the bullet graph from Show Me, but you also learned how to review it and how to swap reference lines back and forth. In the fourth lesson, you learned how to create a dual axis chart by dragging a secondary measure to the border of the chart, existing chart or visualization until you see the dotted, the dashed black line. So when you're using measures that have disparate value ranges, you would want a dual access chart for clarity. We moved in create to creating uh, our Gantt chart, right? Which 
And you learned how to do a calculated field during that lesson where we used uh, the date diff function to calculate the days between the order date and ship date. We also filtered the Gantt chart so it's more readable and we showed the filter on the page so end users have the chance to select different date ranges. And lastly, we created our heat map. We did it not by using show me, but by using the density mark in the marks card. We added color to our density by using one of the colors that are built, the density palettes that were built in. And we changed the background of the sheet to black so that the heat map actually pops visually. We got rid of the grid lines to make it more clear. And then as usual, we saved it after giving the sheet a name. Our fifth module is all about creating maps. So in the first lesson, you're going to learn how to create geographic roles. Um, we already have our geographic roles created, but I'll review where you would go to create them if they weren't created. In the second lesson, you'll learn how to place marks on a map. Then we'll move on to overlaying demographic data. In the fourth lesson, you'll learn how to create a coral pleth map, which it just simply means a filled map. In lesson five, you're going to learn how to use polygon shapes on a map, and we'll do some further customization of maps to end this module. So as I mentioned, a coral pleth map is known as a filled map, and they're great for showing ratio data. So I have an example here that says, if you want to see obesity rates for every county across the U.S., you could use this type of map to spot any spatial trends. I already have my new sheet ready for us to create maps on, but what I want to do first is go to the data source view so that we could take a look at where you would assign geographic roles to fields if necessary. So in your met metadata grid, go ahead and click on the globe icon in the type column for city and hover over geographic role. So these roles have already been assigned, right? Um, you notice that city is assigned the geographic role of city. Um, if you look at the globe and the geographic role for state province, you see that it's already assigned. Now, it's rare that it will assign it the wrong place, but if it does, you can change it here at any point. So you have to have geographic roles assigned in order to be able to create maps. Now I'm gonna navigate back to my blank sheet and I'm going to drag the state province field under location to rows. And then using show me, I'm going to go ahead and select the symbol map. If you look at the requirements for symbol maps, you need one geographic dimension, zero or more dimensions, and zero to two measures. And so any of the fields that have the globe symbol can be used as that geographic dimension. I'm gonna go ahead and collapse show me. So you'll notice a few changes. You'll notice that the columns now says longitude generated and rows says latitude generated. And so it takes that geographic dimension and it separates it into longitude and latitude. And then if you look at the marks card, something interesting happened. We used the state province field 
but it also gave us the country region field. And let me explain a little bit about why that happened. If we look at location on the fields list, it's in a hierarchy. That's what the symbol in front of location represents, the icon. And in that hierarchy, you have country, region, region, state, province, city, and postal code. So it's given me the top layer, the upper layer of the hierarchy, the uppermost level of the hierarchy, in addition to the one that we chose. Now, we don't want country region, so we're going to click on it in the marks card and press delete on your keyboard. So that's how, that's always going to generate the highest level of a hierarchy along with anything in a sub level like state province. So now we're going to give our map more context and we're going to do that by dragging sales to size on the marks card. So now you'll notice the states that had sales, the states and provinces that had sales have circles on them representing the largest circle would represent larger sales and the smaller circles, smaller sales. And you can hover over any of those marks to see the actual sales value there. Because we put sales as size on the marks card, we have a legend that populates on the right side. Now on the marks card, we're going to select the sales pill and we're going to go to the automatic drop down and you can change it to a different shape if you want it. So we could change it to a square and then we decide, no, we want it to be a circle again. So I'm going to just go back and change it to the circle. And let's grab the state field from the field list and drag it to color on the marks card. So we have state both as detail and we have it as the color. So we get another legend on the right indicating the colors of the circles for their size by state. And we decide that we're undecided whether we want to use color for the state province. We may change our mind about it, but in the meantime, we certainly don't need its legend on the right. So we can go ahead and do the drop down arrow to the right of the legend header and choose hide card. Before we overlay demographic data on our map, let's do a couple of changes. So at this point, we've decided we don't want color assigned to the state and provinces. So in the marks card, I'm going to select the state province pill and press delete to get rid of it. And we're going to drag sales to color from the field list instead. So now we have a sum of sales color palette legend on the right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on color on the marks card and edit colors. And I am going to choose a diverging palette. So I think I'll go with the um, orange blue. I'll do the orange blue white diverging one. And then I'm going to do something different here with my palette. I'm going to check the box that says stepped color, stepped color, and I'm going to leave it on five steps. So if you uncheck it, you see that it's just like blending all the colors together like that. If you do stepped color, it'll break it into five segments of differing colors. And I'm going to go ahead and apply and click OK. So both the size and the color of the circles on the map representing sales are based on the sales value. The other thing we're going to do here is we're going to get rid of the sum of sales size legend by clicking its drop down arrow and hiding that card. 
At this point, go ahead and save. We're not done with this map yet, but it's a good time to save. So now if you hover your mouse over your map, in its upper left corner, you'll see your map controls toolbar. Click on the, or hover over the right pointing arrow and select the four arrow points. And that is the pan one. So now when you put your mouse on the map and you drag it up and down, you can pan the map. So you can see that we have Canada and the United States in here, and we're seeing Mexico as well. If I keep panning, we'll see other countries. And none of those countries have any sales in them at this point, except for the United States, I believe. So that gives you the ability to pan the map. Now we're gonna start overlaying demographic data and the way that we're going to do that is we're going to go to the map menu and choose background layers. And the background layers panel opens on the left and I'm going to size it so that I can see it a little bit better. So certain things, certain background map layers are included by default and We'll use the style and show you everything at the top, but I'm jumping right to background map layer section. And so we have the base map, we have land cover, country region borders, country region names, same for state province borders and names. And we wanna add some more layers. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna check the box in front of coastline and if you keep your eye on your map and you uncheck it, you'll see that the coastlines are not defined. When you check it again, you'll see the definition for the coastlines on your map. And we're also going to put a check mark in front of water labels. Again, try to keep your eye on the map while you're doing this. But now you're actually seeing the names of the bodies of water. There's your Gulf of Mexico down there. Um, and that's what water labels do. You can take a moment and you can check other background map layers as you'd like. I'm going to leave mine the way it is right now. But I want to point out another thing that you can do. If we checked coastline and water labels, if we want all of our maps to include that automatically, we can go to the very bottom of that background layers pane and choose make default. So any subsequent maps that you create will default with those background map layers already included. Now, if you look at the very bottom of your background layers tab, you'll see that they have another section down there called data layer. And we're going to explore that now. So right now it's set to no data layer and we're going to do the drop down and you see a bunch of the statistical information that shows up U S households, U S housing, occupations, population, population by race. Under population, U S population, we're going to just click on population. And then it shows underneath it, the detail is by state, which we want to leave it the population by state. And it assigns it a palette. And I'm going to switch it to a different palette. And I'm going to choose orange blue diverging. And so now we have an additional layer showing population and you actually get a legend over on the right showing the population values and the coloration of the states. Now there are a handful of background styles that you can include on your map or you can switch to on your map. So it defaults to light. And you can take a look at all of them, take a few moments to look at all of them and see what, how they change the background of your map.
So you get to see the variety of things. Streets is kind of interesting on this map. And it does show you more detail. You get some city information on there as well. Outdoors is kind of nice. And then one of my personal favorites is satellite. For some reason, I like looking at it that way. But I think I'll go with, you can choose one that suits your needs. I think I'll do the outdoors one. It's bright. It's colorful. It has some state information on it. Uh, city information in the states um, on it as well. And you can give your background style a washout effect so it's not quite as bold if you want to. There's one last thing we're gonna address before we move on to creating a coral pleth map. And in the lower right corner of your map, you'll see 10 unknown. And if you hover over it, it says there are 10 values that have unknown geographic locations. Let's go ahead and click on that. And there are three options for you. You could edit the locations, you could filter the data, which is what we're gonna choose in a moment, or you can show the data at default position on the axis. So it would show no values as zeros. Let's first click on edit locations. So notice it is all, the everything that is unrecognized is the provinces in Canada. And we don't have data that we need to really see up in Canada. So what we're gonna do is click okay on that. And what we can do is close your background layers pane on the left. And you're gonna drag state province to the filters shelf. And you're going to select none. And now we're going to just exclude those provinces. So we'll start from the top. We'll exclude Alberta, British Columbia, scroll down for Manitoba, New Brunswick, Newfoundland and Labrador, Nova Scotia, We're going to do Ontario, Prince Edward Island, Quebec, and Saskatchewan. And once they're selected, it's easier to select less of a list. We're going to choose the box in front of exclude, and we're going to apply and okay. So your 10 unknowns disappeared from the bottom right of your map. Go ahead and save and bring up a new sheet. And it might be a good idea for us to name the preceding sheet. Sorry about that. So the sheet with our map on it, we're gonna call sales by state. And later on, you'll learn how to give your title a different set of text as opposed to the sheet. It's just that when you name a sheet, it automatically makes that the name of the title on your visualization, but you'll learn later how to change that. So now I'm going to go to the blank sheet. Now we're ready to create our filled map or choropleth map. So we want to, in your field list, select the country region field and hold down your control key and select state province. 
And then you're going to click and hold on either one of those selected and drag to detail in the marks card. Now we're going to use show me. And on the show me, notice the map that is selected that has the highlight around it. That's what's recommended. That's a symbol map. That's like what we've created already. And then the one to the right of it, it just says maps when you hover over it. And you're going to choose that. And that is your filled map. And now we're going to go back to background layers for a moment. So we're going to go map menu, background layers. And what I want to do on, I want to uncheck the state province names. We're going to make them show up clearer on the map. And then we can close our background layers pane. And we're going to drag the state field the state province field to detail on the marks card. I actually meant to say drag it to label on the marks card. So I've adjusted mine. Um, you can just drag your repeat of state province from detail into the label box. And so they show up a little bit more clear on the map as opposed to getting it from the background. Now we want to get a count of customers for each state in our map. And in order to do that, we're going to create a, a calculated field and we're going to use it to apply both color and detail to our map. So we can go up to the analysis menu and we're going to create calculated field. Now it would be ideal if we look over at our field list, we have customer first and customer last because we split the customer name field. And we don't have like a customer ID field, which would make each customer unique. So this is not going to be an accurate calculation, but it's the best I can come up with this data set. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just name the calculated field customer count. And then we're going to use the distinct count function. So start typing count and you have both count and count D. We want to select count D. So that is the distinct count. It will only count each item once, even if there is a repeat. And that's why this is not going to actually be accurate because we don't have a customer ID column. So you need to make sure you're inside the count D parentheses. And you're going to start typing customer and choose customer last. And so if you had clicked anywhere and you were outside the parentheses at the bottom, it would say in red, the calculation is not valid. So now we're good with our calculation. We're going to click OK. And we have under measure names in our field list, we have our customer count and we're going to drag it to color on the marks card. And we're also going to drag it to detail on the marks card. So we have it in two places. If I hover over any state, I will see the count of customers in that state based on distinct last name. So we're excluding any customers that might have the same last name. And we get an aggregate customer count legend over on the right. And it's just doing that non stepped coloration. So I'm going to do the drop down arrow next to that and choose edit colors. And I think I want to change it to my, I, I'm fond of my orange blue diverging diverging and I'm going to use five steps for my color and click OK. The other thing I'm going to do is edit the legend title instead of ag customer count. I'm going to do the drop down arrow and choose edit title. And I'm going to just call it 
as you can see, number of customers, and then just go ahead and click OK. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, on your marks card, drag your detail ag customer count, drag that to label. So now we're actually seeing the customer counts on our map. And so we can hide that card for a number of customers. We don't need it because we can actually see it on each state. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the label on the Mox card. And where it says font, we're going to do the drop down. And you're going to change the font to actually you can type in another number there. So we're going to type in a seven. It only goes down to eight and press enter. So everything fits better on the map as well. So you can come out of that with the and go back to label again. And this time click the ellipsis next to text. And we want to make that ag of customer count bold. So I'm going to select that and do the B for bold and click apply. So the number should stand out a little bit more. On the map and I'm just zooming in. Now you can zoom by using your um, arrow if you have your your mark set to zoom here, right? My mark is set to pan, but if I use my shift key, it will let me zoom and I can still pan. So you have your filled map. And so we're going to name this sheet number of customers by state slash province and go ahead and save your file. So our next lesson is using polygon shapes in maps. Let's go ahead and bring up a new sheet and I could make this very simple, but I'm also deciding to show you how to do groupings during this lesson. So what we're going to do is in our field list, we want to double click country region and notice it places it in details on the marks card and then it generated the longitude and the latitude. And this automatically creates a symbol map, right? When you, when you do something like that, it defaults to a symbol map. So now we're going to take sales and drag it to color on the marks card. And this will automatically change it to a filled map. So the, the last one, when we did our coral path on the last sheet, um, we use show me to change it to a filled map. But if you drag a measure to color, it will automatically make it a filled map. If we add a, if we had added a dimension to color, it would be a symbol map. So let's drag some of sales from color to detail in the marks card. We're back to a symbol map by doing this as well. So now we want to create groups using the United States, the states in the United States. So what we're going to do in our field list, and I'll, we'll do the first one together, and then I'll have you do the subsequent groups on your own. So in our field list, we're going to right click on state province, and we're going to hover over create and choose group. So notice up at the top, it gives it a name of state, province, and then group in parentheses, and we're not going to change that. 
And we want to create groups that represent the regions in the United States. And so we're going to just use the five regions, um, West, Southwest, Midwest, Northeast, and Southeast. And we'll do the West region together. And it's going to have nine states in it. I will, um, after we do this one together, you'll have a slide showing you the other regions that you're going to create. And you're going to create them all in this box. And actually, we'll do the first two together to make it a little bit easier. So we're going to start with the West. And what we want to do is we want to start selecting the states that we want in the West region. So, and I'm going from top to bottom here. We're going to select California. And I'm just holding down my control key. And we're going to select Colorado. And then we're going to go down to Idaho. And then I'm going to scroll down until I see Montana. And then we want Nevada. Scroll down some more. Oregon. We want Utah. Washington. And Wyoming. So I've been using my control key to select them. And I'll read them out again from the top. California, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, Oregon, Utah, Washington, Wyoming. So once you have those nine selected, we're going to click the group button. And notice it puts them all in the group. It's showing California, Colorado, Idaho, and six more. And that's already selected. So we're going to name that West and press enter. And then what you could do, because you're going to be creating more groups, you can collapse West and notice all of the states that we selected for West are not in the list. They're underneath the West group. So let's do our second one together and then you'll be able to do the other three on your own. So this one is going to be our Southwest group. Starting from the top, Arizona. We're going to scroll down until we see New Mexico and control click it. Then we want Oklahoma and Texas. We're going to click the group button and we're going to name this Southwest. Press enter and collapse that group as well. So now I'm going to put a slide up for you so that you can create the rest of the groups on your own. Here's the slide you can reference for creating the Midwest, Northeast, and Southeast groups on your own. I've included the number of members in the group because at the end, after you select everything, it, it shows you the first three and then plus however many more. So you can double check that you have all of them that you need. And just a note at the bottom, you're not doing anything on the excluded column. Um, it doesn't include Alaska. We're excluding District of Columbia and Hawaii on purpose there. So go ahead and create your three groups and you can pause the recording to keep the slide on the screen. So now that we have our groups created, we want to put everything that we did not include into a group, into a group it will create called other. So we're going to check the box underneath the group button that says include other. And it grouped all of the provinces. It also has the District of Columbia in there, and that's fine. And we're going to click OK at the bottom. So now you'll notice in your field pane that you have a state province group. And we're going to drag that to the color box on the marks card. And so if we didn't include other, we'd have a longer legend here because it would list all of those things that we excluded with their own colors. And now we want to change the type of mark from automatic to map. So the colors will fill the map based on the regions. Now, a couple of other things that we want to do. 
let's go over to our legend on the right and do the drop down and choose edit colors. I'm going to choose a different palette. I think I'm going to go with the orange gold palette this time. No, I won't do that one. I'll do the summer palette. Hmm, can't seem to make up my mind here. So I'll figure out what palette I want while you figure out which palette you want to use. So my mind is made up and I assigned the, co the colors that I wanted to the data item. And I'm going to go ahead and click apply and then OK. And I'm going to drag state province, not the group, but state province from the field list to label so that they show up better on the map. And then I'm going to go to label and adjust the font to seven point like we did previously so it fits better. Now, if we'd want it, we could have put the regions in text, but since we already have the legend on the right side, that's not necessary. It's better to have the states in there as the label so you can see them clearly on the map. Now, the only thing that we need to do is to change that state province group or state province. We can change the shape of it to polygon. So we'll do the groups. Um, so I'm going to click on state province group. We changed it to map. Go back to your marks drop down and choose polygon, which is a really different way of looking at everything. So that would be an example of using polygons on maps. You can hover over each part of the polygons and see the same data as you did before. So let's go ahead and save this sheet and we'll call it um, sales by region just to keep it simple. Our last lesson in this module is more on customizing maps. So what we're going to do for this one, it's let's go ahead and drag our state province group to the filter shelf. And then we'll leave it. We'll just click OK at the bottom. And then we're going to right click on that filter and choose show filter. So this way we have the state province filter at the top. So if an end user, I'm going to uncheck all there and the map disappears. If the end user just wants to see the West, they can do it like that. And I'm going to recheck all. And now let's go back to our map menu so we can get back to our background layers. And let's change the style for this one to normal. And then under background map layers, let's choose cities. We're going to check cities. And we can close that pane now. And actually, I'm going to collapse this down a little bit. I want more room for my map. So as you zoom in on the map, you'll start seeing the cities in every state. Go ahead and save your file. We started module five by reviewing the geographic roles from the metadata grid in data source view. And we didn't have to change or create any, but you know where to go if it's necessary for you to do so. And then we started placing marks on a map by using show me to create our first map, a symbol map. You learned a little bit about the hierarchy for location. And so, and you also learned how to delete a pill. We use sales values as the size of the circles on the map. 
and we use state as coloration on the map. You also learned how to hide a card during that lesson. We moved on to overlaying demographic data. So you learned how to add background layers to a map and to save them as a default for all future maps that you might create in the workbook. You learned how to address the address unknown flag in the bottom right of the map. We did that by filtering. We also um, were able to show the population at the state level on that map by adding a data layer to it. You learned how to select a palette, a diverging palette, and we changed the background style of the map um, my favorite is satellite, but I went with outdoors on that one. And then we got rid of, oh, well, I already discussed that. We, we got rid of those address unknowns by filtering. We moved on to creating a coral pleth map, which is a filled map. Sorry about that slide there. And we could do it um, a couple of different ways. It depends on what, where you put the measures in a map, whether it's going to be symbol or filled, or you can use show me for that as well. So we got rid of some background data layers. Um, and you learned how to, even though the states show up on the map, um, they're kind of dimmed out. So what we did is we added state to label and change the size of the label to make it more readable. We created another calculated field here, which was not accurate, but it served our purpose where we did a distinct count on the customer last name. And we used that calculated field to provide color and detail to the filled map. So in the next one, lesson five, using polygon shapes, um, I took you the long way around. I had, I gave you some opportunity to learn how to create groups and how to use them. Um, and we use those groupings as coloration on our map. And we also then change the shape on the marks card for polygon. So each point is pointing to a bit of data. Lastly, we ended up doing some more map customization, which we did throughout. In this extensive course, we started by connecting to a variety of data sources, in particular text, Excel, and access database data sources. We did more charts, this time bivariate charts. So we created a bivariate table and you learned that tables are good as companion visualizations instead of main visualizations. They can give more detail to another visualization. We created scatter plots. You learned how to swap rows and columns and add trend lines and how to select and apply color palettes. And we started using dates as well. And you learned how to change the date from year to quarter or month or week or day, so on and so forth. The next module is where we created multivariate charts. So we created facets, which are also known as small multiples, area charts, which are like filled in line charts. We created bullet graphs dual axes charts, and you learned along the way two different ways to create those. We created Gantt charts, and we also created a heat map. We started creating maps. So you learned about how to set geographic roles from data source view, and we reviewed them in the metadata grid. We placed marks on a map, and then we got to overlay some demographic data from background layers. So we added coastline and water labels, and we were able to do that very easily. We also added another background layer showing the population, the US population from 2018. 
we moved on to creating choropleth maps, which are filled maps. And we created one also using polygon shapes. And we spent some time customizing maps. Hello, everyone. I am Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to Tableau Video Training Course. Tableau is a visual analytics platform that makes it easier for people to explore and manage data and faster to discover and share insights that can change businesses and the world. It helps people and organizations be more data-driven. Tableau supports data prep, analysis, governance, collaboration, and more. As a continuation of the Tableau introduction video training course, this advanced course is designed to boost the student's competence when it comes to creating visualizations and creating dashboards. The course goes into considerable detail on these two subjects and explores, among other areas, how to create a range of different charts, maps, user-defined fields, as well as a host of advanced features and abilities. We'll start by connecting to a variety of data sources. This will leave you with some great workbooks to practice on and develop on your own after this course. We'll switch focus to calculating user-defined fields and use predefined Tableau functions along the way. We'll move on to customizing visualizations and utilizing some cool features to distribute your work and export data. We'll also explore advanced features that will make your visualizations more user-friendly. Module six is all about calculating user-defined fields, and we have nine lessons in this module. We're gonna start by using predefined functions We've already used two when we created a calculated fields in here. We use count D, which is distinct count, and we also use date diff, but you're gonna use more in this module. Then we're gonna move on to calculating percentages and showing totals. We'll use more predefined functions when we apply the if then logic and apply logical functions. You're gonna learn how to show the percentage of totals, discretizing data, manipulating text, and then aggregating data. So you've already seen this in action, and that's when you created a calculated field using a predefined function, the editor window will let you know if the syntax is incorrect for the function you're using, which is extremely helpful. I've also included on this slide a link to all of the functions that are available in alphabetical order in Tableau, and then another link for all the logical functions that are available in Tableau. So in Tableau, I'm back on the number of customers by state province map, and we're gonna create another calculated field here using the predefined max function. So we want to see the maximum amount of sales per state province on our map. So we're going to go up to analysis menu and choose create calculated field. And we're going to name this one max sales. Now, if you notice, and it was open on mine when I first came in here, but on the right side, you have a right pointing arrow, and that is an alphabetical listing of all of the predefined functions in Tableau. So as you scroll through that list, you'll notice that that's where we got count D earlier, that we use distinct count, and we also use date diff from that list. This time, we're going to scroll down until we see the max function and double click it. So, and also on the right side, it gives you the syntax for it. So you can give it either one expression or multiple expressions separated by a comma. It tells you what it will return and it always gives you an example. And that example is exactly what we're going to use. 
So in the editor window, it's already flashing inside the parentheses. We're going to start typing sales and we're going to get sales in there. Our calculation is valid. So we're going to go ahead and click OK. In order to see the max sales amount on our map, we're going to go to our field list and under measure names, we're going to click and drag max sales and we're going to drop it on the label in the marks card. So now you have both on the label, you have your count of customers and you have the maximum sales amount for that particular state. So let's take a look. Let's hover over North Dakota. So they had two customers in North Dakota and the maximum sales amount for that state is $705. And let's go ahead and save. And I'm going to go back to the last sheet sales by region and bring up a new sheet. On our new sheet, we're going to create a table and then we'll calculate percentages of total sales in our table. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select order date, the order date field, and I'm going to put that in columns and I'm going to leave it on year. And then I'm going to use state province under location, not the group that we created but I'm going to do state province in rows. Then I'm going to drag the sales measure to the text mark on the marks card. So we have our basic table structure here. Now let's under location, let's drag state province to filters or excuse me. We don't want state province and filters drag country region to the filter shelf and filter it just for the United States. So I put a check mark in front of US and I clicked OK. So we just don't have the Canadian provinces showing in here in this table. Now we're seeing the actual sales total for each year for each state. And we want to see the percentage of the sales total. And we want it by each year. So to do that, we're going to go to the analysis menu. You're going to hover over percentage of, and it gives you all of these choices. So since our years are in columns and we want it by year, we're going to choose column. So what's happening here, let's look at Alabama, for instance, it's saying the Alabama sales total for 2019 is 1.27% of the total sales for 2019. So that means that each column grand total would be 100%. And we can choose to show the grand totals here. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to go back to the analysis menu, hover over totals, and choose show column grand totals. And now if you scroll all the way down at the end of your table, at the bottom of your table, the last row is grand total and all of them equal 100% because we did the percentages by column. Let's go ahead and add another field to this table. Grab the category field and drag it to rows to the right of state province. And since we are still doing the percentage by columns, so it's now showing it's just broken up in categories now, right? So the categories are there, but at the bottom, you still have your 100% for each columns grand total. So you can add more detail unless you change the way the percentage is being calculated like we're not going to change it, it's still going to calculate to 100% by the column. And we'll name this sheet, and I'm using the percent symbol, so percent sales by category and state. And I'm going to save. 
Now we're ready to move into applying the if-then logic. And so we're going to be creating more calculated fields in this section using some predefined functions. And so we're going to bring up a new sheet for this. And on this sheet, let's go ahead and put order date in columns. And we're going to do profit to rows and sales to text or label rather. And using show me, we're going to convert this into a text table. So we get the profit and the sales by the year of order date. And I'm going to go ahead and collapse show me. Now we're ready to create our calculated field. So I'm doing it from analysis. And this one, we're going to name profit status. And so with this one, we're going to just type it in and then I'll explain it to you and we'll use our shortcuts so we aren't making too many typos. So I'm going to actually collapse this list of predefined functions on the right side. And we're going to type the letter I and we're going to get the if function in there. We'll get it all in and then I'll explain it. And then we want the profit field. So I'm going to start typing profit and select that measure off the list. And then I'm going to type the greater than symbol and a zero. Start typing the word then and it is a predefined function. So go ahead and get it in. And now we need to put the next thing in single quotes. It's a text value that doesn't exist in our data set. So we're going to do a single quote and type the word profitable and then close the single quote. Now you're going to start typing the word else and you want to grab else if off the list. And we're going to use the profit field again. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that measure. And as soon as I see it on the list, I stop typing. I've made so many typos. We're going to do an equal sign here and a zero. And we're going to start typing the word then again and grab it from the list. Now at this point, I'm going to press enter. I don't want to scroll across to have to see the rest of the function. So I'm splitting it up. And because I pressed enter, it tells me the calculation contains errors. And that's because it's not complete at this point. So I'm on the next line and in single quotes, I'm going to type break even. And then I'm going to start typing else and I'm going to grab else, not else if this time, just else. And in single quotes, I'm going to type the word loss. And then even though it won't force me to scroll, I'm going to press enter again and then start typing the word end and we're going to grab end. I like my if and my end to be at the same margin level so I can make sure that I have it there, but it's not necessary to do that or even to break it down by you know, using enter at all. I just don't want to have to scroll across to see a full function. So this says, if the profit value is greater than zero, then show the word profitable. Else if, meaning if it's not greater than zero, but it equals zero, then show the word break even. If neither of those is true, so it's not greater than zero, it's not equal to zero, then we want it to show the word loss. Let's go ahead and click OK. And what we're going to do is we're going to drag our profit status field to rows in front of measure names. So now you can see based on the value of the profit, 
It's either break even, loss, or profitable. Based on our if, then, else, if, then, else structure that we used. And we're going to name this sheet profit status by year. and save. Let's make a copy of the profit status sheet. So again, I'm using my control key, clicking and holding and just dragging it slightly to the right. And I'm on my profit status by year two sheet now. So we're going to create another calculated field here. Let's go back up to analysis and grab it. And this one, we're going to name simple profit status. Now, I'm going to show you something. If you expand so you can see the right arrow and you see all of the fields that are available, go ahead and scroll down until you see the if function and select it. And if you look on the right, you can see that that tests a series of expressions returning the then value for the first true expression. So we did if, and then an expression, then do this. If that expression is true, then this. If it's not true, go to the next one, which is else if, evaluate that expression. If that's true, then do what is after that. And you're not limited to how many else ifs I believe. I usually limit myself to some other languages I use seven, but you can have a huge long one if necessary. Now I want you to click on the one that says I, I, if. That stands for immediate if. And this is the one we're going to use for this simple profit status. It checks whether a condition is met and it will return one value if true, another value if false. You can have an optional third value or null if unknown. So it only allows you to have three different things in this one. And so it is limited. And so I'm going to go ahead and double click immediate if. We'll build it and then I'll explain it. I think this one is a lot simpler than the one we did previously. So we're going to use the profit field here. And then we're going to do a greater than symbol and we're going to do zero comma. And now we're going to do in single quotes, oops, the word profit, close the quotes, another comma, and in single quotes, the word loss. So we're telling it if the profit is greater than zero, display the word profit. If it's not, display the word loss. And we're going to go ahead and click OK. And now what we want to do is we want to swap out our profit status calculated field for the simple profit status one. So I'm going to go ahead and delete the profit status pill that's in the rows. And I'm going to drag simple profit status up to rows before measure names. So now we're either getting profit or loss. No break even for this one. And we're going to rename this sheet to just profit or loss. And as usual, save. We're going to use another logical function here. We're going to use the logical function of and, and we're going to nest it within the if then construct. So let's bring up a new sheet for this. And on this sheet, let's drag sales to columns 
and quantity to columns. And the first thing we're going to do is we want to make both of these dimensions. So right click on sum of sales in columns. And instead of making it a measure, we want it to be a dimension and do the same thing with your sum of quantity. And so now what we want to do is grab our market segment field and drag it to rows. So we're seeing sales and quantity for market segments. Now we want to make this a dual axis. So we're going to move quantity from columns. I'm going to just click and drag it onto the sales portion of the graph. And when I see the dashed line, I'm going to drop it. So now I have a dual axis chart. And what we don't need is the measure names card over on the right. So I'm going to do its drop down and hide that card. All right. So now we're ready to create our calculated field and it's based on the market segment field. So just another way so far, we've been using the analysis menu for this. But what we're going to do this time in our fields list, right click on market segment and choose create and then calculate it field. So when you do it that way, it includes the field already in the editor. We're going to name it consumer segment. And we're going to click before the market segment in its open bracket in the editor window. And we're going to start typing if and grab it from the list. So you're going to press your end key to get to the outside of the outer bracket on market segment. And we're going to type an equal sign and in single quotes, we're going to type consumer because it's a member of the market segment. So we need to put it in single quotes. And now we're going to use the logical function and. So I'm going to start typing the word and get it in there. And then we're going to go for the sales field. We want greater than equal 1000. And I'm going to use the logical function and again, and, and now this time I'm going to press enter so I don't have to scroll across. We're going to grab the quantity field and we're going to choose greater than equal five. Then we're going to use the then function. In single quotes, type the word true. And then we're going to use the else function. And in single quotes, type the word false. And so I'm getting a my calculation contains errors. Let's see. And that's because I need that end function. So I'm going to do enter and then start typing it, grab it. And now our calculation is valid. So we gave it multiple things to test, right? The market segment has to equal consumer and the sales has to be greater than or equal to a thousand. And the quantity has to be greater than or equal to five. If all of those things are correct, it will give us the word true or else it will give us the word false. So let's go ahead and click OK. So now we're going to drag our consumer segment to rows in front of market segment. And so notice, first of all, since we said that it had to be consumer, right? The only true is showing consumer and it's only showing those things that meet the criteria. 
that the sales are greater than or equal to a thousand and the quantity is greater than or equal to five. Let's grab quantity in our field list and drag it to tooltip on the marks card. So now in the true section, if you hover over any of the marks, you'll see that the sales are greater than a thousand and the quantity is greater than or equal to five. And so the other thing we can do is let's right click on market segment and show filter. So that's a way of getting a field in the filters shelf as well as showing the filter on the right at the same time. In the filter shelf, we're going to do the drop down arrow and edit filter. And let's just get rid of corporate and home office on this one and apply. And click OK. So we're just seeing the true and false is for consumer. If we hover over any of those marks on false, like the first one, the sales are not high enough and nor is the quantity, right? So they're still in the right segment, but they don't meet all of the criteria. And over on your filter card on the right, we can go ahead and click all again if you want to see all. And we decide that we're going to hide the field label for rows. So I'm going to right click on either consumer segment or market segment and just hide field labels for rows. And this sheet we're going to name consumer sales We'll put greater than equal 1000 oops and quantity. I'm using QTI greater than and equal to five. And so the other thing I decided is let's go ahead and filter it by consumer again. So I'm going to go ahead and use the card on the right to just filter by consumer. And then I'm going to right click on the filters in the filter shelf and uncheck show filter. So we leave it like that. So let's go ahead and save. And our next lesson here is discretizing data, which just basically means changing a field from continuous to discrete. And so we're going to go to an existing sheet for this one. We want the days to ship by subcategory and category sheet. So I'll point out that we have the week of the order date showing on the X axis at the bottom, and it's a continuous unbroken line. We're going to change that. And then we're going to do that is we're going to right click on week of order date in the column shelf. And down toward the bottom, we're going to select discrete instead of continuous. So the whole thing flips. Now you don't have an X axis and each week is acting as a label at the top of the visualization. Now, to me, this makes the visualization a lot more complicated to read. So we're going to right click on the week of order date in the column shelf again and change it back to continuous. Now let's go to the previous sheet, the sales and quantity by quarter sheet. And we'll do a similar thing with this one. And we have a dual axis here. So let's see what happens if we change quantity to discrete. So I'm going to go up to the columns shelf and right click on sum of quantity and change that to discrete. And now 
you're seeing the quantities kind of like all grouped together. And we're going to change that back to continuous as well. And then we have to make it a dual axis again. So I'm going to grab the sum of quantity off of the column shelf, drag it over the sales portion of the visualization. And when I see the dashed line, drop it. Or we could have done control Z to switch it back as well. Go ahead and save your file. And so let's go back to our very last sheet in this workbook. And that would be our consumer sales greater than or equal to a thousand sheet and then create a new sheet. And on this sheet, we're going to use a string function to manipulate text. So let's go ahead and grab product name and put that in rows. And we'll put the sales field in the text box on the marks card. So we have a list of all the product names and their sales values in a table format. So now we're going to right click on the product name field in the field list. We're going to hover over create and we're going to create a calculated field again. And we're going to name this one starts with 3M. So product name is already there because of the way we came in here. And we're going to click in front of it, making sure you're outside of the opening bracket. And we're going to start typing the word start. So you'll notice the function starts with. That is a string function or a text function. Now the thing is, when I selected it, right, it didn't include product name in the parentheses. So I'm going to grab product name and do control and including its brackets and do control X, click inside the parentheses and control V. So now it's in the right place. After product name still inside the parentheses, but after it's closing bracket, we're going to do a comma. And then in a single quote, we're going to type 3M. So we want this one to show product names that begin with 3M. We want to focus on 3M. And we're going to choose Apply and click OK. So let's drag our Starts with 3M to the Rows shelf in front of product name. And so you'll see it gives us either a true or a false. If I go ahead and sort the starts with, it brings the true up top and you'll see all of the product names that begin with 3M. And then we have all of the product names that do not begin with 3M listed next to false. So starts with is a string function in Tableau. And what we're going to just do is we're going to name this sheet 3M sales versus non 3M sales. The starts with string function that we used in the previous exercise didn't actually manipulate the text. It really served more as a filter. So now we're going to use one that actually manipulates the text. And we're going to do it on the percent of sales by category and state table. And so we want our states in this table to show up in all capital letters. So we're going to create a calculated field using a predefined string function to make that happen. Let's go up to analysis and we're going to choose create calculated field and we're going to call it upper state. 
And in the editor, we're going to start typing upper and grab the upper function. And we're going to use our state province field, not the group, for this. And go ahead and click OK. So now we're going to go up to the rows shelf and delete our state province pill. And we're going to drag upper state to the rows shelf before category. So now all of our states are appearing in uppercase in this table. So that one actually does manipulate the text. And you can go ahead and save. Our last lesson in this module is aggregating data. Now you've seen that Tableau automatically aggregates measures when you use them in a view. I'm on the last sheet in this workbook and you can see that we use sales, the sales measure as text here and it automatically aggregated it to sum. And we could change that if we wanted to. Um, when I do the drop down on it, I could change it to a dimension, but I want to leave it as a measure so it does the aggregate. Let's go ahead and create a new sheet. And on this sheet, we're going to put market segment, the market segment field in rows. And we're going to drag product name to columns. So when we do this, because there's lots of product names, right? It gives you information. It may contain up to 1849 members and the recommended maximum is a thousand. We're going to choose to add all members. And what we want to do is we want to do an aggregate. So on product name, which is a dimension, we're going to do the drop down in the column shelf. We're going to hover over measure and we're going to choose count. So now we're seeing the number of products per each market is what we're looking at there. So we were able to take a dimension and change it into a measure and notice that the limited list, it was count. Let me go back here and look. Yeah. So it's not going to let you try to do a sum of product names or anything like that. You just have min, max, count and count distinct. So we're getting a count of product names. So that's how you can aggregate a dimension is by changing it and using one of the measure aggregates. And we're going to go ahead and name this sheet count of products by market segment and save your file. So in module six, you were able to add to your repertoire of predefined functions. And we started doing that in lesson one. We used another predefined function and we had already used two before we got to this module. Then we moved on to calculating percentages and then showing totals. And we did calculating percentages by column. So we had them by year. And then we moved into applying if then logic and we added on to it by applying other logical functions like using the and function to give more conditions. Lesson six is an error on this slide. Um, that was already covered in lessons two and three. So that should not be on the slide and my apologies for that. We moved into discretizing data, which you can change a measure into a discrete field versus a continuous field. And you saw the effect of that and we changed it back. The next lesson was manipulating text. We did two different functions for this, one of which didn't actually manipulate the text. It kind of served as a filter. And the second one did manipulate the text by making it uppercase. And then you learned how to turn a dimension into a measure for the purpose of, of aggregating data. Now we're going to get into module seven, 
which is customizing and saving. And I'll mention now before I go over the lessons with you that we've been doing some of this stuff along the way during this course. So lesson one, you'll learn how to add a title and a caption. In lesson two, you'll learn how to modify font sizes and colors. We already did a modification of a font size, but we'll review again. In lesson three, we've been applying various marks to our visualizations, but you'll get some more hands-on practice with doing it. And I'll probably have you do that once by example from me and then the rest on your own. We've been adding colors and labels for our marks on our maps, but we'll do more of that. And not only on our maps, but other visualizations. We used a reference line to create a box plot earlier, but we'll add a different reference line to a visualization in this module. And then you'll learn how to print to PDF, how to save a packaged workbook, and how to create a workbook data extract in this module. So we used a box plot reference line earlier and we accessed it by right clicking on the Y axis. But these are the three other types of reference lines that you can add to a Tableau visualization. So the lines themselves are used to identify a specific value region or range on a continuous axis. You can add a reference line at a constant or computed value on the axis. And then you have bands which shade the area behind the marks in the view between two constant or computed values on the axis. And then the distributions add a gradient of shading to indicate the distribution of values along the axis. And the distribution can be defined by percentages, percentiles, quantiles, or standard deviation. So the first thing we're gonna do is add title and caption. So, so far, whenever we name the sheet, it also gives us the title. And I mentioned that we can separate that, right? So for the sheet tab, what we're gonna do is rename it and we're just gonna call it pie chart. And it updated the title. Well, this time we're gonna go up to the title and we're gonna right click and we're gonna choose edit title. And this way you'll notice it defaults to the sheet name. We're gonna select that placeholder. And this is where we're gonna name it sales by market segment. And click okay. So now our sheet name differs from our title. If you want, the process would be, if you're gonna do that often, is go ahead and name your sheet and then edit the title. The other thing we wanna add to this visualization is a caption. So we're gonna go to the worksheet menu for that and we're gonna click on show caption. So notice the caption is showing at the bottom and we can, right click on it down there and choose edit caption. And we're gonna change the whole thing. Let me move this box over so I can see what I'm gonna talk about here. In the caption, we're gonna say, would really like to increase home office sales, any ideas, question mark, and click OK. And then we decide that we want the title of our visualization to be in a larger font, to be bold, and to have a font color. So I'll start by showing you the way you're not going to do it. And the way you're not gonna do it is by right clicking on the title and choosing format title. Notice that title pane 
that opens the format pane that opens on the left only allows you to address the title and captions shading and border. So that's not the way that we're going to do this. We're going to do the X to close that format pane. The way we are going to do it is by right clicking in a blank area of your visualization and going to format from there. So you, here you can see under default that you have the ability to format the title here under default. So we're going to click on the drop down arrow to the right of title. Let's make it 18 points. We'll make it bold and I'm going to go ahead and give mine an orange color. And then I'll click away from that. So I'm back on the count of products by market segment sheet. And for this one, we're going to apply another mark to this visualization. And so we can do that a couple of different ways. Let's grab our sales field from the field list, drag it onto the graphic. And when you see the dash line, let it go. So we get a dual axis thing. Now notice it obviously, because we did that, I'm going to go to show me it changed the chart type for us when we did that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it back to a table here. And actually, no, I'm going to change it to a horizontal bar and we'll leave it on separate axes for right now. So you can apply more marks as necessary, as you see here. And the other thing we can do is add colors and labels, which you've seen already. So we decide. We don't want to see the market segment label. So I'm going to right click on that and I'm going to choose hide field labels for rows. And then I want to change this count of product name down here. So I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to choose edit axis. And when the edit access box pops up, I'm going to go down to the bottom where it says title and I'm going to change it to using the pound sign to represent number of products. And then I'm going to close that edit access box. And now we're going to do something that we've done previously as well. We're going to go to the label box on the marks card and check show mark labels. And so we're getting that showing for the products. Now, if we want to show the labels for sales, on your marks card at the bottom, click on some sales. Now click on label, show mark labels. So whatever you have selected over here is what it's going to perform that action on. To add some color to the chart, it's going to work pretty much the same way, except we're going to use the color mark for products. I have the count of products selected here in the marks card. I'm going to click on color and for my products, I'm going to do an orange color. And then I'm going to select sales and assign a color to your sales bars that you wish to have. And lastly, we're going to edit the title. So I'm going to get rid of sheet name placeholder here. And I'm going to use the pound sign for number of products and sales by market segment and click OK. So now I'm back on the sales by state map 
and to show you how you can change your mark sizes. So notice we have on this map, if we look at our marks card, we have the sum of sales is the sizing that's being used and it's based on the circle. So we're going to click on the size panel on the marks card and we're going to increase the size of our marks just a little bit and you can see how it translates to your map. Now we'll go back to our count of products by market segment sheet and we're going to add a reference line to the products portion of the visualization. So I'm going to right click on the axis there where it says number of products and add reference line. And so we've used the box plot and I showed you the slide that showed you the difference between a line, a band and a distribution. For the first one, we're going to leave it on line. We're going to do the scope of the entire table. So that entire visualization and notice it's doing an average count by default of product name. So it's going to show the average on the reference line and we're going to leave it on line only and we're going to click OK. So you'll see in your number of products bar graph that we have that average reference line and when we hover over it, it's giving us the average number of products. So you can clearly see which segments are at close to average, way below average or above average. Now let's right click on that same number of products axis again, and we're going to remove the reference line, right click again, add reference line. This time we'll do a band. We'll do it for the entire table. And we're and this time the band is doing the maximum count of product names or the maximum count of products, right? We're going to change that to average as well, just for consistency. And without even clicking OK, you can see that it shades the area. It's saying here, I think that says minimum, it's overlaying a label and then the average where the average would be. And if we hover over that band, I have to do okay for that. If we hover over the band, it doesn't show a tooltip, but if you hover over minimum or average, it will give you those values. We're going to do this a third time. So we're going to right click on the axis, remove the reference line. This time I'm going to have you add the distribution one. using the same scope. And so with this one, it's going to show 60% or 80% of average. And we could change that if we want it to. So this is where you can use percentages, percentiles, quantiles, or standard deviation. So what we're going to change it to, we're going to leave it on percentages, but we're going to change it to 50 and 80. And leave it on average and then we'll collapse that and you'll see it uh, update and we're going to go ahead and you can actually see without clicking OK where 50% of average is and where 80% of average is. Now just to leave one on here let's go back and change it to line for the entire table and then click OK. And you want to go ahead and save at this point. So in Tableau, you can print an entire workbook or an individual sheet to a PDF. And so we're going to do that on this same count of products by market segment sheet. And we're going to do that by using the file menu. And if you look down, 
you'll see print and print to PDF. We're going to use print to PDF. And this is where it gives you the choice to select the entire workbook, the active sheet, or if you had multiple sheets selected, it would print those. So let me show you how to select multiple sheets. We're going to cancel that and we'll click on profit status by year and then hold down control and click on count of products by market segment. So just like selecting non-contiguous sheets in Microsoft Excel is how that works. Now we're going to go back to file, print to PDF, and this time selected sheets is going to be available for us. And you have your paper size and your orientation on the right. And then I'm going to leave both of the options selected and I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So it wants to know where I want to save the PDF and I'm just going to put it on my desktop. So I'm going to navigate there and it wants to give it the name of the entire workbook and I'm going to change the name there and I'm going to say annual profit status and count of products and sales values by market segment. And I'm going to go ahead and save it. I had the setting for portrait and I probably should have done landscape here. I also had it set to open the PDF. So I'm looking at three pages here. I have my profit status by year. It had to split the number of products and the sales onto two separate pages. So if I had done landscape, it would have done a better job of that. But then you can send that PDF. You can distribute it to other people. The next thing we're going to do is save a packaged workbook. A packaged workbook, when you save a packaged workbook, you can distribute it to other users who have the ability to open it if they have Tableau desktop or Tableau reader. And so what it does is it will save the workbook and a copy of any local file data sources and any locally saved background images that are used in the workbook file. Once it's packaged, the packaged workbook is no longer linked to the original data sources and images. So it creates a package for the users that you're sending it to that includes a copy of the workbook and it's packaged with your locally saved files and images. So they'll be able to use it just like you're able to use the workbook. So in order to do this, we're not going to use Sample Superstore Live because this is a built-in Tableau workbook and we don't actually have the locally saved files that are producing the data. So we're going to start by closing Sample Superstore Live. So I'm just going to the file menu and I'm choosing close. And then we're going to reopen a workbook that we created earlier in the course. So I'm going to go to the open a workbook link on the right side of the start page. And we're going to open vehicles and pricing because we have both of those Excel files stored locally. And we didn't create any visualizations in here. If you go to the data source tab, this is the file where we created a join between the two tables so that we can merge the data. So we have information coming in here from the vehicles file, which has that inventory tab in it, and from the pricing file. 
So we're going to package this because those two files are stored locally for us. And the way we do that is we're going to go to File, Save As. Now it's going to take you automatically to your My Tableau repository. And we're going to just name it. We don't really have to change the name, but I'm going to change the name by appending the word packaged at the end. And notice the default save as type is a .twb, which is a Tableau workbook. We're going to click on Tableau workbook and choose Tableau packaged workbook, which has the .twbx extension. And we're going to go ahead and choose save. So now I'm going to go ahead and go to file and close. And I want to show you something. I'm going to just bring up my file explorer window. And this is my workbooks folder in my Tableau repository. And I just want you to see that it has a different icon. So it has like a goldish colored column on the left side of the packaged workbook icon. And it, the type will definitely say Tableau packaged workbook. Now you can actually take this and attach it to an email or otherwise distribute it to users that have Tableau desktop or Tableau reader, and they would be able to open it. So if somebody sends you a packaged workbook, you want to make sure it ends up in your My Tableau repository workbooks folder. So once it's in your Tableau repository, so we're seeing the tile here because we packaged it. So I'm going to get rid of that tile and the vehicles and pricing tile. If you've moved it to your correct location in your repository, you can use open a workbook and then you would want to open the packaged workbook and you would have access to what you need to have access to in order to create visualizations. And we can go ahead and use file close to close this one again. We can get rid of the tile and we're going to reopen sample superstore live. So far we've been working in Tableau using live connections, meaning if we go back to our data sources, like especially the ones we used earlier where we used Excel files and access files, if we were to go and open those files and make any changes, the changes would come into Tableau automatically and impact your data source and your visualizations. With an extract, it's a little bit different. An extract functions as a batch file of sorts. Let's go ahead and go to our data source view. And we're going to focus on the upper right hand corner where you see that our connection is live and we're going to do the option button in front of extract. So initially it says extract will include all data. We're going to click the edit button next to it and we want it to just include a particular year. So in the filter section underneath the filters box, we're going to click add. And we're going to filter by the order date field and click OK. And we'll filter by a year. So I'm going to select years and go next. And I'm going to check the box in front of 2021. And at the bottom, I'm going to click OK. And now it lets me know that we have a filter on the year of order date and it's keeping 2021 and we're going to click OK at the bottom. So now the screen refreshes and it's telling you the extract includes a subset of data and it gives you the date and time where you created the extract. And now when you switch back to sheet view, it will force you to save your extract file. So notice 
It's in your My Tableau repository, and it's in the Data Sources folder. And there's the extract from when we connect it to SharePoint. And this one, I'll just leave it named Sample Superstore. It gives the extracts a dot hyper extension. And go ahead and save. So since we switched from live to extract, all of our visualizations and everything that we're doing, we're doing on the extract. And we would have to refresh to get any updated data. So you'll notice I went to the profit status by year sheet and it's only showing 2021, right? Everything in here is now adjusted for the extract filter that we used. So all of your visualizations would have updated with the extracted information. That's kind of how that works. Now we can go back to the data source tab or data source view, I should say, that you access it from a tab. And so we're using sample superstore. We don't have the original files. We can't go and manipulate them and add or extract or delete data or change data in them. But if we were able to do that, that's when you would use the refresh button to refresh your extract. We're going to go ahead and we're going to do a file save as on this one. And we're going to name it instead of sample superstore live, just change live to extract. And then we're going to go ahead and do file close. If it prompts you to save the changes, say yes. And we're going to go back to our start screen. We're going to get rid of the tile for sample superstore extract and reopen sample superstore live. In this module, we learned how to separate the title from the sheet tab name by adding a title by editing the title. And then we also added a caption, which shows at the bottom of the visualization screen. And we got into some more of modifying font sizes and colors. And we did that by using the format pane on the left side for the font sizes. And then we also used colors using the color marks on the marks card. We applied more marks to the visualization. We added some colors to those marks and labels. And then we added the three different types of reference lines, which are lines, bands, and distribution to be able to see the difference between them before we settled on a line. You learned how to print to PDF and you also learned that your trainer, that would be me, should have changed it to landscape instead of leaving it on portrait. You learned about saving a package workbook, which you can share with other users of Tableau desktop or Tableau reader and how they can access it and how the icon is different from a regular workbook as well as the extension. And we did that by using file save as. And then instead of working with a live connection, we ended by creating a workbook data extract, which saved a dot hyper file for us in our data sources folder. And if you're working with an extract and you want to get refreshed data, you have to use the refresh link on the data source view. In module eight, we're going to focus on exporting and saving. So you'll learn how to save to Tableau server as well as to Tableau cloud, formerly known as Tableau online. And you'll learn how to export both images and data. If you want to save your workbook on Tableau server or Tableau cloud, 
you're going to use the server menu to do so. So when you go up to server, the first thing it has is sign in and you can sign in to either Tableau server or Tableau cloud there. You can run an optimizer, open a workbook that is from either the server or the cloud. And you can publish a workbook. You can also just publish the data source for it, right? And you also have access to Tableau public from there. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose publish workbook and notice mine is defaulting to Tableau cloud. If you have a Tableau server account, you could just type in the server address and then connect and it will have you sign in. Now, for some reason I was able to retrieve from Tableau server, but I cannot connect to it at this point. But once you connect, you'll get a secondary screen similar to what you're going to see in a moment for when you connect to Tableau cloud. So if you put in your server address and you select connect, it will prompt you to log in and then you'll have screens leading you along the way. The only way I can show you the process is via Tableau Cloud. So I'm going to be able to sign in. I've been able to retrieve from my server, but when I'm trying to publish, it's not letting me in. So I'm going to go ahead and get myself signed in to Tableau Cloud here, which used to be called Tableau Online. They're changing the name of it. So let me go ahead and sign in here. And when I click sign in, And again, the process is very similar for server. So it gives me this published workbook to Tableau Cloud, right? And I have some options. So on Tableau Cloud, I actually have a Tableau training project that I'm going to select. If you don't have projects set up, you can just do the default folder. And I'm going to leave it the same name as this file. I'm not going to put in a description or add any tags. It's going to send all sheets from the workbook, or I could edit to choose the sheets that I want to publish. My permissions are the same as that folder I have there. And then it says data sources. Now this is sample superstore. This is one of the built in Tableau data sources. So the actual data source is embedded in the workbook. And we're going to click edit next to that. And I can change it from embedded in workbook to publish the data source separately if I want to. And now it says one publish separately. And when I do that, this green button changes. So let me go back and change it back to embedded in workbook. And notice the green button just says publish at that point. If I say publish it separately, then it says publish workbook and one data source on that green button. I'm going to show the sheets as tabs. I don't have any external files here, but I would include any external files. If it was one of those that we had the files like from the video description, then I would check that box. And now I'm going to click the green button to publish the workbook and the one data source. And it's still in the process of publishing. When it's done, it will give me the publishing complete dialog and I can share from that dialog if I wanted to share the workbook at this point. I'm going to go ahead and close that dialog. And I can see all of my sheets. There's a data source tab here, and here's the live connection data source for Sample Superstore. Um, when I go back to views, that's where I see all of the sheets. And so it's in the cloud now. It's in Tableau Online, and I can share it from here. I can edit the workbook, so on and so forth. 
And it would be similar if we had published to the server. Once it's there, you can allow other users access to it. So whether it's Tableau server, Tableau public or Tableau cloud, you can access all three of those from the server menu. Once you've put your workbook up on Tableau server or Tableau cloud, and you go back to your data source tab, it's going to look a little bit different. So the upper half is showing like the connection information, right? that we just did. So I put it in my project called Tableau training on Tableau cloud. And now in the lower part where your data grid is, I'm going to go ahead and do update now, just so the grid repopulates. So just so you know, after you upload to the server or to the cloud, you're going to want to come back to your data source tab and update now or set it to update automatically. In module seven, we learned how to save as a PDF and we actually saved selected sheets as a PDF. And I said, I should have changed the orientation on it when I did that. Another way to get data out of Tableau is to export images, export as an image or export actual data. And we're going to do that now. So I'm on the sales by state map for this one. And I'm going to go up to the worksheet menu for this, hover over export and choose image. So you have different image options at the bottom. The best way to describe them is to use all of them and see what happens. I'm going to keep it on the first one and I'm going to show everything that's checked here by default. And then I'm going to just click on save. So I'm going to save this image onto my desktop. It's named the same as the sheet tab and it's going to put it in a PNG format. You can also use JPEG, bitmap, scalable vector graphics, SVG, if you want to. I'm going to just leave it on PNG and save. So now I have the sales by state image file on my desktop. I'm going to go ahead and open it. And there you can see the image. Now I can send this to anyone that needs to see this picture of the sales by state map. Just another way of distributing Tableau information. In addition to exporting an image of the sales by state map, we can also export the data. So let's go back to the worksheet menu for this. We're going to hover over export again. And when we select data here, it's going to export it in the form of a Microsoft access database. We can also do a cross tab to Excel. Let's start with the database. So we're going to select data there. And I'm going to put this on my desktop. Notice it's going to save it as an access database. And I'm going to call it sales by state data. And I'm going to go ahead and save. So export data to access dialog comes up. It has my file name. It's going to put it in a table called data. And I'm exporting from this entire view, the entire map. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So now I'm on my desktop where I saved it to, and I'm going to open this access database. And I'm going to go ahead and enable the content. And I have one table in here and it's called data. And so for every state, it's showing the generated latitude and longitude 
as well as the sum of sales. And I'm going to go ahead and close access and bring up my Tableau again. So the other way to export the data, let's go back to worksheet, export, and we can do it as a cross tab to Excel. So I'm going to select that option. And when it's done, you'll see that it puts the information in an Excel workbook, just the state and the sum of the sales for each state. So different ways of getting information out of Tableau that you can share with other people that perhaps don't have Tableau so they can further manipulate data. So in module eight, you learned ways of getting data out of Tableau. We started by saving a workbook, well, attempting to save a workbook on a Tableau server. I wasn't able to make the server connection. However, I showed you the similar process for saving a workbook on the web, specifically in Tableau Cloud, formerly known as Tableau Online. And you can use the server menu to export information to Tableau Server, Tableau Cloud, and Tableau Public. So we were successful in saving it to Tableau Cloud, and you saw that when you save it that way, and it's similar to the way Server acts, that it will actually open it up for you once it's saved. Then we moved on to exporting an image of a map and we saved it onto our desktop and that image can be shared with anyone that needs to have access to it. We then exported data two ways. We exported it into the form of a Microsoft Access database and also to Excel as a cross tab. In module nine, we're gonna explore some advanced features multiple lessons in this module. So we're going to start by learning how to view data in Tableau. We've already worked on changing the mark size, but we'll do it again. You're going to learn how to use presentation mode, how to add annotations and how to exclude data on the fly. In lesson six, we'll customize mark shapes. And in lesson seven, we're going to learn how to add drop down selectors. You'll also learn how to add search box selectors and slider selectors. Lesson 10, we're going to start creating animated visualization using what's called page trails. And in lesson 11, we will be creating parameters. So a couple of terms here. Page trails are a way of animating a viz by using the pages shelf in Tableau. A parameter is a workbook variable such as a number, date, or string that can replace a constant value in a calculation, filter, or reference line. So we're going to switch over to Tableau and get started with this module. When you right click on a blank area of a visualization, you'll get the pop-up menu and one of the choices is view data. Let's go ahead and click that. And it opens up a dialog where it's showing the data that's used on this particular sheet. So if you look at the top, it gives you a summary, 45 rows and four fields and you can click on the show fields button and it defaults to showing all of the fields. And that's what you're seeing here, the latitude and longitude that have been generated, the sales and the state or province. You can also download this data so that you can keep it if you want. It downloads as a comma separated values file, which you can open in Excel. I'm not going to actually save it. 
And so it's showing you the summary here and you can look through the data. Kind of cool. Just pulling it all together. So I go to summary and then there's like an orders table there that's showing some information. Down at the bottom, it tells how you can tell it how many rows to show depending on, you know, the size of the data set. And you have a settings button that only allows you to show aliases. So an alias would be in the state and province field, all of the states are known as aliases. And we are going to go ahead and close that dialog. Now, this is not on the agenda for this module, but I want to show you another feature that can be helpful for you. Let's go to the worksheet menu and choose describe sheet. So it gives you a full description of the sheet. So the map is based on longitude and latitude generated. The color shows the sum of sales. The size shows the sum of sales. Details are shown for state province. So it's listing everything from the marks card. Map coloring shows 2018 population by state. That's the data layer that we added. And the view is filtered on state province which excludes 10 members. So we got rid of the provinces in Canada. About the mark, the mark type is circle and it's not stacked. For your shells, it has what's on your rows, columns, filter, right? Detail, color, and size. Your dimensions, state province has 45 members on this sheet. And it gives you a partial list of all the members. Then it goes to measures and it gives you the range for the latitude and the longitude and the sum of sales range from 64 to 131.552 on the sheet. And then you have data source details. Now, the other thing you can do is you can copy this information, paste it somewhere if you need to share it with someone. We're going to go ahead and close that. So that was from the worksheet menu and it's called describe sheet or control E to bring up that panel. So we've done this already, but let's go ahead and increase the size of our circles on this map, right? And so we do that from the marks card. If you go to size and you can increase the size and we had already done this in the previous module. You can increase or decrease the size. Why don't you take a moment and find another sheet and see where you want to increase the size of the marks. And I went to our heat map and increased the size of the marks. Go ahead and save your file. Now Tableau has a presentation mode that you can use if you're connected to a flat screen or a projector and you want to show everyone your visualizations. So I went to our first sheet, the West and Southwest order count by customer sheet, and I switched it on this toolbar from standard view to entire view. Now also on the toolbar, you can get into presentation mode. And that is the icon that I'm pointing to on the screen to launch presentation mode. So go ahead and click that icon. And what it does is it gives you the full screen effect. So you're not seeing your menu bar, your toolbars, title bar, any of that. You're just seeing the visualization. And so if you notice at the bottom, you still have your sheet tabs available to you. So while you're in presentation mode, you can just go from sheet to sheet and have it display in that mode. Similar to like a slideshow, but not really. So that is how presentation mode works. And to get out of it, you can just press the escape key on your keyboard and it will bring you out to whatever 
sheet you were on when you're exiting it. So a really good feature. So let's start this. We're going to add a couple of annotations to our sales by state map. But first, I want you to hover over the New Jersey mark. So it just says state, province, New Jersey, and the sales values, right? If we look at, because it's sized by the sum of sales, it looks like California, Texas, and maybe Pennsylvania have the highest sales. So let's start with Pennsylvania. What you're going to do is you're going to hover your mouse over the Pennsylvania mark and right click. And you're going to choose annotate and we're going to choose, we want to annotate the mark. So right where your insertion point is flashing, and this is like the same stuff that you're seeing in the legend, but we want it to pop out as an annotation. And before it, we're going to add high value. So high value state province, and we're going to click OK. So you see that it has the annotation showing high value state province for Pennsylvania and the amount of sales. And I can click away from that and that stays visible on the map. And so I'm going to have you do the same for California and Texas. Add the words high value, make annotations for California and Texas on your own. And when you're done, your map should look like mine with the three annotations on it. Now, if you want to get rid of an annotation, you would actually click on it and it puts a red border around it. And you could just press delete to get it off of there if you wanted to. I'm going to keep all three of these on this map. Go ahead and save your file. Now we're going to move on to excluding data on the fly. We're going to do two separate exercises for this, but there are two different ways that you can do this. And then I'll show you how to get the data included. Now on the sales by state map, we already created a filter for state province where we excluded all of the Canadian provinces. So let's just click on the Washington state mark. If you just select it, you get this pop-up that says keep only or exclude. Now, another way of doing that is by right clicking on the Washington state mark and you get that keep only and exclude on the pop-up menu. So I usually just click on the mark and we're going to select exclude. So our mark disappears from Washington state. Now, since we already had a filter here to get it back, we're going to go to our filter shelf and we're going to right click on state province and edit filter. And you're going to scroll down and you see that Washington state is now filtered out. We're going to uncheck Washington and click OK. So now our mark is back for Washington state. Now, if you exclude data on a sheet that doesn't have a filter, it will automatically create a filter and you're going to see that now. So we're going to do this on our count of products by market segment sheet. And let's right click on the home office mark on the number of products part of the visualization. Well, actually, I'm going to just click on the home office mark and I'm going to exclude it. Now, notice we don't have a filter here. So when I do that, it creates the filter for me, excluding home office. So if I want to get it back, I'm going to right click on that market segment filter and I'm going to edit the filter and I'm going to uncheck home office 
rid of exclude as well. So I'll do all and then okay. So now I got my home office back. And if I don't need that filter, if I'm not gonna be excluding on the fly, I can just click on the filter pill in the filter shelf and delete it. You've already seen how to customize mark shapes, but we'll do it again. And I'm back on sales by state map. And so our marks are showing as circles. And if we go to our marks card and do the drop down next to circle, we might want them to show as squares, something like that. I actually prefer the circles on the map. I find them less distracting, if that's the right word for it. I'm gonna go back to the now square drop down, and I'm gonna choose shape. And so now we get these open non-filled circles on there. And I'm gonna go back to the drop down again and put it back on circle. We're gonna start on sales by state sheet by adding a drop down selector. And we want it to be for the states. Well, we already have state province in the filter shelf. So in the filter shelf, you're going to right click on state province and you're gonna choose show filter. So it gives us this multiple values list which takes up a lot of space on the right side. Before we change the type of selector, I wanna point out a few things. So at the very top in the selector's title bar, it says state province. And then to the right of that, you have a funnel with an X. If you hover over it, it says click to show all values. Well, this is the filter that we excluded the Canadian provinces. So we don't wanna click the funnel to show all values or else it would include them again. To the right of the funnel, you have a find values icon of the magnifying glass. If I click on that, it gives me a search box and I am going to type Vermont and it just brings up that particular state. Now I wanna clear that search, so I'm gonna do the X to the right of the search box and it clears the search and then I'm gonna do the X again to close the search box. To the right of your magnifying glass, there is a drop down arrow. So if you look in the middle of this list, it lets you know that it's a multiple values list. That's the type of selector that we have currently. Before we change it, hover over customize. So the list is showing that all value, right? It has the search button, include, exclude, control types, and all values button. Depending on the type of selector, your customization options will change. So you'll see this in a moment. Let's go down and make this a multiple values drop down selector. So it doesn't take up much space. Now go back to the drop down arrow to the right of the funnel and hover over customize. And you see that it has, it doesn't have a search option there. And that's why you don't have the magnifying glass. The drop down selector does not have a search option. So again, depending on the type of selector, your customization options will vary. And we're going to click away from it. So this way, if I do the drop down here next to multiple values, it allows me their, their square boxes, right? Their check boxes. So I can select multiple values if I want it to from this list. I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna check Wyoming and it's going to exclude it. So I no longer, and if I uncheck it, it will include it again, right? So we'll do another state. Let's check California and you'll notice that it's marked disappeared because it's excluded and now I'll check it again and it's included again. 
Go ahead and save your file. Let's go to our days to ship by subcategory and ship mode sheet. And this sheet already has a slider selector for order date, but we're going to add another one. So days to ship is the calculated field we created. And in the field list, I'm going to right click on it and choose show filter. So it adds it to the filter shelf and it displays a slider because it's numeric data. So whenever you have numeric data, it will automatically give you a slider. Now, if you look at the top of that slider, it doesn't have the search function. It doesn't have your magnifying glass there, but it does have the click to show all values. And I don't believe anything is excluded. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. And then I'm going to do the drop down arrow next to it. And the first thing we're going to do is look at the customize options for a slider. The readouts are the numbers at either end of the slider. So it's showing those, it's showing the slider. And because it's a slider, it's a different customization menu. For a slider, let me go back to the drop down. You can choose to have a range of values, which is what we're going to leave it on or at least a certain amount or at most a certain value, right? So the other thing we're going to do is we're going to edit the title and we're just going to, I'm going to just take everything out and I'm just going to give it a title of days to ship and click okay. So now if I use this slider, I can start sliding it over. So, You'll notice that my visualization will change according to the slider value that I put for days to ship, right? And I can drag either end of the slider to do like a range. And then I can click in the middle of that and drag it backwards and forwards, depending on what it is I want to see. And I went ahead and expanded my slider back to its original position. So the good thing about having these on your visualization sheets is because it gives your end users more flexibility in the data that they're analyzing. Go ahead and save. So we're getting ready to create an animated visualization using page trails. But before we do so, let me show you other ways to navigate your different sheets in a workbook. So by default, it's showing your sheet tabs, which we've been using. But I want to draw your attention, and I'm going to draw some arrows here, all the way at the right-hand side of your status bar, there are three different icons. And these control how you're seeing your sheets. So the last icon, if you hover over it, the last icon will tell you that it's showing the sheet tabs, right? If you can get the pop-up. The first one shows you like a, so here it's the pop-up for the first one, shows sheet sorter. So when I click on that, it brings me to this view where I can see little thumbnails of all of my sheets in the workbook. And then the second view button down there is show film strip. And so it shows the little thumbnails down at the bottom and you can use your navigation arrows to go backwards or forwards from the first sheet to the last sheet or wherever you need to be. So you do have choices there. I'm actually going to leave mine on film strip and I'm going to use the new sheet icon. So now the, the icons for new sheet, new dashboard, and new story are vertical. I'm going to use the new sheet icon to bring up a new sheet. So even though I'm in film strip, showing this film strip for my sheets, I'm going to go ahead and name that sheet the same manner. I'm going to just double click. 
And we're going to name this one sales by month over time. And we're going to grab our order date field and drag it to columns. And we're going to drag sales to rows. Change the order date from year to month. Now, a what, another way you can do this is you can do the plus sign in front of year. It gives you quarter. You can do the plus sign in front of quarter. It gives you month. And then you can delete the year and the quarter pills. Just another way, some variety. So now you're left with the month of the order date. And now we're going to drag the month. We're going to actually control copy it from columns to the pages shelf, which we have not used yet. So we're making a copy of it and dropping it in pages. So a couple of things happened. Your line chart that was on the screen, it now just shows the mark for January sales. The rest of the line chart has disappeared. Also, notice the controls that show up on the right side of the screen. Let's talk about those. So it has the first month, January there. And if you do the drop down next to it, you'll see it goes all the way through December because we chose month of order date. It also has a back arrow and a forward arrow. So if I wanted to go to February, I could just use the right side arrow instead of the drop down, so on and so forth. I'm going to put it back on January. Underneath that, you have a slider of sorts, which also goes through the month. Now, when I use that slider, look at the mark on your visualization. It's moving to catch up to whatever month you're in. We're going to drag it all the way backwards. Underneath that, you have your animation controls. You have rewind, stop, and play. And to the right of that, you have a series of icons with lines on them. You can change the speed of your playback, slow, normal, or fast. And it's defaulting to slow. Then you have a show history area. You're going to check the box in front of show history and do the drop down arrow. So instead of anything that's selected, we want the marks to show history for all. So we're going to select all and we're going to leave the length at all. And the length represents the number of pages in history. So notice here under show, it's on marks. Trails is dimmed out and both is also dimmed out. And underneath marks, we have format none. We're going to leave fade checked and you'll see what happens when we run it. So. Depending on the mark style, so our marks are set to automatic on the marks card, trails won't be available to you. So you'll see in just a few minutes how to use trails and what they do. But right now we're cool with just marks and we have the fade option selected. So how does this work? We're gonna go ahead and press, press the right arrow button so it starts animating the visualization and you see it's automatically going through each month. And when it gets to the next month, the previous mark fades. And if you wanted to speed it up, you could speed it up. And I'm going to reverse it. I'm using reverse to go back. So it's going backwards. Now I'm using the reverse button and I made it as fast as it will go. So now it's back on January. So notice the title. 
Now says sales by month over time dash January. So I ran it backwards and it's on January now. So it's only showing the mark. Now in order for it to show trails, we need to change the type of mark that's being used. So let's go to our automatic drop down on the marks card and change it to circle. And now we're going to go back to the show history drop down on the controls on the right. And you'll notice that trails and both are now available. Let's choose trails for this one. And for trails, let's go to the format drop down underneath. And I'm going to create a dashed line. I think I'm going to use the dash line. And now I'm going to go ahead and play this animation again. So I'm going to use the play button, which is on the right. And you can see the difference between using a mark or using a trail. And now I'm going to reverse it. So it goes back to January. And we're going to go back to show history again. And this time we're going to select both. And we'll go ahead and run it. So we're still getting our previous mark fading, but that way you can have both and reverse it so it goes back to January. So pretty cool, the ability to animate a visualization. And we started by putting the month of order date in the pages shelf after we populated columns and rows. And that's what caused the controls to show up on the right side. Go ahead and save your file. So you do not have to use a numeric field for your page trails animations. So I'm on the average sales and profit by state province heat map that we did earlier. And for this one, I'm going to have you do it on your own. I'm going to have you copy state province from the bottom of the marks card to pages and then play the animation and see what it looks like. And you can see how the mark is just traveling along going state by state. I'm going to go ahead and stop this one. And you can too. Actually, I'm going to reverse it. And once I reverse it and it gets all the way back to the beginning, I'm going to speed that up. We're going to stop it. And I don't know that this would be beneficial at all for any analysis. I mean, if you want to keep it, you can keep it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the pages shelf and click on the state province pill and delete it. And then it's as if we never did that. Save your file again. I've already brought up a new sheet to get ready for our next lesson where we'll be creating parameters. Now, just a reminder, a parameter is a workbook variable that can replace a constant. The beauty of using parameters is that you can show parameter controls on a viz and users can select the measures to be used on the X and Y axes. So for example, um, they might want to see quantity and discount, or they might want to see profit and sales, something like that. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So what we're going to do to start creating a parameter is we're going to use the drop down arrow that's at the top 
of your data pane. I'm pointing to it on the screen. So we can do it this way. So we're going to do that drop down arrow and select create parameter. And we're going to name this parameter choice one selector. So not a name that makes a lot of sense right now, but you'll see as we get into this, how we're going to use these. We want to give this parameter a data type of string. And at the bottom under allowable values, we're going to do the option button for list. And then we're going to type in our values. So you're going to click where it says click to add. And we're going to type discount and press your tab key and it will show you how it displays and take you down to the next click to add. And then you actually have to click to add another one. We're going to type profit and tab click to add. We have two more quantity and lastly sales. So I will say here that all of what we're doing will make more sense when we're a little bit more along in the process. So we created a parameter named choice one selector. It has a string data type and we're using a list that we populated of values. We're going to go ahead and click OK at the bottom. So notice in your data pane. At the bottom, there's a section called parameters. They already had two in here that came with the data set and we just created our own and it's called choice one selector. So in your field list, what we want to do is we're going to right click on choice one selector. We want to actually duplicate it. So let's do that. And then it gives us choice one selector and choice one selector copy. And the only edit we're going to make to the copy is its name. So I'm going to right click on it and choose edit. I'm going to get rid of the word copy at the end of the name. And it immediately starts screaming at me in red that that name already exists. We're going to further modify this so it says choice two selector. And then it stops screaming. So we want it the same thing. We want it the string data type and we want it the list of available values. So we made a duplicate of it and just had to change the name. And then we're going to go ahead and click OK. So we have two parameters at this point, choice one selector and choice two selector. Now we're going to create a calculated field and you'll get introduced to another pre-built function. So this time we're going to do it from the drop down arrow at the top of the data pane. We can create a calculated field from there as well. And this calculation we're going to name placeholder one. And we're going to use the case function. So start typing case. Now case, if you expand on the right, so you can see the list of functions, notice the syntax of case. So case is another way of doing that. If then else, if else end construct, it will give similar results. However, it's a different construct. So after case, we're going to type, start typing choice and we're going to choose choice one selector. I'll explain the rest of it. Once we get it all in, I'm going to press enter and now I'm going to type the win or access the win function. And now we're going to type discount in single quotes. We're going to use the then function on the same line. 
And now type discount and grab the field. So when we set up our parameter, we built a list of four items, discount, profit, quantity, and sales. All right. So this is in the, the first one we created was choice one selector, right? It's saying if they choose discount, then display discount. We're going to do enter. We're not quite done with this case statement yet. The next line is another win and single quote profit. Then, and you want the profit field here. Enter. We have two more when then statements to do. So we're going to do when the next one is going to be quantity. Then the quantity field. And our last when this one is going to be sales, then the sales field. And then we're going to enter one more time and type the end statement. So we named this placeholder one. It has a case statement that's related to the first parameter that we built. And we're going to go ahead and click OK. Just like we did with our parameter, we're going to duplicate our calculated field placeholder one. And we're going to edit its copy. And we're going to get rid of the word copy at the end of the name, and we're going to change it to placeholder two. And in the case statement, we're going to change it to choice two selector. So we don't have to build the whole thing all over again. And we're going to go ahead and click OK. Now we're about halfway through this process, just so you know. And what we're going to do on our new sheet, let's drag placeholder two to columns and placeholder one to rows. We're going to drag the customer last name to the detail card on marks. And we're going to drag the region field under location to color. So right now we're not done. You'll see on your Y axis, you have placeholder one and placeholder two is on your X axis. In your data pane, you're going to right click on choice one selector and choose show parameter and do the same for choice two selector. So they show over on the right. Now we're going to go up to columns and right click on sum of placeholder two. And we don't want this to be aggregated. So we're going to make it a dimension. And do the same with sum of placeholder one. And just so you know, another way we've could have done that instead of doing each one of these placeholders individually, we could have gone to the analysis menu and unchecked aggregate measures. It's unchecked now. If I check it, you notice it puts sum of placeholder one and two back and I could go there and uncheck it and it does what we did manually a minute ago. So I just thought you would want to know that as well. So right now we're in a situation where we can actually test what we've done to this point. We're not quite finished and I'll explain why when we do our test. So over on your right side, Notice that both selectors are on discount. So 
I'm going to leave choice one selector on discount. And for choice two selector, I'm going to select profit. So notice that my visualization updated. I'm going to go to my choice one selector and I'm going to select sales. Again, the visualization updates. What doesn't update are the titles of the axes. So they're still saying placeholder one and placeholder two. Let's put both of these back on discount, both of our selectors back on discount. And we're going to create another calculated field that will address the axes titles. So I'm going to go to my drop down at the top of the data pane, create calculated field. And we're going to name this X axis title. And it's going to be another case statement. So I'm going to go ahead and grab case and I can actually collapse this over on the right. And it's going to be choice to selector, which will show up on your list. And then I'm going to enter and do when single quote discount, then single quote discount. Go down one line and we're going to do another when then when profit then profit. Next line is going to be when quantity then quantity. So these are the list items that we made. And the last one is going to be when sales, then sales. After that line, we're going to use else. And then we're going to start typing null and you can get that in. And then underneath that, we're going to access end. So it's saying to change the title of the axis based on the selector, the selection chosen in the choice two selector. And it's specifically going to change the X axis title. And we're going to go ahead and click OK. So now in your field list, so we don't have to do it from scratch, we're going to right click on X axis title. And we're going to duplicate it and we're going to edit the duplicate. And we're going to name this one. We're going to get rid of copy at the end, but we're going to name this one Y axis title. And in the case statement, we're going to change it to choice one selector. And we're ready to do OK. We have a little bit more to do, and then we'll be able to fully test this out. So what we want to do is we want to double click on each axis and delete the title. Remember when we tested our parameters, the titles were not changing, but we did calculated fields to fix that. So we've deleted the titles from both of them. And then we're going to drag our X axis title to columns. And we're going to drag the Y axis title calculated field to rows. So notice because our selectors are both set to discount, both of them are saying discount. And so 
Now, if we make selections, they will change. But before we do that, we run a rotate the Y axis title, going to right click on it and rotate the label. So it looks like that. And we want to edit the titles of our parameters over on the right. So next to choice one selector, I'm going to do the drop down and edit title. And I'm going to put this one as first choice. And for the second one, you're going to name it second choice. and click OK. Now we're ready to test. For my first choice, I'm going to leave it on discount. And my second choice, I'm going to choose quantity. So notice that the X axis title updated there when I chose quantity. So your end users will be able to do any choices that they need for their analysis and the axes will update accordingly. And now we just have to name the sheet. Since it's so variable, I'm going to name it analyzing by region and customer. So, Regardless of what they pick, it's still analyzing by region and customer. And if you hover over the marks, you'll see both titles, customer last region and the placeholder one and placeholder two values. So placeholder one at this point is quantity. Placeholder two is sales. Pretty cool. Go ahead and save. So you got to see some really cool advanced features during this module. Um, we started by showing you how to view data. And also I showed you how you can describe the sheet from the worksheet menu. Really cool features. We got to change our mark sizes again. You got exposed to using presentation mode, which is really cool if you just want everyone to see all of your visualizations on a big screen. We added annotations. You learned how to exclude data on the fly and how to include it again. We customized mark shapes and then we added drop down selectors. You saw the type of drop down that supports a search box selector. And we added a slider selector. And you saw that depending on the selector, the customization options vary. Then we created an animated visualization using page trails by placing a field in the pages shelf. We ended by creating parameters, which we then ended up creating like four calculated fields so that the users can make a choice from each parameter that's visible on the right side. The data will update to what they need to see for analysis. We also created calculated fields that would make sure that the axes titles would update to the proper selections. In this extensive course, we started by connecting to a variety of data sources, in particular text, Excel, and access database data sources. We started calculating user defined fields. So that's when we started using some of Tableau's predefined functions. We also learned how to calculate percentages, how to show totals and 
how to apply the if then logic in a calculation. We applied more logical functions using the if then else construct along with the and function. And we moved on and learned how to discretize data by making it discrete. So individual segments that act as labels versus continuous where you have a continuous axis. We learned how to manipulate text using a calculated field. And we used the start with function at that point. And throughout, you learned how to aggregate data and change the aggregate. We started customizing and saving. That's when you learned how to add titles and captions, how to modify font sizes and colors, adding colors and labels, changing mark sizes, adding reference lines, printing to PDF, saving packaged workbooks, and creating a workbook data extract, which you would need to refresh if the original data source is changed, then you would have to refresh to get those changes in your extract. We were able to save a workbook to Tableau Cloud, and you learned how to export data. We started exploring some advanced features like describing a sheet, changing the mark size, using presentation mode, adding annotations, excluding data on the fly, customizing mark shapes, and you created your first animated visualization using page trails. We also started creating parameters, which are referenced in calculated fields. And then you learned how to use parameters on a sheet. That's when we created our first choice and second choice parameters. Hello everyone. I am Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to Tableau video training course. Tableau is a visual analytics platform that makes it easier for people to explore and manage data and faster to discover and share insights that can change businesses and the world. It helps people and organizations be more data-driven. Tableau supports data prep, analysis, governance, collaboration, and more. As a continuation of the Tableau introduction video training course, this advanced course is designed to boost the student's competence when it comes to creating visualizations and creating dashboards. The course goes into considerable detail on these two subjects and explores among other areas, how to create a range of different charts, maps, user-defined fields, as well as a host of advanced features and abilities. We'll start by connecting to a variety of data sources. This will leave you with some great workbooks to practice on and develop on your own after this course. And then we'll take a deep dive into dashboards, including preparation, summarizing data, and interacting with data for dashboards. In module 10, we're going to focus on more calculations, summarizing your data for getting them ready for dashboards. In lesson one, we're going to focus on arithmetic. And in lesson two, you're going to learn how to group your data with calculations. Now, we did manual groupings before for our regions for our map, but this is using calculations to do grouping. It's, it's pretty cool. In lesson three, you're going to learn about how to display correlation with calculations. And before we get to that lesson, we'll return to this slide show because the calculation for that one is really intense. In lesson four, you'll learn how to use cross tabs flexibly. And in lesson five, we're going to cover simplifying your business rules with custom calculations. And so there is a Word document in the video description named calculations. 
And I have both the calculations for lessons two and three in this module in that Word document. So you don't have to type them in, but we will review them when we use them. I already have a new sheet ready to go in our Sample Superstore Live file. And we're going to start with arithmetic. And you're going to learn how to do an ad hoc, also known as an inline calculation, during this lesson. So we're going to drag, let's start populating this a little bit before we do our calculation. And we want to drag market segment to rows. And then what you're going to do is you're going to double click in the column shelf. And notice it creates that little long oval for you to type into. And we're going to type in AVG or AV, and then you can tab it in from the list. And then we want the profit field. So I'm going to grab that one. And then I'm going to do the slash for division. I'm going to type AV again and grab average again. And this time, I want the sales field. So you have average profit divided by average sales, which actually equals a profit ratio. So notice at the end, it says in order to apply it, you have to do control enter. So I'm going to do control enter there. And now you see our visualization is populated. Now, we can right click on the axis so we can change the name of it there by going to edit axis. And at the bottom, let's name it, and it's going to sound weird for a moment, but let's name it our profit ratio. And we can go ahead and close the edit axis dialog. So the reason why I didn't just name it profit ratio is because there's already a profit ratio field in this data set. And I just wanted you to be able to do an ad hoc calculation. So there's already a profit ratio field in the data set. And we want our profit ratio to display as percentages. So what we're going to do is right click on any column in your viz and choose format. And the format pane opens on the left side of the screen. And we're going to go to the fields drop down and we're going to select our ad hoc calculation. And under scale, we're going to do the numbers drop down and choose percentage. And we'll get rid of the decimal places. So now you see your axis numbers have updated to percentages. And let's go ahead and name the sheet average profit ratio per segment. And on your own, let's go ahead and change the axis title to average profit ratio and then save your workbook. Now I'm going to go ahead and close the format pane and I'm going to click on color on the marks card and I'm going to just go with my usual orange color. So we're ready for a new sheet where we're going to do some more arithmetic. On this sheet, we're going to calculate cost. So let's start by dragging the order date field to columns. And we want it to display the quarter of the order date. So whether you want to expand it or drop down and change it to quarter is up to you. But the only one we want up there is quarter. Let's double click in the rows shelf. And we're going to type sales minus, and then profit. 
and go ahead and control enter to apply. Now, this one we're going to treat a little bit different than the one we did just a few minutes ago. Let's go up to the row shelf. And this time we're going to click and hold on sum of sales minus profit. And we're going to drag it over to our field list and drop it. So once it's in the field list, you can rename it. It's already highlighted for you to rename and we're going to type cost and press enter. So now if you look up at your rows shelf, it's the sum of the cost. Now we're not done with this visualization yet, but let's go back to our previous sheet so we can do the same with our average profit ratio field. Go up to columns and you're going to drag it and drop it to your field list and then just rename it average profit ratio. So that way it's available if you want to use it on other visualizations. And we can go back to our latest sheet. So one thing that we're going to do is we're going to fix the axis so that it is continuous. So let's do the drop down next to quarter order date. And instead of it being a discrete field where it's showing each quarter like that, we're going to choose continuous. So it still works if you hover over any point, any mark on your line, it tells you what quarter it is. But the axis just says quarter of order date and has like one, two, three, four. It's a continuous line as opposed to discrete. So I want to point out some interesting information down in your status bar on the left side of your status bar. Where it's showing you the information from your visualization, which is pretty cool at a glance information. So all the way down there, it's letting you know there's four marks. We have four quarters. So there's four marks on your line chart, one row by one column, and it gives you the sum of the cost as over $2 million. So good information at a glance. Let's give this vid some more detail. So let's add profit to the row shelf. and add market segment to columns. And then we decide we want a double line chart. So I'm going to go to show me, or I should say a dual line chart, and I'm going to choose the dual line chart. So we can see both of those values for each segment in the same pane. I'm going to go ahead and collapse show me. And we're going to change the colors of the legend on the right in a moment, just so you know, just something to keep in the background. If it ever doesn't generate a color legend for you on the right, you can make it do so by going to your analysis menu. And you can hover over legend and it wouldn't be checked here, but you would be able to check it to get that color legend and the same for a shape or a size legend. If they don't show up automatically, you can grab them from analysis menu. So I'm going to go over to the legend and do the drop down and choose edit colors. And I am going to select a palette. The palette I'm going to select is called, it's all the way at the bottom, it's called Lightning Watermelon. And then I'm going to click on the cost field and I'm going to change it to red. And for the profit field, I'll change it to green. Actually, I want a darker red on cost. And then I'm going to choose OK. 
Let's go ahead and change it to month of order date. So I'm going to do the drop down and I'm going to select the second month on the list. And you can see how it updates our lines. They're now showing monthly. And then we're going to show a filter for the order date. So I'm going to just right click month of order date in the columns shelf and choose show filter. So it shows up on the right and it is, you know, a slider and we want to do the drop down to the right of our filter header and we want to choose start date instead of range of dates. So on the filter, instead of using the slider, I'm going to click right at toward the end of January, 2019. And I'm going to just manually edit it to tell it to start with January, 2021. And you can see how it adjusts. And I'm going to clear that filter. So I can right click on it in the filter shelf and clear it. Now, if you want to give your end users the ability to filter, then go ahead and show the filter again and just leave it there so that they have that option to filter if they need to, so they can see whatever they need to see. So I'm going to just add it back and change it back to start date. And lastly, we're going to do just a little bit of formatting on this visual. And so I'm going to right click anywhere in the chart and go to format. And as usual, it opens on the left side. And I'm going to go to the paint bucket up at the top of the format pane to get to shading. And I want to shade this worksheet. I'm going to go to more colors and I'm going to choose like a really palish green, a little bit paler. Yeah, very pale, very subtle and click OK. So that really adds, for lack of a better word, some drama to the visualization, makes it more eye catching. People will be more interested in viewing it. Little color goes a long way. And we'll end by naming this sheet monthly cost and profit by market segment and save. So even though Tableau saves in the background, I always like to save along the way. And I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the format pane. So we don't need it anymore for this portion. And go ahead and get a new sheet ready. So I have on the screen that calculations word document. And we're getting ready to group data with calculations. So instead of having us type in these calculations, I put them in word. And so let's grab the first one. I'm just going to start with the if statement. And once we get started with this lesson, I will, of course, break down this calculation for you. And by the way, this is in word. So I changed it. So it is straight quotes instead of smart quotes. If you have smart quotes, it won't work in our calculation editor in Tableau. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that first calculation. And on our new sheet, let's start by dragging category to columns and subcategory to rows. So the thing that happens here, right? If maybe there are times where you just want to see the subcategories and other times where you just want to see the categories, right? And you don't want to have to keep deleting the pills in a visualization. So the calculation that we're going to do is going to create dynamic grouping and ungrouping. And so we can delete both of those pills from the shelves.
just wanted to give you an explanation of what's going to happen here. The calculation we're going to build will allow us to expand or collapse. So collapsed would just be showing the categories. Expanding would be able to see the subcategories. So you don't have to, like I said, delete a pill to, to change that kind of viewing. So what we're going to do is we are going to create a parameter. So I'm going to do my drop down arrow and create parameter. And we're going to name it group and ungroup. We're going to give it a data type of string and we're going to allow a list and we're just going to add two values to the list. So the first one is group and the second one is ungroup. And we're going to go ahead and click OK. Now we're going to create a calculated field and I can collapse that right side. And we're going to name this calculated field dynamic grouping slash ungrouping. And this is where we're going to paste the calculation. So let us discuss this calculation. I'll make my box bigger. Okay. So we're using the if, then, then if, then else, else if statements with or statements mixed in. So if the subcategories equals bookcases or chairs or furnishings or tables, then if the parameter we created is set to group, then it will group them together and call them furniture or else it would just show the subcategory. If none of those things are true, it would just show the subcategory. Then we have an else if block in the middle. So this is the same. It's saying that appliances, art, binders, envelopes, fasteners, labels, paper, and storage, and supplies would be grouped together as office supplies. Or if that's not the case, it would just have the subcategory name. The last else if block is creating another grouping. So this one is accessories, copiers, machines, phones, right? They would be grouped together as technology. And then it has L subcategory. So if none of those are true, it would just show the subcategory. Then it ends that portion. Then it gives another else calculation, which saying if none of the above are true, just show the subcategory. So everything from bookcases to phones. If none of those are a match, just show the subcategory. So I didn't want you to have to type all of that in. So that's why I put it in the Word doc. We're going to go ahead and click on a OK. All right. So now we're going to use our dynamic grouping, ungrouping calculated field in rows. And we'll put our sales in columns. Now we do want to show our group and ungroup parameter. So I'm going to right click on it and choose show parameter. So now it defaults to group. So we have our, these are actually our category fields, right? But if we go over to the parameter and we choose ungroup, 
we just get the subcategories. So it's not like you would normally, like we saw when we before we started this, was you can have category and subcategory, but if you were to collapse it, you're still going to see the category, right? So this way it gives you a choice of either seeing by grouping, you're seeing the categories, by ungrouping, you're just seeing the subcategories. So this is another useful interaction that you can have for your end users. And let's go ahead and name this sheet We'll call it dynamic group, dynamic group, and then I'm going to do a dash, and it's going to be sales information. And I'm, as usual, going to change my color to my favorite orange here to give it some more visual appeal. So in our next lesson, we're gonna figure out if there is a correlation between sales and profits per category. Before we do so, I have to give you some background information on the calculation. So a correlation coefficient is a value that quantifies the relationship of two or more variables. In linear correlation, the coefficient quantifies the strength and direction of the correlation between the variables. One type of correlation coefficient, and that's the type we're gonna use, is the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. It's also known as R, which measures linear correlation and provides a value between negative one and positive one. Positive one is total positive correlation. Zero is no correlation. And negative one is total negative correlation. If two variables have a strong positive correlation, then the R value will be nearer to positive one. For example, X increases as Y increases. If they have have a strong negative correlation, then the R value will be nearer to negative one. X increases as Y decreases would be that example. A strong positive correlation is generally considered to be a value between positive 0.8 and plus one. With anything below positive 0.5 considered to be weak. So for those of you unfamiliar with correlations, just a reminder, the slide deck is in the file for video of the video's description. So to measure R, the strength of a correlation, the covariance, which is the dependence between variables, needs to be determined and then divided by the product of the variable's standard deviations. There are a few different types of formula to determine the correlation coefficient, we're using the below formula, which means in terms of data that N would represent size, X would be profit and Y would be sales. This formula is pretty daunting, but once you break it down into parts, it becomes much easier to understand. So on the lower left of this slide, you have the entire calculation. And on the right side, you have it broken into four parts, which we're gonna review before we do this. For the first part, we'll be using Tableau's size function, which returns the number of rows in a partition. For the second part, we'll be using the window sum function, which returns the sum of the expression within the window. And the window is defined as offsets from the current row. For part three, xi equals the sum of profit and mean of profit. For example, the window average of the sum of profit and SX is the standard deviation of profit. 
Therefore, we would need to subtract the mean from the sum of profit and then divide that by the standard deviation. And you'll see the line of the calculation that will do that. And then part four is almost the same as part three, except we have to swap profit for sales. Once we have all of the parts, you'd need to multiply them by each other. And the reason why I put this in the calculations is because parentheses is everything with this particular calculation. So I put this in the Word document so we can copy and paste it and make sure we get it right. But there is a reminder to make sure to take special care that the parentheses are in the correct places. So then I have the final formula, which is in that Word document, and a screenshot of the whole thing put together at the bottom. Now we're ready to go in and do it. So now in that Word document, I'm going to go ahead and select the calculation at the bottom and copy it. And then I'll go over to Tableau. And we're going to create a new sheet. So again, we're looking to see if there's a correlation between sales and profits per category. So we're going to put category and profit in rows. And we'll put sales on columns. And we'll use the customer last name for detail. Now we're going to go ahead and create our calculated field. And we're going to name it correlation coefficient. And we can paste in our calculation. So it's one divided by size minus one, right? Then it's times the window sum. Yeah, this one is pretty deep. So I broke down the different pieces. There's four parts to this. And you can see that they're all multiplied to each other. Let's go ahead and click OK. And before we use it, let's right click on it in the field list and edit it. So you notice when we come back in, it says the results are computed along table across and it says default table calculation. Well, table calculations were covered extensively in the introduction course, but I will tell you that they have two characteristics. Partitioning, which is also known as scoping, in this case, it's partitioned on the table. And then the second part is addressing, also known as direction, and it's going across the table. So let's go ahead and click OK again. And we're going to drag correlation coefficient to color on the marks card. And so you'll notice that nothing really happened, right? Kind of dimmed out a little bit. And that's because we want that correlation coefficient to be computed using the customer last name. So in order to do that, we're going to right click on its pill in the marks card, hover over compute using and choose customer last. So we're using a specific dimension for it. And so right now, the darker the color is an indication to you that it is a stronger correlation. I'm going to go to color and edit colors. And I want to choose a different palette here. 
So I'm going to choose the red, green, gold diverging palette, and I'm going to use five steps for it. And I'm going to click OK. I'm also going to, and I'm going to grab it from the field list, I'm going to drag correlation coefficient to tooltip on the marks card as well. And I'm going to make this fill the entire view instead of the standard setting. So it's easier to look at. And actually, let's delete the pill where correlation is in the tooltip because it's already going to be there because we put it in, we computed it along the customer last name. So it will already show in the tooltip. But if I hover over any of these, we'll see the correlation coefficient like where I'm looking, right? 0.64. So that's pretty strong correlation, right? It means that if sales increase, profit increases. That's what that is meaning. Let's go ahead and add a trend line to this. So I'm going to go to the analytics tab and we're going to do a linear trend line. And we'll add some more detail to this. I'm going to close analytics pane. I wanted to go back to the data tab. We're going to add some more detail by dragging the region field to detail. And so we're looking at it by category and by region at this point. And our color scheme changed and that's fine. Go ahead and let's name this one correlation between sales and profit. Now we're going to use cross tabs and we're going to do it in a really cool way. So earlier I spoke to you about using a table as an accompaniment to another visualization. And so let's go to our sales by state sheet. And I'm going to show you a really quick and simple way of creating a cross tab or a table. And the thing is, is that everything we've been doing so far and that we're going to continue to do is leading up to what we're going to be using on our dashboard. So we already have this map and we decide that we're going to want an accompanying table. Well, instead of building that table from scratch, this is what we're going to do. Right click on your sales by state sheet tab and choose duplicate as cross tab. And then you're going to go to the duplicated sheet right next to its side. And voila, it did it for us automatically. Didn't have to create a table. And so this table could be a great companion piece on our dashboard for that particular map. And we're going to change some things here. Let's start with changing the sheet name. So we want to get rid of the number two and we're going to put the word cross tab instead. Sales by state cross tab. And I want to show you another formatting thing here. Let's go up to the format menu and hover over workbook theme. Now this is workbook theme, so it applies to every sheet in your workbook. And it's set to default. Let's choose modern. And look at how that makes our cross tab look. And you can go to, I'm going to go to the count of products 
And you see that's also now in the modern workbook theme. I'm going to go back to my sales by state cross tab. And let's go back to format workbook theme and try classic. And so classic does the shading in the first row of a cross tab. And I kind of like the way that looks. And if I go to percent of sales by category and state, you'll see that it has the shading as well. Our last lesson in this module is simplifying your business rules with custom calculations. Well, we've done several custom calculations already, but we're going to do this one. And the one that we're going to do will show if sales values are meeting the annual quota by region. So I already have my new sheet up. Let's put the year and the quarter of the order date in columns. And we'll use sales as our text field. So now we're going to create our calculated field. And we're going to name it quota status. We're going to type this one in after we get it all the way typed in. I'm going to make sure that an error happens just so you can see how it can be resolved, right? And this error is kind of a tricky one. So doing it on purpose. So we'll type it in. I'll explain the whole thing and we'll get rid of the error. So we're going to use the window average function to start. And we want the window average on the sum. So I'm using the sum function on the sales field. And right now you're in between two closing parentheses and we're going to type a comma and we're going to type. So this is the thing, the window average, when we did sum of sales, that was the expression. You can see underneath it, the syntax. So sum of sales is the expression. When we do the comma, it wants us to give it a start and or an end. These end is optional at least. So after our comma, we're going to type minus one. And then we're going to do the asterisk for multiplication. And we're going to type another open parenthesis. And we're going to use the ATTR attribute function. ATTR, we can pick it from the list. And then we're going to use the date part function, which you can also choose from the list. And then in single quotes, type the word quarter with a capital Q. After the closing single quote for quarter, you're going to type a comma. So now in the date part function, the date part that we put in for that argument is quarter. And now it's looking for the date. So we're going to do order date. And after order date, you now have three closing parens. I want you to go in between the second and the third one. and press enter. Now you're going to type plus three, come outside of the closing paren after plus three, type a comma, minus one, asterisk for multiplication, and we can go and copy that whole ATTR date part, 
All right, so copy, you don't need the parenthesis there. Copy the ATTR date part all the way through order date field and paste it after your asterisk. Save us a little bit of typing. After order date on the second line, we need to have three closing parentheses. And it lets us know that the calculation contains errors. So this is the error I want it to happen. If you go to the drop down next to the calculation contains errors, you'll see it has two errors and they're both the same. Argument quarter to date part must specify a date part, year, month, etc. Look at how they have year, month in those examples at the bottom. They're all lowercase. And if you notice in your calculation, both quarters have the wavy red underline. It needs to be all lowercase. So change both of your quarters so they're lowercase. I just wanted to give you an example of an error that could happen because of casing and it doesn't say, hey, this is because of casing. You have to look at the examples it gives you, right? And now we get our calculation is valid. So what is this calculation doing? It's calculating the window average of the sum of sales. And then it says minus one. That means for the previous year. And then it's multiplying that by the date part of quarter. So it's multiplying that by the quarter of the order date. Now, again, you have built in help. If you go to the right arrow on the right side and you can click on ATTR if necessary, and you see it returns the value of the given expression. If it only has a single value for all rows in the group, otherwise it would display as an asterisk and null values are ignored. And we can collapse that. And after that part, it has a plus three. So minus one means previous year. In this context, the plus three is meaning it's gonna do it on the calculation on the current quarter, but do it for the next three quarters as well. Then we have another minus one times. So let me back up a little bit. I made a bit of a mistake here. Plus three means the three rows, advanced three rows, which would be the rest of the quarters in a year. And then it repeats the negative one times the quarter piece again. So this is going to determine the quota status based on the average of the sum of sales for the previous year for the subsequent periods. Let's go ahead and click OK on our calculation. So if sales meet the quota, we want it to say quota met. If sales don't, quota not met. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create another quick calculated field and we're going to name this quota met question mark. We're going to use the if function here and we're going to reference, we want the sum of sales and we're going to do greater than equal quota status, then in single quotes, quota met. Else, in single quotes, quota not met. 
And then I'm going to press enter and we need the end statement. And we'll click OK. And now we can drag quota met calculated field to rows. So the first thing I want to point out is that for 2019, there's nothing that's been met. And that's because there's not a year previous to that. Remember, it calculated based on the previous year. So for your subsequent years, you'll see when the quota was met versus when it was not met. And what we're going to do is we're going to hide the field labels for rows. So we don't need that quota met question mark there. And we can see which quarters and in which years where the quota was met versus when it was not met. Pretty handy calculations. We're going to name the sheet quota status by sales. And then we're going to save. So in this module, we started with arithmetic. We created two ad hoc calculations and we were able to save both of them in our field list for use on other sheets. Then we moved on to grouping your data with calculations. We used a calculation that was in the Word document that allows you to either display subcategories or categories and not both at the same time. And it's based on a parameter, so you can either group or ungroup the data. Then we moved on to correlation with calculations. We went over several slides breaking down the correlation coefficient function before we ended up using it. And you saw that there is, in some cases, a correlation between profit and sales. You learned an easy way of creating a cross tab as a companion to another visualization. And you also learned about the workbook themes that can be applied. And then in the last lesson, you learned how to create another custom calculation, which allowed you to see whether sales quotas had been met. Welcome to module 11, where we will begin interacting with our data in preparation for our dashboards. In the first lesson, we're going to have fun with filters, hopefully. We've already used filters during this course, but specifically, you're going to learn how to use a wildcard and a conditional filter to group your data with clarity. In the second lesson, hierarchies for revealing the dashboard message, we're going to start by creating a set. A set is a grouping based on a filter that can be used to show members that are in the set based on its condition or out of the set based on its condition. After we create our set, we're going to create a hierarchy and add our set and a couple of other dimensions to it. And you know, the hierarchy is like category. If you do the plus sign in front of category, you'll have subcategory, so on and so forth. So it allows you to drill down on your visualization. So we'll have our hierarchy and we'll be able to show items that are in or out of the set. And then we're going to move on to actions and interactions. And when we get to this point, we're going to be able to do something really cool called an asymmetric drill down by using another set, another calculated field, and then we're going to use a worksheet action. And I have another slide right after this one where I'll show you the actions that are available. And by using the action, it is going to allow us to create the asymmetric drill down. In lesson four, we'll do some more drilling down into the details. 
And so we can do that from a hierarchy. We'll also have our asymmetric drill down. In lesson five, we'll start working with input controls. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna set up a what if scenario. So this is gonna require us to create another parameter and another calculated field. And at the end, when we're done with it, it's gonna show a dual line chart one line will show the actual sales value and the other line will show the what if sales value. So what if sales are 2% more than actual sales or four or 6% or 8%. That's what that's going to produce. And then we're gonna spend some time preparing for our first dashboard. We're gonna go through our sheets we're gonna make sure our coloration is okay. We're gonna change some filter titles and we're gonna add colors to our filters and legends. We're gonna make sure that we have mark labels showing when appropriate and we're gonna want them inside the marks, which I'll show you how to do. Now I promised you a slide with the actions that are available. So there are actions at both the worksheet and the dashboard level. And so each of them have the same actions. You have filter, highlight, go to URL, go to sheet, change parameter and change set values. In this module, we're gonna use both change set values and go to URL. Okay, so we're gonna create more filters now. Let's go ahead and bring up a new sheet for this. And we're gonna drag product name to the filter shelf. And we've already done general filtering. We did a top filter. We're gonna do a wildcard filter now. So in the match value box, we're gonna type ACCO. Now at this point we could exclude it so all other product names that don't match that wild card will come up, but we're not gonna exclude it. Now let me show you what happens when we click on exactly matches and we apply. Let's close the filter and drag product name to the rows shelf. And we're not seeing anything because there is no product name that exactly matches ACCO or ACCO. Let's right click on our filter and edit it. And let's choose contains. And now apply that one. So you see all of the product names that contain ACCO and it would be anywhere within the product name. And since it's a wild card, it's including ACCO hide. Let's click okay on that. Now let's go ahead and drag the sales field to the column shelf. And I'm gonna have you do this one on your own. I'm gonna have you edit the filter so that it contains Avery. So now your chart looks like mine. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna right click on the product name filter and clear the filter. So now we have all of the product names, which are kind of overwhelming this chart. So we're gonna do a different kind of filter, but first we need to do a little bit of research. So what I want you to do is right click in a blank area of your chart and choose view data. And we wanna sort the sales in descending order. So we see the highest sale right here, right? 
and they're in descending order and I scroll down and I'm like, okay, so we have some that are greater than 10,000. So we're going to use that in a filter to make this visualization only show those products that have sales that are greater than 10,000. So we're going to go ahead and close the view data sheet. And we're going to bring product name. I'm going to copy it from rows and put it back in the filter shelf. And this time we're going to go to the condition tab at the top. So we're filtering product name by the sales field based on its sum and where it has the equal sign, we're going to do the drop down and select greater than or equal to, and the value to the right of that is going to be 10,000. And we're going to apply and okay. So now we have a more usable visualization. It's not overwhelmed. It's focused on the products that have sales that are greater than 10,000, greater than or equal to $10,000. Now we're going to sort this chart in descending order by sales. So I'm going to go down to the axis and click. When I click once, it's in descending order. And I'm, as usual, going to change my color to orange. And we're going to name this sheet. products with sales greater than equal 10,000. And now we're going to create a set and a hierarchy, which are useful for revealing the dashboard message. So a set is like a grouping based on a filter that can be used to show members that are either in the set, out of the set, or in and out of the set at the same time. And then you have hierarchies, and we already have two hierarchies in our data set. If you look in the fields list, location is the name of a hierarchy that contains these five members. Product is the name of this hierarchy which contains these four members. So we're going to get started by creating our set. And to do that, we're going to go to a new sheet and we're going to right click on customer last, hover over create and choose set. And we're going to name the set top 20 by sales. And then we're going to go to the top tab, select by field, change the 10 to a 20 and change average profit ratio to sales. And we'll leave it on the sum of sales and we're going to click OK. So now we see our set and it's still selected toward the bottom of your field list and notice the icon in front of it, which indicates it's a set. So with that already selected, hold down your control key and click on customer last and market segment, right click on any of the selected ones, hover over hierarchy and choose create hierarchy. We're going to just name the hierarchy customer and market segment and click OK. So the three fields we had selected are in the hierarchy, but we want the top 20 by sales set to be the first thing in the hierarchy. So I'm going to just click and hold and drag it up so it's in the top position in the hierarchy and you'll see a guideline going across. So you have your hierarchy, which is collapsible and it includes a set. Now we're going to pull this all together by creating a visualization. 
So for our visualization, let's go ahead and drag the sales field to columns and our top 20 by sales set to rows. And we're also going to drag top 20 by sales to filters. So what we can do here is, and we could do it in two different places. First, let's edit the filter. And we want to choose show in and out of set. And both in and out are selected. So we just want to check that and click OK. So now it's showing the sales that are in the set, meaning they're in the top 20 and those that are out of the set. Now we can get more detail on here, could do it two different ways. We're gonna end up hiding this field label, so let's do that first. Hide field labels for rows. And we can do it from the rows shelf. Do the plus sign in front of in out, and now it's showing customer last, which is the next thing in our hierarchy that we created. If we do the plus sign in front of customer last, it will show the market segment. I think it's pretty cool using sets and hierarchies. So I'm going to collapse it to customer last. So I'm going to just do the minus sign on customer last. And there we have the items that are in the set, part of the top 20, and the items that are out of the set. And since we hit the field label, if we wanted to get it back, we can do that from the analysis menu. And if you go hover over table layout, you can do show field labels for rows. And that also gives you the ability to drill down into the set members if necessary, into the hierarchy if necessary. We're going to hide the field labels again. Let's show our in and out filter. So I'm going to right click on it and show filter. And so the end user has the ability to just see all. I'm going to uncheck all. And I just want to see the ones that are in the set. And then I'm going to uncheck that and see the ones that are out of the set. Go back to all. I'm going to name this sheet Top 20 Customers by Sales dash in slash out. And I'm going to give color, of course, to my bars. Go ahead and save. Now you're going to learn a cool action, which creates an interaction for your end users. And we're going to do this by, of course, creating yet another sheet. And on this one, let's start by, let's grab our category field to rows. And expand it. So when you expand the category field, it shows the subcategories for every category. What we're going to create is a situation where you can expand just one category at a time. So we can go ahead and get rid of category and subcategory on the rows shelf. And what we're going to do is we're going to right click on the category field, hover over create, and we're going to choose set. So this is going to be like a placeholder set. We're not going to give it a different name, just category set. Pick any member. So just one and click OK. 
whatever category you chose is going to be overwritten by the set action. So consider it temporary. Now we're going to create a calculated field. And we're going to call it asymmetric subcategory. And it's just an if then else statement. So we're going to grab if, and we're going to choose category set. Then subcategory else category. And then we just need the end statement. So this is what's going to cause the set we created to change according to a selection. And we're going to click OK at the bottom. And now we're going to drag the category field and our asymmetric subcategory calculated field, both to rows shelf. And go ahead and drag sales to text. So at this point, we're not quite done. If I click on category to expand it, it's still gonna show all the subcategories for each category. I'm gonna go ahead and collapse that. We have to create a worksheet action to pull this all together. So we do that from the worksheet menu and click on actions. So it's showing actions for this entire workbook. We created our pie chart. It actually created a highlight action on its own for us. And so we are going to go down and click on add action and you have six different worksheet actions that you can add. Filter, highlight, you can go to a URL, you'll get see examples of that. Go to a sheet, change the parameter, or change set values. Now, we also have dashboard actions, so you'll get more actions later in this course. We're gonna choose change set values. And we're gonna name this action asymmetric drill down and the source sheet is the sheet we're currently on we're going to run the action on select you'll learn more about these choices in a little bit and the target set we're going to do the drop down hover over sample superstore and choose our category set Running the action will assign values to the set. Clearing the selection will, we want it to remove all the values from the set. And click OK and OK again. So this is the tricky wicket. It's going to look like it's not working. So if I go to the rows shelf and I expand category, we get the usual behavior. I'm going to collapse that again. But in our table, if I click on a category, so click on furniture, that's the select action, and you can see that it only expanded the furniture category. If I click on office supplies, the same thing happens. And technology, might as well. And then I'm going to click on technology again, and that's how you collapse it. And that is known as an asymmetric drill down. I've already named the sheet independent category sales. And we're going to add another worksheet action that will take you to a URL. And the URL will open in a new browser tab. So we're going to go to Worksheet Actions again. And at the bottom, we're going to choose Add Action. 
and go to URL. We're going to name this learn it with an exclamation point. And just to point this out to you, if I look through this list of sheets here, it's not going to show every sheet that we have in our workbook. However, if I go to the sample superstore dropdown, it will show you all of the sheets in alphabetical order. So we want to go to our independent category sales sheet. Let's talk about the choices under run action on. I don't think you want to use hover. That literally means if you hover over anything, it's going to run the action. Select will force you to select something in order for the action to run. And we're going to use menu and I'll show you what that does when we get out of here. And so we're going to leave it on menu. We're going to choose new browser tab under URL target. And when we enter the URL, we don't have to do the HTTP formatting in front of it. We can just type learnit.com. And you'll see underneath it, it gives it the right HTTP prefix. And we can click on OK and OK. So because this is a table, if this was a line chart or a bar chart or some other kind of visualization, we'd be able to right click anywhere. But since we have this asymmetric drill down going on, if I right click, it's going to expand, right? So I don't want to right click anywhere, but on a number. So I'm going to right click on a number. And it's still going to expand it, but you'll see on the menu that pops up at the very bottom, there's a globe and next to it, it says, learn it with an exclamation point. We're going to go ahead and click on that. So it opens on a new browser tab and there you have it. An action that points to a URL. I'm going to go ahead and close the browser and get back over to Tableau. And I'll show you another place where you can access that go to URL action. If I expand furniture by clicking on it, you'll notice right here at the bottom, it gives you that on the menu as well. Now I'd like to show you the other run action on choices. And so let's go back to worksheet actions. Click on your learned action and choose edit. And instead of menu, let's put it on hover and click OK. And OK again. Now, if you hover over anything, it's going to cause that to happen. And so that's why I said, I don't think that you're going to want to use hover because you can end up with like a whole bunch of different web tabs going if you choose hover. Let's go back to worksheet actions. We're going to edit, learn it again. And this time choose select and okay and OK. So we actually have to select something for the action to happen. If you click on any value, if you click on anything in here, it's going to run the action. So I prefer on the menu. I feel like that gives me more control. What I'm going to have us do is go back and I'll have you do this on your own. Go back and change that learned action to menu. So our next topic is literally drilling into the details. And I think we've covered that a few different ways. We created the asymmetric drill down, which is really super cool. And you know, already know how to drill down using hierarchies or like date fields, right? So for example, we've done this several times throughout the course. But let's just, we're going to get rid of it, 
but let's grab the order date field and put it up in columns for a moment. And so if we wanted to see the quarter or the month of the order date, we can drill down by using the plus sign, right? And we've done that several times. So I think the new thing, the really interesting thing here about drilling down is the asymmetric drill down for a dimension. And I can keep drilling down on the date. I'm going to get rid of all of the date pills in the column shelf. And we can go ahead and save this. We've also had a little bit of experience working with input controls, but we're going to do a really cool situation here. And so let's go ahead and bring up a new sheet. Sorry, I might nerd out on you on this one. Because we're going to create a what if scenario with a parameter. So for example, what if sales were 4% more or 6% more or 10% more, we're going to create that situation. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to drag order date to columns and sales to rows. And we're going to right click on the year of order date. And we're going to hover over more and we're going to click on custom. And from the drop down where it says years, we're going to select month year and click OK. So now we're going to go ahead and create a parameter. And we're going to name it sales. What if? We're going to give it a data type of an integer. And we're going to change the current value to zero. And we're going to allow a range. We're going to check min, max, and leave their values in there. And we're going to change the step size to two. And you'll see what that means shortly. Go ahead and click OK. And then we want to show that parameter. So I'm going to right click on it and show parameter. And now we're going to create the calculated field that's going to reference our parameter. So we'll name this calculation sales if and we're going to reference the sales field and we're going to use the asterisk for multiplication and then in an open we need two open parentheses here, and we're going to reference the sales what if parameter. We're going to do the slash for division, type 100, close the parentheses, type plus 1. and close parenthesis. So the calculation is take the sales field and times it by whatever is what in the sales what if parameter. Divide that by 100 and then add 1. Basically that's what's going on. 
Because of the way it's written, it's changing the order of operations by using the parentheses. So it's going to be doing the division part first, then adding one, and then multiplying it by sales. We can go ahead and click OK. So we have our parameter and we have our calculated field. I want you to notice that on our sales what if parameter over to the right, it's set to zero. So what's going to happen next will make a little bit more sense because that's set to zero. And you'll see what I mean right now. So we want to drag our sales if calculated field and drop it on the sales axis. And we're only seeing one line right now because that parameter is set to zero. So when we use the parameter control and we do the right arrow on the slider, it goes up by two because that's the setting that we put in there, right? So once we get it on two, we see two different lines, right? So this is saying, what if sales were 2% more? If we right arrow on the parameter again, we're seeing what sales would be if they were 4% more. So the green line is the actual sales and the orange line are the what if sales based on the value of that parameter. So we can go up and see it's going up by two. And it would be nice to have a color legend on this. So we're going to go to the analysis menu, hover over legend and choose color legend. So we get our sales and our sales if. And we're going to go ahead and name this sheet. And it will be sales. What if analysis? And you can save your workbook again. So now we're going to spend the rest of this module preparing for our first dashboard. And that means we're going to review the sheets we have do some formatting things on them, and also decide which sheets we're going to use on our dashboard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to sheet sorter view, the first view button down there, so that we can see all of our worksheets at the same time. And let's select the sales by category and subcategory sheet. You can just double click on its tile to bring it up. So I look at the title and it's descriptive enough. I've already applied the orange colors to my bars. So it has a little bit of that formatting going on. If you have a category filter on the sheet, you can go ahead and clear the filter. We're going to end up in the next module. We're going to create what's called a dynamic filter. So whatever you filter for will show in the title with some additional text. So we don't need the filter on this particular sheet. And this will be the first sheet that we're going to add to our dashboard when we're ready to create it. Let's take a look at our pie chart sheet and we're happy with the sales by market segment. And what we want to do is we're happy with that title. We're happy with the coloration. At least I am. And the caption we can, we're happy with that caption as well. Although we'll have to put the caption on the dashboard as well. So we're going to also use this sheet. And remember I said pie charts are good as companion charts to other related data. So the next sheet, the market segment histogram 
we'll use with that pie chart sheet. And that one, we're good with the coloration. Now on this one, we're showing the summary on the right hand side that will not come over to the dashboard. Let's go to the next sheet, sum and profit by year. For this one, what I'd like to do is have it fit the entire view instead of just standard. And I think because I've been using oranges a lot on my sheets, I want to change the colors on this one. So I'm gonna just go to the color card and edit the colors. And I will change profit to orange and then apply. So we have that color coordination going. You know, you wanna have consistency when it comes to stuff like that. So whatever colors you really like, those are the colors you should be using. Or if you have a company standard that needs to be used, then go ahead with that standard. And so on this one, I think we should go to label and show mark labels. Now that's kind of convoluted, so let's change the size of the labels to like seven point and see if that makes it a little bit better. Yeah, some of them are overlaying. So I might decide to just, let me see if I can get it even smaller. I don't know how small this will go. I know it'll go to seven, but I'm gonna try five. No, it's not gonna like five. So the lowest you can go is seven. Because they're overlaying, I'm gonna just get rid of the mark labels. Just it's gonna add confusion. So let's see. Maybe I can put them on for one and not the other, which is what I have now. So I just have the labels on for sales. On the dashboard, I might make a caption saying that the labels are representing the sales values. And before I forget, let's go back to the pie chart for just a second. The other thing we wanna pay attention to are titles on our cards on the right. So this is just showing the grand total of all sales. And so I don't want it to say sum of sales. I'm gonna do the drop down and edit title and I'm gonna call it overall sales. So it's a little bit more clear there. Now I'm gonna go to the annual sales sheet and this is by category and subcategory. And so we have our legend on the right side for the subcategories. I think this one is in pretty good shape. So we'll go to the next sheet. Now we're not gonna use this total sales by subcategory box plot. We're gonna use the total sales by subcategory box and whisper plot instead for a dashboard. So let's review what we can do with this one. So the first thing I'm going to do is have it fit the entire view. And then I'm going to just change my color to my orange color. And let's move on to sales aggregates. And we're not gonna use this on our dashboard. So let's move to the next one. On this one, I think the only thing I wanna change is the position of the mark labels. I'd like them to be centered inside the bars. So we're gonna go over to label. And for alignment, we're gonna do the drop down. And under horizontal, you're gonna select center. So now they're inside the bars, makes it a little bit more concise. 
Now, if we go back to our sales by category sheet, we could consider doing something like that. Let's see what happens if we change this from standard fit to entire view. So this bar is kind of, when you have short bars like this, we could do it. Let's see what the effect is, but I don't think it's going to fit in this office supplies fasteners bar, even if we adjust the font size, but it's worth a try for consistency. So I'm going to go to label there, alignment, I'm going to center. And so it just almost fits. I'm going to go back to label and let's see if it'll let me go. Yeah, let's go to font and change it to seven. So that will work and we have the consistency. Now let's go to the chart after our top 10 products by sales value. And that's the average in total sales by market segment. And I think that we may use that on the chart. We'll make that decision later, but I'm going to go ahead and give it my color as usual. And then the next one is, let's see what we're going to do with this one. We will use this. Let's make it fit the entire view. Coloration is fine. We have our region and category legends over here. And I think that that is fine. Let's go to the next one. Quantity by sub quantity and category. We're not going to use this one on our dashboard. So let's go to our sales trend by year. We'll use this one. Let's change the color. It's already fitting the entire view. And let's go to label and show mark labels to give it more depth. And we're ready to move on to our next sheet. So this is sales profit quantity by category and subcategory. We will leave the title as is. We just won't show it on the dashboard. And let's go ahead and fit to the entire view. I think the coloration is okay. It could be a little bit better. Let's see what we can do about this. So I'm going to go over to some profit and we're going to change that title too, but let's go to edit colors first. And we're using red, green, diverging, diverging. And I'm going to just change that to orange, blue, diverging, and we'll do five steps and click OK. And let's go to the next sheet, which is profit by category. We're definitely going to keep this one. Oops. I'm going to go back one sheet because I didn't change the title here. And the title is going to be profit range. And so, yeah, we're keeping this one. It's in good shape our area chart and I'm going to go ahead and look at the next one. Sales and profit by subcategory. This looks like it's in good shape. And let's go to the next one. We're not going to use this on our dashboard. Let's go to our days to ship sheet and we'll use this on our dashboard. 
I just might want to play with the colors here a little bit. So go ahead and change these colors for ship mode. I'm going to edit colors and see what I can do here. I'm not fond of that red color. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change standard class to like that greeny goldish color. And I already have a blue in there. I have my orange. And I'm going to go ahead and do OK and apply. So I like that. We have our dates to ship slider here, filter, and we have our order date filter. And they're both fine for now. Actually, I want to give them some color. So I'm going to go to the days to ship one and do the drop down format filter and set controls. And over here for the body for shading, I'm going to do like that pale orange color. And so you see it did it for both. Just to make them stand out a little bit more. And I'm going to close that panel. And I'm going to do the same for the legend. So I'm going to do its drop down arrow format legends and use the same color for that one. Let's go ahead and save at this point, even though you know it's saving in the background. This one, I also fit to the entire view. It makes those same day ones a little bit easier to hover over the individual ones. And we're going to go to our next one, which is our heat map. Let's go ahead and fit it to the entire view. And I want to get rid of that worksheet background color there. It's not really too visible. So for that, I'm going to right click anywhere within the heat map and go to format. And then I'm going to go to the paint bucket. And for the worksheet, I'm going to put the shading back to none. And then I can close that panel. And since we're only dealing with states and not provinces here, we can go ahead and edit the title. So I'm going to right click and edit title and I'm going to get rid of sheet name. And then I'm going to just type average sales and profit by state. And next we have our sales by state map, which I think is in pretty good condition. We may need to do some things with our cards on the right, but let me actually scroll across on the map to kind of center it really well. And then state province, we can just change that filter heading title, well, the filter title, just change it to state and get rid of profit province. And we have our sum of sales legend, which is good, but we're going to make it overall sales, the title. And this is our 2018 population, our data layer. So I think that's pretty good. And we can move on to our next one, which is the sales by state table that we're going to use as a companion piece. So first thing I'm going to say is we can get rid of its filter over here. We just don't need the filter there, the filter card. And I'm going to just change my color to orange. 
Let me see what happens if I do fit with. That's just too much of an area. So I'm going to just go back to standard. And we can change its title to just sales by state. It doesn't have to say cross tab there. And by the way, if you double click a title, it will open up. So I'm going to just do sales by state as the title. We're going to go to our next map, which is our filled map. The number of customers by state province. We don't have to make any changes to this. Let's go to our sales by region where we did the polygon. And I really want to change this to, so in the marks card, let's go to the drop down and choose map. So it gives us, we're still at the fill map and Actually, we'll leave it like this. I think the only thing that will make it clearer, well, we want the regions to be the highlight. So we'll just leave it like it is now. And I just want to scroll it. So that's zoom. Go to my scroll arrow here. Just move it a little bit on the page. And let's go to our next one. This is percent of sales by categories and state. We're not going to use this on our dashboard. Let's go to profit status by year. This is pretty cool. We'll use this on the dashboard. So what I want to do is just give it the color. Profit status by year. And that could be a companion to another visualization. And I'm going to scroll across some more. We're almost done with this process. And let's go to profit or loss. And I think we might use it. Let's change the color on it. We can make that decision at the dashboard level as well. Let's go to our next one, consumer sales. And we're not going to use this. We're not going to use 3M versus non 3M. So let's keep proceeding. Number of products and sales by market segment. They might use this one. I'm good with the coloration on it. Continuing sales by month over time. This is our animated animated visualization. We're definitely going to use this one. And I'm just going to change the color to my normal orange. I'm going to have it fit the entire view. And on the right side on that control, I'm going to do its drop down and edit the title. And it's just going to be month. And OK. And we can proceed to the next one. Analyzing by region and customer. Let's do some clean up on this one. This is where we have our parameters where and we did dynamic titles, right? So it's on quantity and sales now. What we're going to do is let's put this to the entire view and we're going to get rid of this Y axis title to field label there. So I'm going to right click on it and hide field labels for rows. And I'm going to do the same thing, hide field labels for columns just to clean it up a little bit. We'll go to the next one, which is a Average profit ratio per segment. And that's when we created our own calculation there. We may keep it. It's in good shape. 
monthly cost and profit by market segment. I think this is in fairly good shape. Let's see what we can do here. I'm going to change the month order date title to just month. And I'm going to format it. And I'm going to give it the orange, the light, the pale orange shading. And I'm going to do the same with the legend in terms of the shading. I'm going to see what it looks like when I fit it to the entire view. Not much change. It was already taking up pretty much the entire view. Now it looks like I have some kind of green shading on the worksheet. So I'm going to right click and go to format and go to the paint bucket and I'm going to get rid of that shading. And close that pane. I'm going to save again at this point. I think I want to switch up the colors a little bit too. So I'm going to go to color and edit. I think I want the cost. Yeah, I want the cost to be red. Profit, I'm going to make green. I'm going to deviate from my orange here and click apply. And now we're going to go to the next sheet, which is our dynamic grouping, which we're going to keep. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit it to the entire view and I'm going to show the mark labels. And for the mark labels, I want them to be centered horizontally. And so if I group, it has the marked labels. And if I ungroup, it has them as well. Let's go to our correlation. I think this is good. I think I want to use a different color palette though. So let me go to correlation. I'm going to go to color and edit the colors. So we have red, green, gold, diverging palette. I'm going to change it to the orange blue, white diverging palette. And I'm going to click on that first box that has that deep dark color on it. And I'm going to select orange for that one and click OK. And I'm going to apply. Hmm. Yeah. Let's take off the step color. So now it's custom diverging. I'm going to go back to, let's do orange and gold. And let's see what happens when we step that one. Yeah, I like that one better. We'll go apply and click OK. And let's save again. We're going to go to quota status. This will be a good companion piece. So I'm going to just change my color to orange. And then we have products with sales greater than 10,000. This one's in good shape. We just want to add the mark labels and center them. We can go to our top 20 sales by customer in and out set. This is in good shape. Yeah, I think if I put it to entire view, it doesn't make sense there. So I'm going to leave it on standard. And actually, let's see, in and out sales. Let's go ahead and show the mark labels centered. 
and we can go to our asymmetric drill down, which we're definitely going to use as a companion. And we're going to just change the color to orange on this one. And then we have our what if sales happy with the color on this one. And we want to change the title on the sales parameter. We're going to change it to use slider to adjust percent and I'll use the percent sign. I'm going to set it back to zero and we have that one line. Actually, I'm going to just leave it on two. So we did two steps for this one. So we've gone through every sheet, did some minor formatting, determined mostly which sheets that we are going to use on our dashboard. Go ahead and save your file again. By way of recap, in module 11, we started interacting with our data in preparation for our dashboards. We started with more filtering. And this time we got to use a wildcard filter as well as a conditional filter. Then we moved on to hierarchies, but first we created a set, which is a grouping based on a filter that can be used to show members that are either in or out of the set. And once we created our set, we then created a hierarchy which allows you to drill down to the hierarchy members. And we added our set to the hierarchy. In lesson three, we created another set and a calculated field. And then we used a worksheet action to replace the set values so that we could have an asymmetric drill down. We also used another worksheet action by adding a URL and we showed it on the menu. We reviewed drilling into the details by using our asymmetric drill down. We also went over drilling into the details by expanding different levels of a hierarchy. Then we moved into working with input controls where we created a what if scenario with a parameter and a calculated field. So you could see actual sales versus what they would look like at 2% more or 4% more, so on and so forth. The last part of this lesson, we spent some time preparing our sheets for our dashboard. So we made sure that our colors were all right, that mark labels were showing when necessary. We changed the color of our filter cards and our legend cards just for consistency. And we decided for the most part, which sheets we're going to use on our dashboard. In this extensive course, we started by connecting to a variety of data sources, in particular text, Excel and access database data sources. We started summarizing the data for dashboards. We started by doing arithmetic using ad hoc calculations, which are calculations you perform right in a shelf. And then we moved into grouping data with calculations. And that's when we did our dynamic grouping. You learned how to perform correlation with calculations, and how to use cross tabs flexibly. We moved on to simplifying your business rules with custom calculations. So that's when we created the quota status calculated field and the quota met calculated field. In the next module, module 11, we began interacting with data for dashboards. We had some fun with filters. So that's when we use the wild card filter and using the contains keyword. And then we did a conditional filter. 
At that point, we moved on to creating sets and hierarchies. So a set is like a grouping based on a filter that can be used to show the members that are either in or out of the set. And then we created a hierarchy, which you can drill down on. We got into some actions and interactions, and that's when we created the asymmetric drill down. And we used a worksheet action to add a URL to the sheet that pointed to learnit.com. We began working with input controls. So that's when we created our what if scenario with a parameter and a calculated field where we could see what our sales values could be if they were 2% or 4% higher than where they are right now. We spent a significant amount of time preparing for the first dashboard. We went through several sheets and adjusted formatting, titles, colors, so on and so forth. We tried to make sure that there were accompanying tables and pie charts for, for dashboards. Hello everyone, I am Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to Tableau Video Training Course. Tableau is a visual analytics platform that makes it easier for people to explore and manage data and faster to discover and share insights that can change businesses and the world. It helps people and organizations be more data-driven. Tableau supports data prep, analysis, governance, collaboration, and more. As a continuation of the Tableau introduction video training course, this advanced course is designed to boost the student's competence when it comes to creating visualizations and creating dashboards. The course goes into considerable detail on these two subjects and explores, among other areas, how to create a range of different charts, maps, user-defined fields, as well as a host of advanced features and abilities. We'll start by connecting to a variety of data sources. This will leave you with some great workbooks to practice on and develop on your own after this course. You'll learn how to use dashboards to get results, as well as some more advanced dashboard features that will make it easier for users to understand and manipulate them. In module 12, we'll finally build a dashboard and we're going to be using dashboards to get results. So the first lesson is about guided analytics with Tableau. I'll show you what all of that means. And we've already done some of it when we were preparing for our dashboard. You'll learn how to share your results in a meeting. We're going to be doing notes and annotations on the dashboard and using external data to enrich our dashboard. And we're going to do a really cool thing on dashboards concerning dates. So guided analytics, what are guided analytics? Well, it means several things. One thing that it does is it enables easier dashboard navigation by increasing accessibility and clarity. It helps increase usability of the content you've created and helps the audience glean valuable insights faster. Most importantly, it helps the audience transition to using visual analytics. A lot of people are still doing their analysis in like Excel, no visual analytics is in their life. So this will be helpful to that audience. So what do you do for guided analytics? Well, we've done some of this. You customize filter titles for clarity. You encourage action with captions. You track filter selections with dynamic titles, which you'll learn how to do in this module. You'll drill down with filter actions. You can pack your tool tips with more details. You know, when you have a visualization and you hover over it and you see the tool tip, 
It automatically includes the fields that you're using in the view, but you can add to them. And then you can filter by selection, which is really cool, and it allows greater control. Let's get into it. Okay, so let's start with guided analytics. And we've already done some of those steps. So we've already customized our filter titles for clarity. We will put descriptive captions on some of our visualizations or some of our dashboard pages when we get there. And then the other thing that suggested is to track filter selections with dynamic titles. So we're going to set that up now, and then we're going to use it on a dashboard with a companion sheet. And so what it means is that it would be nice when you filter, if it says at the top of your screen, what it's filtered for, or if it's not filtered at all, that's what we're going to set up now. And we're going to do that by creating a new sheet. And that sheet is just going to contain one thing, what we're going to use as the title that updates dynamically. So let's name this sheet category title. And depending on what kind of dynamic title you'll need, you may have several sheets with different dimensions and then title that you can use on dashboards. So this is a title specifically for visualizations where you can filter by category. And it's a weird setup, but we're going to also, we're going to grab the category field and drag it to detail on the marks card. And then we're going to change the mark shape to polygon. So you just have that blank box sitting underneath the title. So now we're going to double click the title placeholder to open it up and you're going to select and delete sheet name placeholder from in there. We're going to go over to insert on the toolbar and at the bottom, we're going to select category. So it puts it in as a placeholder. Now press your home key to get in front of that and press enter and then up arrow to go up to the empty line. And on this empty line, you're going to type select a category. And then at the end of the categories placeholder on the second line, you're going to do a space at the end of it and you're going to type the word selected. And let's select all of that stuff and change the color to orange and also make it bold. And we're ready to click OK here. Now, the second thing we're going to do is grab the category dimension and drag it to the filter shelf. And we're going to have all of them are selected, which is what we want. And we're going to click OK. So notice it immediately updates. It says select a category. And once we add it to filter, it says furniture, office supplies, technology selected. Pretty cool. It's dynamic, but it's going to get better because we're going to use this as a companion to another sheet. So we're going to create a dashboard in order to do this. So now we are going to go ahead and create our dashboard. So we're going to use the second button. We've been using the first one to create a new sheet. We're going to use our second button. And the first thing I want you to notice here is this white area is not really filling up the gray area. 
So we want it to fill it up as much as possible. On the left side, you have a dashboard tab. It's set to default. You can also create a dashboard for mobile view. And then you have the size. And I'm going to change the size. Now, what I change mine to might be different than what you change yours to because of what type of monitor you have and its resolution. So I'm going to change my width to 1400. And I'm going to change my height to 900. And that fills up most of that gray space for me. So now it says I have a custom size of 14 by 900. And if I click anywhere, it will collapse that. And then you have your list of sheets in the order they are in your workbook. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this slide bar down so I can see the last sheet. And if I hover over that sheet in its right corner, it shows a little box with a diagonal arrow. If I click on that box, it's going to take me to that sheet. We don't want to do that. It also shows a little thumbnail of what's on the sheet, which in this case is not very much. We're going to click and hold on that sheet and we're going to drag it and drop it where it says drop sheets here. And then we're going to go to the toolbar and we're going to change it from standard to fit width. Now we're going to locate the sheet we want to use with this by scrolling all the way up to the top and hover over sales by category and subcategory. We're going to grab it and notice as we drag it into the view, if I stop here, it's going to place it on the left. If I go here, it's going to place it at the top and overwrite our title. It'll place it on the right if I go here. And if I point toward the bottom, that's where it'll place it. And that's where we're going to drop it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put our mouse right above its title and it changes to a double arrow. We're going to click and hold and drag up and drag up until you're covering that polygon shape that's underneath the title there. The other thing we can do is we can get rid of the visualization title. So I'm going to right click on sales by category and subcategory and choose hide title. So how are we going to make this filtering happen? So select your title, select a category, all selected. And if you look to the right of it, you have an X, which will remove it from the dashboard. You have that go to sheet icon, and then you have a funnel that is set to use as a filter. You also have a more options drop down arrow. We want that funnel set the way it is. And then we're going to select our bar chart and it has the same icons. And what you want to do on that is you don't want to use this as a filter. So you're going to hover over the funnel that says use as filter. You're going to click it. And now if you hover over it, it says don't use as filter. And you can click away from all of that. So this is how it works. Dynamic titles updating. All right. So. This is a bar chart that's showing the category and the subcategory. The filter is select a category, right? So if we select any of the bars within a category, you'll see that it now says furniture is selected. If we select any bar in office supplies, office supplies selected. And if we do one in technology, it updates. And if we click away, then it's all selected again. So this leads me to believe that maybe we should name this select a subcategory bar or click on a subcategory bar. And so we can easily get back to that sheet by scrolling down here and using 
that go to sheet icon. That's one way of doing it. And then all we're going to do is edit the title by double clicking it. And I'm going to choose click any subcategory bar and apply and click OK. And then when I go back to my dashboard, it says that there. So it's more specific information instead of click a category. So, and then I notice it should say all selected. Well, it does say all selected. If I click on that furniture selected, so that'll be fine, right? Maybe we need to modify it and make it a little bit better. So once you have a bar selected, again, you can click on that bar again, or you can click in a white area to deselect everything. And this time we're going to go to the sheet from the title. So I'm going to use that to go back to that sheet. And I'm going to modify the title again. So category selected. I'm going to put the word the in front of the category placeholder. And then afterward, I'm going to type the word category is selected. So we're telling them to click on a subcategory and then the category would be selected. And I'm going to put a period at the end of that one and click OK, go back to the dashboard. So now it says the all category is selected and that's fine. When they click on a bookcase, the furniture category is selected, so on and so forth. So that's how you can track your filter selections with dynamic titles. And I think we're going to add something else to this dashboard. Let's see what would be a good companion here. In the meantime, go ahead and save your file. And by the way, you can select more than one bar by using your control key. So I'm going to click on a bar in the furniture category, click on another one in office supplies and another one in technology. So you can see how it updates. And I'm going to just click in a blank area to deselect everything. Another thing I'll point out to you is in your sheet list, any sheet that you have on your dashboard will have that little blue check mark next to it. And so we're going to add another sheet to this dashboard. And we have one right above the one that we have on there. It's a table, total sales by category. And so I'm going to click and hold on that one. And I want it on the right side. So when it's shaded on the right side, I'm going to let it go. And of course, that doesn't take up a lot of space. I'm going to go ahead and change it to fit the width. And... I want to put a couple of things underneath it to fill in that blank space, right? And so one of the things that we can do, if we look on the left side on the dashboard tab at the bottom, we have objects, right? And we're going to select text and drag it on to the bottom right side. So we get our edit text dialog box. So I type the table above shows the total sales by category. It will also filter based on your bar selections. And I'm going to do control A to select all of that text. I'm going to make it bold. I'm going to make it 12 point and we might make it even bigger. And I'm going to give it an orange color and click OK. That's pretty good sizing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just leave that one right there for now. And we're going to add something else. 
Before we add the image, let's do a few other things. We don't need the title, the sheet title for the table on the right, total sales by category. So I'm going to right click on that and choose hide title. Let's double click our dashboard sheet tab and we're going to name it sales by category and subcategory. And so notice we already have a sheet with that name. So I'm going to click OK on that message. And at the end of the name, I'm going to do a dash and then I'm going to type the word dashboard. Then we're going to go to the dashboard menu and choose show title. So we have this at the top and then we can edit the title. Notice it's saying sheet name in there. Well, we'll just leave it like that. So we can't have two sheets with the same name, like in most programs. So now that we've done that, we're going to do some sizing here before we add our image. So I'm going to put my mouse in the middle between the bar chart and the table, and I'm going to click and hold and drag it to the right about that much. So you can clearly see more bar than anything. That's the star of the dashboard, the bar chart. And it got rid of having all of that extra space in the table. And then we'll resize the right side after we get our image in. Now, before you are going to be able to get the image in, you need to know what directory you need to save it in. So I'm going to just show you this on my screen. You don't have to do this yet. There is a file in the video description called learnit.png. And you're going to want to go there and grab that file and cut it. It has to be in a specific directory. And I'm going to tell you the directory that it has to be in. Now I'm going to show it to you. So it needs to be in my Tableau repository. And then there's a folder in your repository called shapes. And within that folder, you need to create another folder and name it my shapes if you don't already have one. And then that my shapes folder is where you want to put that learn it logo. So my Tableau repository shapes my shape. Go ahead and pause the video until you have it there. And now we're ready to add the image. So under objects on your dashboard pane, I'm going to click and hold on image and I want to drag it over. So it's on the lower right underneath the text box. And I'm going to let it go. So now you can insert an image file, which is what we're going to do. And you're going to click on the choose button. And it should take you directly to your My Shapes directory. And I'm going to just double click the Learn It logo. And then I'm going to click Center Image under Options. And for Alt Text, I'm going to say Learn It logo. And I'm going to do OK. So now we have the little logo there and we can resize things. I'm going to put my mouse between the table and the text box and I'm going to drag upwards. So I'm kind of getting rid of that blank space. And then I'm going to put my mouse between the text box and the logo and drag upward a bit as well. So there you have it. You have your dashboard, you have your dynamic titles, you have your sales by category and subcategory dashboard title up there. And the thing is, is we can also connect the table 
so that it's filtered as well when we make a selection. So go ahead and select your table. I selected office supplies in a table, but it doesn't matter. And on the right side of it, you want to click that filter button so you're not using it as a filter. And then in my bar chart, anything I click, not only does the title update, well, at this point, subtitle, not only does that update, but the table will update as well. So all the focus right now is on office supplies. And that's why it says here, it will also filter based on your bar selections. So we made that happen. All right. Now I'm going to just click away so I get my full scheme of everything back and save your file. So we're going to create another dashboard, but before we do so, we want to copy our pie chart. So I'm on the pie chart sheet. I'm going to hold down my control key and click on the sheet tab and drag it to the right of itself to make a copy. So on the copy, the first thing we're going to do is edit the title. We can leave the word sales there. Just put the word average in front of it. And then on the marks card, we're going to change the sum of sales for the angle and for the size, both of those to averages. So I'm going to right click on the angle one, hover over measure and choose average and do the same for the size one. So instead of recreating the wheel. So the dashboard that we're going to create is going to have two pie charts, a histogram and a table on it. Let's go to our sheet that says average and total sales by market segment. And because the histogram has quantity on it, we're going to grab the quantity field and drag it to text on the marks card. And then what we're going to do is we're going to click on it and we're going to drag it into our table. So you'll see that dashed line and it changes the whole thing. Well, we do want it in a table, so we're going to fix that. So just go to your show me and choose text table. And so in our text table, we have average sales, sales and quantity. So we just need to update the title here. And instead of sheet name, I'm going to put average. I'm going to do a dash average total and quantity of sales. And actually, instead of a dash, I'm going to put a comma between average and total. And click OK. So we have our two pie charts. We have the market segment histogram. And we have this average total and now quantity of sales by market segment. And we're going to put those on a new dashboard. So I'm going to do my new dashboard button. So go ahead and customize the size of your dashboard. I'm using the same size I used on the previous one. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to grab the market segment histogram and drag it into the view. And then we're going to grab our first pie chart and we're going to drag that on the bottom of the view. The second pie chart is going to go to the right of the first one on the bottom half of the view. And then we're going to grab the one that says 
average and total sales by market segment table. And we're going to drag that one. I'm actually going to put it in the middle on the bottom between the two pie charts. And then what I want to do is I can decrease the size. So the market segment histogram, I'm going to put my mouse, I'm going to select that heading. I'm going to put my mouse there and drag it down so it takes up more of the view. Now I went and changed. So, and, and you're going to need to do this because your titles on sales on the two charts are orange and too big. And we want consistency here. So, and I didn't finish modifying mine. So mine are still bold and I don't want them bold. So I'm going to go back to that sheet using the go to sheet for the sales by market segment pie chart. I'm going to go to that sheet, double click the title. Now in your case, if it's still orange and 18 point, you're going to do control a to select everything, make it 11 point, get rid of the bold and make it black and okay. And do the same thing since you're already out here, do the same thing on the second pie chart. We're going to select everything. We don't want it orange. We want it 11 point, not bold and the color black. And now let's go back to our dashboard, our second dashboard. And we can see that the titles match. Now on our previous dashboard, we took away a lot of the titles on our visualizations, but in this case, we're going to leave them there because they're very descriptive as to what the user would be seeing. For our table, we're going to select the table and we're going to go to the toolbar and tell it to fit the width. So it looks a little bit better in there. And we want to format the overall sales and the average sales cards. So I'm going to click on overall sales, do the drop down arrow format. And I'm going to give it that light orange shading and I'm going to do, have you do the same for the average sales one. And we should probably color the market segment legend as well. Let's see if it, uh, let me format that. Yeah. So that one's selected. I can do that one as well. Just for consistency. Now we want to show the dashboard title. So we're going to go to dashboard, show title, double click the title, get rid of that sheet name placeholder. And we're going to type market segment information and click OK. And we'll name the dashboard sheet market segment. All right, two dashboards just like that. I'm going to go ahead and close this format legends panel and save. So another part of guided analytics is packing your tool tips with details. So I am on the sum and profit by year line chart, dual line chart. This is going to end up on a dashboard with our what if line chart. And so we're going to make some modifications to it first. So I want the colors to align a little bit better between the two charts. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the measure names legend and edit the colors. And we want to make profit orange and sales a darker green because that's what's on our what if chart. 
And then over in your marks card, you're going to select sum of sales and we're going to get rid of those mark labels. So I'm going to uncheck that. Doesn't make sense to have them on just one. And we're going to go to size for the sum of sales. And I'm going to grab that bar and drag it to the right. And you'll see two tick marks. I want it right in between those two tick marks. And then in the marks card, I'm going to click on some profit and make the size the same as we did for sales. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to just to be consistent, we're going to go to the measure names legend and format it. And we're going to give it that light, really pale orange shading like we've been doing so far. So now if you hover over any line on any mark, you'll see that everything that's in the view is automatically included in the tool tip. So we have the order date, we have the sales. And if I hover over profit, we have the order date and we have the profit because those are the three fields that are in the view. Well, we want to add more to the tool tip. So in your marks card, we're on the sum of profit mark and we're going to go to tool tip. And so you see it has the plain text, the year of order date, and then it has the field year order date and it has profit and sum of profit. So I'm going to click at the end of sum of profit and press enter. And I'm going to say just regular text since, and I don't want it bold. So I'll get rid of that. I'm going to say since 2020 profit is correlating with sales most of the time, something like that. And then click OK. So now when I hover over a mark on profit, I'm seeing more information. Let's go ahead and save. And I'm going to get rid of that format pane on the left. We're going to modify its tool tip. So I'm going to click at the end of sum of sales and press enter. And I'm going to type in not bold. I'm going to type for more detail C and a colon, a couple of spaces. Then I'm going to use the insert drop down at the top, hover over sheets, and you're going to go to the sheet that is sales and profit by subcategory and click it. And in this case, it doesn't really matter whether we make it bold, but I like consistency. So I'm going to make that part of it bold and we're going to do okay. So now when we hover over a sales mark, it says for more, it gives you the year, the sales, and for more details, see, and it gives you a little thumbnail of that page, that sheet page that we directed it to. So that's what it means by adding more detail to your tool tips. You're not limited to what's on them. And so since we're here, I'm going to go back to sheet sorter view. Just easier sometimes to find sheets in that view. And we're going to go to what if sales. And let's put it up to like six points or 6%. And by the way, since we're here, let's do the drop down on that slider and we're going to format it and we're going to give it the pale orange shading. And it doesn't seem to do anything. Hmm. Interesting. Let's try to measure names one format legends. Very interesting. I'm going to try it again because maybe I didn't click on it properly. So format parameters. Nope, the shading is showing there. It's just not showing up in the parameter. That's fine. I'm not going to worry about that right now. 
So I'm going to make this go like maybe to eight. I definitely want to separate the lines. So if we hover over to what if, that's what it's going to say, right? Sales if. And then I want to hover over one of the sales lines, right? And it just gives the month, year of order date and the sales. So for this one, for the tool tip, so the measure names are grouped together. So we're going to have whatever we put in a tool tip is going to be for both. So we're going to go to the tool tip. Notice it says measure values, right? And we're going to click at the end of that, press enter, take the bold off. And we're going to type C and then we're going to just do a colon, two spaces. We're going to go to our insert menu, hover over sheets. And under sheets, we're going to select our other line chart that we were just working on, which is called sum and profit by year. And we're going to click OK. And now if you hover over either uh, any of the marks, you'll see that it says it has that there as well. Little thumbnail of that. Okay, save your file. So we have one other thing to cover that's under guided analytics. And let's go to any bar chart. So I'm going to count of products. And you'll notice if, and we've been doing this throughout, but if I click on for number of products, if I click on consumer bar, right? It filters everything else out other than consumer. And that's called filter by selection. We've been doing it the whole time, right? So that's a filter by selection action. When you click on one thing, it could be a pie chart, it could be a map, it could be anything really. It filters out all the other data. And to get all the other data back, you can just click outside of the visualization. So let's say you have your two dashboards built and management wants to see where you are right now. So you're going to do a presentation for them. But before doing so, you want to give it a little bit more formatting. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up to the dashboard menu and we're going to choose format. And on the pane on the left where it says dashboard shading, let's do the drop down and select that pale orange color. So now all the edges around everything has that pale orange color, right? the actual background of the dashboard itself. I'm gonna have you do a similar thing on your second dashboard on your own. So we're gonna just go to the second dashboard, format pane remains open, and go ahead and do your shading. So it should look like this. It's decreasing a little bit of the white space around the edges. Go ahead and close the format dashboard pane. And another thing that you can do is I'm going to select my histogram on the dashboard. And I can actually right click in a blank area of it and go to format. So on the format font pane underneath, I'm going to go to the paint bucket and you see, I can give the worksheet itself a shading color. So don't do this. Just watch my screen. I'm going to do this green color and you're not seeing it because the worksheet is actually on the dashboard, right? So I'm going to go back to none on that. And so I'm going to try something else. I'm going to say, well, can I shade the pane? And let's see what happens there. And so now it's blending too much into the background color of the worksheet. So what I could do here is I could go to more colors 
and I can mix a different pale orange color, a little bit deeper, and click OK. So now I have a little bit of contrast, and that color now shows up here. So since this is open, go ahead and use that same color for the pane on both of your pie charts. And so on mine, I used it on both of the pie charts as well as the table, but now I can't really see the values in the table. So for the table, I'm still on shading here. I'm gonna go to the letter A, so I get my font choices. And you see the pane has that orange color, right? I'm gonna make it bold, actually gonna make it a little bit bigger. So I'm gonna go to 10 point there. And I probably should make the font color black now. So it shows really well in the table. So now go back to your first dashboard and you wanna shade this bar chart and the table. The text box and the image are both taking on the background dashboard color. So you wanna do the same thing we did on the next dashboard with these two visualizations. And the end result will look something like this. Now these are examples. It depends on what color scheme you need to use and how much you wanna do. But I do like having color on my dashboards. Go ahead and save your file and then we'll mimic what we're gonna to do to present to the managers these two dashboards. So there are a few other fixes that can be done on here, but you know the steps to take to do the fixes. I'm gonna go ahead and close the format shading. And this is something that you've seen before, but since we were working, only when we were working with the sheets, not in a dashboard view. So if we wanted to show our managers these two dashboards, we could use presentation mode, which we used in sheet view. So I'm gonna go ahead and click it on the toolbar. And so this dashboard comes up, right? and the managers can look at it and give their thoughts on it. And then using my film strip at the bottom, I can just show the other one. And of course, this would be hooked up to a flat screen or a projector screen in a conference room somewhere. So they can give their feedback on your dashboards. And again, to get out of presentation mode, you can press escape on your keyboard. So when we did our first pie chart, that's when you learned how to put a caption on it. And the caption doesn't come over to the dashboard with it. We actually made a copy of that sheet. So both of the pie charts have a caption on them. On your dashboard panel on the left, hover over the first pie chart and then click the go to sheet button. And you could see the caption at the bottom didn't come over to the dashboard. So I went back to sheet tabs here, but I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna just go to the end and go back to my market segment dashboard. And so what we can do here, it kind of have to play this out a little bit. If I go to the worksheet menu, I would have to show, and this actually to make sure that your sales by market segment chart is selected. And when you go to the worksheet menu here from within your dashboard, you can click on show caption and then the caption will come in. Now I want to show you something because this was frustrating to me until I learned better, right? If I don't have let me just not have anything selected. And I go to worksheet, everything is dimmed out. So you won't be able to get to show caption. You have to be able to have something selected. We don't need it on the second pie chart. 
but we have that caption would really like to increase home office sales. Any ideas? So we were able to bring that over. So we've added annotations on one of our maps before, but we're going to do it here on that first pie chart. I'm going to click on the home office segment and right click and choose annotate and I'm annotating the mark, right? So it has the market segment and the sum of sales in there. And what I want to do is add a line that says, let's get these values up by the end of 2023, something like that and click okay. So now you see the annotation like a pop out, just like we did it on a map, right? shows up as a pop out and I'm going to kind of move it over a little bit and size it down a bit. And actually, since the values already show in the tool tip, I'm going to edit the annotation and I'm going to remove everything except what we typed in. just so it doesn't take up so much space. And I centered that and I'm going to click OK. So now I can just increase the width of it a bit, move it over a bit. So when I click away from it, it's clear that it's pointing to that slice of the pie. And it just has that. Let's get these values up by the end of 2023 annotation. And this section is called notes and annotations. So we did the annotation here on a dashboard. Let's go back to our first dashboard. And this text box gives us the ability to put in notes and you can have multiple text boxes on a dashboard. Go ahead and save your file. So our next topic is using external data to enrich your dashboard. Let's go ahead and bring up a new dashboard window and go ahead and get your size the way it needs to be. And don't worry, I didn't forget that I said that we're going to use a dashboard for our two different dual line charts, but for right now, I'm going in order of the outline. So we're at using external data and then we have one more topic in this module in the next module is when we'll use those line charts. So for this one, using external data, what we're going to do is we're going to use the sales by state map, drag it onto the view. And the first thing I'm going to do is select the annotation for Pennsylvania. And I'm going to just drag it down just a little bit so we can see New York. And I'm going to right click on New York and go to annotate the mark. And we're just going to put high value in front of state province like we did on the other annotations on this map. And click OK. And then I'm going to click on New York again so that everything else comes back into the view fully. Now I'm looking at this and I see one other circle that's comparable in size to Texas. So annotate Washington the same way we have the other annotations. Annotate Washington State on your own. Now I'm going to decrease the width of the map a little bit because notice on the right it's cutting off our cards. So we don't want that to happen. And on the map, I'm going to just zoom out a little bit 
so that everything that is important to us is still visible. I can actually widen this just a little bit more. I want to make sure that right panel is wide enough to show everything. So since this is where we did a data layer of the 2018 population, that was the latest one that it had in there for us, we are going to use external data to enrich this dashboard. And so what we're going to do is we are going to grab the web page object on the left. And I'm going to drag it, try to get it on the bottom. Yeah, we're going to put it on the bottom for right now. We'll move it when we're done. And so I'm going to type in a URL here. It's starting with the HTTPS colon two slashes. And it's World Population Review all together dot com slash states. And go ahead and click OK. So this is cool on my end, it's still loading some information, but I can scroll down. It actually gives you a window where you're actually seeing the web page on here. Now, because we really want our map to be the focal point of this, we are going to remove that web page object. So on its right, go ahead and remove from dashboard. And we're going to get a link on here to the web page in a different way. So we're going to go up to the dashboard menu and choose actions. And this is just like, so you know, it generates actions on its own, depending on what you do. And so we already did an action and we went to the learn it website. We already did a web action. We're going to add another one. We're going to click on add action, go to URL and we're going to name this population information. And the source sheet is dashboard three. And we are going to leave it on menu. You saw the choices, you know, you don't want to hover. And we're going to choose to have it open in a new browser tab. So all we have to do is type world population review dot com slash states world population review dot com slash states and we're going to click OK and OK so in here the only place you can't right click and see it on the menu is on an annotation so I can right click in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico if I want to and you'll see that we have learn it on the menu as well as population information. And you can go there to make sure that the link is correct. So it opens in a browser tab and you can go through the information and at the bottom there's a table. So this is updated population information by state. Again, the data layer that we used on our map was from 2018. So we can just have this hyperlink here or this URL on our menu so that people can get the updated information. So you saw two ways of doing it. And we chose this way because we want the map to just be on that dashboard. You can go ahead and close the browser window. All right, let's name this dashboard sales by state map.
And then we're going to get rid of the title from the sheet. So I'm going to just right click on the title and hide the title. And now we're going to go to the dashboard menu and choose show title. So we don't need a redundant title there. I'm going to actually double click the dashboard title. Like it's centered. Yeah, it's centered over the whole sheet. So that's good. And we can cancel. And now you're going to save again. And our last topic is dashboards and dates. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new sheet. So this is a similar but easier process from when we created the dynamic title for category, right? This, what we're going to do here is we're going to create a title that shows today's date whenever today is at the top of the dashboard. So in order to do that, we're going to create a calculated field on this blank sheet. And we're going to name the field today. And we're going to type the function today and click OK. So now we're going to drag the today calculated field. And just another point here, I'm going to actually scroll up. If I want to search for a field, I have a search box at the top of my field list. So I can go in there and type TO and it scrolls down until I can see the today field. So I'm going to grab that today field and I'm going to drag it onto detail on the marks card. And then it says the year of today. So I'm going to right click on that pill and I'm going to hover over more and select custom and in the drop down I'm going to select month day year and click OK. So now it's the month day and year of today. Now we're going to double click the title on that sheet to get in and edit it. We're going to get rid of the sheet name placeholder here. And we're going to go to the insert drop down. And at the bottom, we're going to select MDY today. And we're going to click OK. So let's name this sheet today title. It's like we have a category title sheet title does not have two E's at the end of it. And go ahead and create a new dashboard sheet. Go ahead and adjust your size. And we're going to drag today title into the view. And we are going to go and fit it to the width of the view. And then whatever else we add to the dashboard in the next module will size it so it covers the little box that's there for the detail and it just has the date at the top. Go ahead and save your file. In module 12, you learned about using dashboards to get results. We started with an explanation of guided analytics with Tableau. Guided analytics make it easier to navigate a dashboard. It increases accessibility and clarity, increases usability of the content you've created, 
and it helps the audience glean valuable insights faster, as well as helping them transition to using visual analytics. We created several different things that encapsulate guided analytics, including customizing filter titles for clarity, encouraging action with captions on worksheets, tracking filter selections with dynamic titles, drilling down with filter actions, packing tool tips with details, and having greater control with filter by selection. Then you learned that you can use presentation view in your dashboards as well as the worksheets. We definitely did some more annotations and we used a text box to capture some notes. And then we connected to a website to give more up-to-date detail on population data for the United States. We ended by creating a title sheet that will automatically display today's date on a dashboard. In module 13, we'll be putting the dash in dashboards. In lesson one, we'll be choosing our visualization. We've already kind of gone through that process, but I have another example for us to do that in this module. Then we're gonna be using parameters in dashboards. You're gonna learn how to profit from big data to rev your visualization, filtering your data for focus, and in the final lesson, we'll be creating choices in dashboards using conditional logic. So to get started with choosing your visualization, I've gone to the sales by month over time sheet, and we're gonna make a copy of this sheet. So I always do it by dragging it while holding the control key. So I'm gonna just drag it to the right of it. And on this one, we want to make some changes. So in the column shelf, we're gonna right click on month of order date, hover over more, choose custom, and we're gonna go to the drop down and we're gonna select month slash year and click OK. So this is our animated visualization and now we've given it more detail. And if you notice on your column shelves, it says my order date, which is month year order date. Now we're going to remove month of order date from the pages shelf, because now we're using month year, and we're gonna copy month year from columns to the pages shelf, so that now its history will be correct, month year, instead of just by month. And for clarity, we're gonna change the title on your history control over there. We're gonna edit the title, we want it to be more specific. So, or more clear, we're gonna name it month slash year order date and click okay. So now we're gonna go back to the dashboard we created where we put the today title at the top. And we're looking for our sales by month over time two sheet, but before we drag it onto the view, let's right click on it and we can rename it from here. So we're gonna call it sales by month slash year over time and get rid of the two at the end. And now I'm gonna drag it onto the view on the bottom half. And then I'm not gonna try to move it, I'm gonna resize it. So I have my mouse at the top, the double white arrow, 
and I'm going to just drag it up until the blue box from detail on the today title sheet is covered. So we'll always have today's date whenever it is at the top. And then we want to pair this with our what if sales. So let's drag that on and put it on the right side of the dashboard because what if sales is also in the month year format, which is why we made a copy and made this in the same format in terms of the date. So then so that we can view more of the information, I'm going to take what if sales and drag it to the bottom underneath sales by month, year over time. So one is right above the other and we can see more of it. So this is definitely going to need some captioning or text boxes. What you want to do is use those things either to get people to start doing analysis, like how can we increase these sales by this category or to give them instruction on how to use the dashboard sheet. So make sure that your sales by month, year over time visualization is selected. And we're going to go to the worksheet menu and choose show caption. So we get a caption for that visualization. Double click the caption and we'll use the caption to describe what the visualization is showing. And after we're done with captioning, we'll use text boxes to give guidance on how to use the right panel. So for this one, we need to give a full explanation. So this is an animated viz that will show sales by month slash year over time. You can use the controls on the upper right to play the viz and, and animate it. And we'll give more detail in a text box on the right pane. And we can go ahead and I think I want to select all of that text. And I want to make it orange. And I'm going to click OK. And I'm going to double click it again. I'm also going to make it bold so it pops out just a little bit more. OK. And now you want to make sure what if sales is selected. We're going to go back to worksheet, show caption. Let's double click the caption for this one, the trends of sales and sales if for order date. All right, we can keep that part, but before, and I'm going to put this viz is showing the trends of sales and we're going to change sales if to projected sales by percent for the month slash year of the order date. And then I can get rid of that MY at the end of that. And then color shows details about sales and projected sales. And you know, after that one in parentheses, I'm going to put sales if, because that's what's showing on the color legend on the right. And I'm going to select it 
and make it orange and bold. And okay. Now we're going to add a floating text box and we're going to end up having it in the bottom of the right pane. It's going to explain the controls in the right pane. So we'll make it floating after we get it on there. So let's go ahead and grab the text object and drag it onto the lower right side of the visualization. You want to make it left aligned instead of its default of center. And you can pause the video and copy the text that's on my screen in the text box. I've made it bold and orange like we did in the captions as well. Once you have it in, we're going to go ahead and click OK on the text box. And then since it's selected at the bottom of the objects, we're going to click floating. We're going to grab our text box and drag it over into the right pane and drop it. So it's right underneath the controls. Now what you can do is Save your file. And I formatted the parameter, the slider parameter, and gave it some shading. I'm going to go ahead and close that panel. Now we're going to add some big data to a dashboard. So let's bring up a new dashboard and go ahead and size it accordingly. And on this one, we're not really going to use a sheet here. So you saw an example of this before, but we didn't keep it. We decided to do a dashboard action instead. This time, we're going to use a web page for our dashboard. So you go ahead and grab your web page object and drag it on. And the URL here is HTTPS, your colon, slash, slash, trading economics dot com slash United dash states slash retail dash sales. So this is sample superstore data. We have sales, we have customers. We want to know what's trending in the United States in terms of retail sales. So we're going to go ahead and click OK. And I went ahead and closed the ad that popped up, but you can see here it has a summary, calendar, forecast, stats. You can download information from here. It's data from November, 2022, but there is historical data going back to 1992. So if you're into retail sales, a lot of this could be useful big data information that could help you maybe head in a different direction or look at different ways to achieve newer goals, so on and so forth. So this is the sum total of this dashboard. It's filled with a web page. So let's add a dashboard title, which we can also do underneath the objects pane. And we'll call it, and this data is, I believe, from the Census Bureau. Well, there's actually different sources. This data up here is from U.S. Census Bureau. So we're going to go ahead and edit the title. And we'll say that this is Trading 
economics big data, something like that. And I'm going to select the text, make it bold and make it orange or whatever color you happen to be using and go ahead and click OK. And I'm going to just name the dashboard tab Big Data. Now we're going to get into filtering your data for focus. And I'm on the Analyzing by Region and Customer sheet. We're going to create another sheet that shows the count of customers by region. So let's go ahead and grab a new sheet. And for this one, we're going to drag the region field to rows. And we're going to drag customer last, which is in our customer and market segment hierarchy. Now we're going to drag that to text. And then we're going to right click on that pill. And we're going to hover over measure and choose count. We're going to right click that pill again and go to format. We want to format the numbers. So we're going to do the numbers drop down. We're going to choose number custom, get rid of the decimal places. And at the bottom, uncheck include thousand separators. And we can close the format panel. And now we want to drag region to color. So the numbers adopt the color for each region. Now let's go ahead and hide the field labels on that table for the rows. We don't need them there. And let's name this sheet. I'm using the pound sign for number number of customers per region. And then we're going to edit the title to just say number of customers. And go ahead and make it bold and orange. And click OK. So now let's go ahead and create a new dashboard sheet. And let's drag our analyzing by region and customer sheet onto the view. Now we don't want our little table to take up any space in the view itself. So we're going to grab that number of customers by region. Drag it onto the right side of the view temporarily and then make it floating. And once it's floating, drag it into the right pane like we did the text boxes earlier so that the actual visualization can show in its entirety in the view. Now something else we're going to do here on the right side Let's go to our first choice parameter and select it. Go to its drop down arrow and we're going to format parameters. And we want to give them that light orange shading. So both of those are done. So this way we can go ahead and close format parameters. And what we want to do is we want to go to our number of customers and select it. And we're going to click on the funnel. And we're going to do the same thing for analyzing by region and customer. So now if we click on any mark on our visualization, the table will filter. And we can click on the mark again to get everything else back. Now, this is the one where 
We have dynamic axes, sales and discount, because those are the choices. And we're going to put a text box over on the right pane to explain how to use the choices. We're still on floating. So go ahead and grab your text object and you can drag it right over to the right pane, even though it's going to open up the edit text box, make it left aligned, And I'm going to go ahead and do bold and orange before I start typing here. And so the text is going to be use the first and second choice drop downs to change the Y axis and X axis accordingly. And go ahead and click OK. So now we just have to size it correctly. I might have to move it over a little bit. Size it correctly so it fits in that pane. And then we're going to select our visualization. We're going to go to worksheet, show caption. So it comes up with when reading the tooltip, placeholder one represents the value of your first choice and placeholder two is for your second choice. I think I might've put that somewhere in before. So make sure your caption says that just to give. So when you hover over any of the marks, it shows placeholder one and placeholder two. So we're explaining what they represent. I want to add on to that caption by saying your axes will update according to your choices and okay. So we can go ahead and get rid of hide the title for the visualization. And then let's show our dashboard title. And we're going to edit it to say, and get rid of that sheet name placeholder. We're going to edit it to say analyzing by region and customer. And of course, I'm going to make it bold and orange. Now should have just named the sheet because it had that placeholder in there, but go ahead and name the dashboard tab, the same thing. In module 13, we started by creating a copy of our animated visualization and we changed the date format to match our what if sales visualization and we placed both of them on the same dashboard. We created captions for each visualization to explain the intent of the visualization. And then we added a text box in the right pane so that we can explain how to use the animation controls and the what if slider to change the percentage of projected sales. The what if viz used parameters. Then we moved on to profiting from big data. And we did that by adding an industry web page to a dashboard. We moved on to filtering your data for focus. And it was combined with creating choices in dashboards using conditional logic. 
So we started that one by creating another sheet that was a text table showing the number of customers per region. And we used that as a companion to our analyzing by region and customer viz. We actually put the text table in the right pane so that the visualization could fill the entire view. We also created text boxes to explain the controls in the right panel. And this one was using conditional logic because this is the one where we created dynamic axes and they had parameters where whatever their first and second choices are will change the title of the axes. In this extensive course, we started by connecting to a variety of data sources, in particular text, Excel, and Access Database data sources. You learned about the concept of guided analytics and what that can involve. And then we went into showing the captions, customizing filter titles for clarity, and you learned how to create dynamic titles so that they change based on what's being chosen. You also learned how to share your results in a meeting by using presentation view. And we added some notes using text boxes and more annotations. We also created a dashboard with just one item on it, we used a web page so you could use external data. And that's where we put the world population review by states. And then we created a sheet where we could have today's date showing at the top. And we could use that on a dashboard as well. And we did. We started putting the dash into dashboards. So we put sales by month over time, our animated visualization on the same dashboard with what if sales. We use captions and text boxes and to explain to the users what's going on on the dashboard. And then we added the sales by state cross tab to the right pane on an existing dashboard. You learned how to profit from big data to rev your visualization. And that's where we use that trading economics um, website. We learned how to filter your data for focus and creating choices in dashboards using conditional logic. So we bought that first choice and second choice sheet onto a dashboard. You learned the difference between using tiled or floating on a dashboard. When you use tiled, it kind of maps the grid, the left side, the right side, the top, the bottom, the middle, that kind of thing. Floating, you can place it anywhere you need to place it. Hello everyone, I am Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to Tableau Video Training Course. Tableau is a visual analytics platform that makes it easier for people to explore and manage data and faster to discover and share insights that can change businesses and the world. It helps people and organizations be more data-driven. Tableau supports data prep, analysis, governance, collaboration, and more. As a continuation of the Tableau introduction video training course, this advanced course is designed to boost the student's competence when it comes to creating visualizations and creating dashboards. The course goes into considerable detail on these two subjects and explores, among other areas, how to create a range of different charts, maps, user-defined fields, as well as a host of advanced features and abilities. 
We'll start by connecting to a variety of data sources. This will leave you with some great workbooks to practice on and develop on your own after this course. We'll also cover making dashboards relevant and some visual best practices that you can use throughout your Tableau career. We'll end with other ways to publish your dashboards and how to mobilize them. In module 14, we'll focus on making dashboards relevant. In the first lesson, we're going to do some string manipulation on dashboards. In lesson two, we'll review how to correct data exports from Tableau to Excel if you have any problems. So to warn you about a situation you could perhaps run into in the future. In lesson three, we're going to blend data. We have two Excel files in the files for video description that we'll be using data blending file one and data blending file two. In lesson four, you'll learn and use some optimizing tips for efficient, fast visualization. And in our last lesson, we're going to add an infographic to a dashboard. And for that, there is a shapes folder in the files for video description. You're going to want to access those shapes. And so just have that folder open when we get to lesson five. At the bottom of this slide, I have a link to a website where you can grab some more infographic images that you can play around with on your own. We're going to use several of the ones that are in the shapes folder, but some of them we're not going to use. We're going to use some in this module and some in the next module, but it will still leave you some to play with. I have brought up a new dashboard sheet, but before I did that, I named the sheet tab for the previous one analyzing by region and customer dash. Since there's already a sheet, as you've seen previously with that name, you can't have two sheets with the same name. So I just added dash at the end of the sheet tab. Now on this dashboard, before we start building it, I just want to show you something. If you go to the analysis menu, you'll notice from the dashboard, you could only edit a calculated field. You can't create one. So we want to create a calculated field for string manipulation. We'll come back to this dashboard, but in the meantime, bring up a new sheet. When we first started working with the sample Superstore data, one of the first things we did from the data source tab is we split the customer name into customer first and customer last. Now we have a need to have them as customer name again. Also, we'd like to have the region and then the state all combined. So we're going to actually create two calculated fields here. You can either go to analysis or to our usual drop down and let's create a calculated field. And we're going to name this field customer name. And it's a really simple calculation. In Tableau, you use the plus sign for concatenation and you have to concatenate in any spaces that you want between the first and the last name as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to start typing customer first. And then we're going to do a plus sign. And then we're going to do a single quote space, single quote, another plus sign, and then customer last. So we're saying we want the customer first name and we want a space between it and the customer last name. Now let's see while we're having, okay. So we can't name this customer name because that field already exists. And even though we hit it, it's still in our data source. So we're going to name this 
I'm going to just abbreviate it to cust name. And now we can click OK. Now we're going to drag cust name. It's fine there. I guess it'll be fine there right now on the rose shelf. So you can see that each customer name has a space in between the first and the last one. If we didn't do that single quote space single quote, if we just did customer first plus customer last, it would be all mushed together. And sometimes I work so fast, I forget to put the space in and then I look at it and I go back in and edit the field. So we could have gone back to the data source view and unhid customer name so that we'd be able to use it again, but wanted to show you how to concatenate. So I have one more concatenation example for you here. We're gonna put the region and the state together, and that doesn't already exist in our data set. So this is a more valid use of concatenation. So we're gonna create another calculated field And this one we're going to call region slash state. And so it's the same thing. We're going to grab the region field. And I do our plus sign. And then I want to concatenate in a slash. So I'm going to do the single quote slash single quote another plus sign, and then grab the state province field, not the group. And go ahead and click OK. So the first thing we want to do is we want to grab the region state field that we just created. And we want to add it to the hierarchy of location under region. So one thing I can do is I can click on its down arrow, hover over hierarchy, add to hierarchy, and we're going to select location. So it will put it at the bottom of the location hierarchy and we can just drag it up so it's after region. Now let's drag region state to the filter shelf and we're going to select all and click OK. And now we're going to right click on that filter and show the filter. So I'd like you to change that filter to a multiple value drop down filter. And so it should look like the one on my screen. Now we're going to find our sales field and drag it onto text. And then we want to format our sales numbers so we want them to look like currency with two decimal places. So we're going to right click on the sum of sales pill, go to format, under default go to numbers, we're going to choose currency standard because I believe that comes with the two decimal places, yes it does. And so we can click away from there and close that format pane. So when we look at our drop down for our region state filter, we see that the region is combined with the state and they're separated by the slash. So if I wanted to, I could filter for something. I'm going to uncheck all and I'm going to filter for East New York. So here are the customers and the sales from the East region and from New York State. And then I'm going to go back and choose all. The other thing we want to do with that filter is we want to format it so we can give it the shading that we've been using. And we can close that format. And what we'll do is we'll name this sheet customer 
sales by region slash state. And go ahead and save. So I've dragged that onto our waiting dashboard sheet. And now when I go to the analysis menu, I can create a calculated field from the dashboard because it's going to be attached to this sheet. When it's a blank dashboard, all you can do is edit existing calculated fields. So if I wanted to edit the calculated field that we created called cuss name, I can just access it from this list. But what I'm going to have you do is create another calculated field and call it customer last and first. How about that? Customer last and first. So I'm going to have you do that on your own while I'm doing it on my side. So your calculation should look like mine, except the second one should be customer first. I grabbed the wrong one. And I concatenated the comma space in there. And I'm going to go ahead and choose OK. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this sheet from the listing of sheets on the right side. And I'm going to swap out customer name for customer last first. And it looks like we have a customer that doesn't have a first name. So now we're seeing this one up at the top. It looks like it doesn't have a last name and the first name is after the comma. So the first name is Corey dash lock. I guess they just said it's like Madonna with just one name. So now when I go back to our dashboard, it will have updated because we made the swap at the sheet level. And we don't really need to keep this as a dashboard. So I'm going to go over to the right side of it, go to the more options drop down and choose remove from dashboard. And we'll leave this dashboard here for future use. So now I'm back in sorter view because I want us to go to the sales aggregate sheet. And we're going to modify it somewhat. So before we get into this, we're talking about correcting data exports from Tableau to Excel. So sometimes when you export to Excel as a cross tab, when you open it in Excel, the data could be out of the order that you intend it to be. And so the reason why that happens is that Tableau will arrange it first by dimensions, then by measures, and each of those are arranged alphabetically. So it really depends on the amount of data you have. I don't know if I can force this issue with the data, but we'll see what happens when we finish modifying the sheet and we export it. And I'll show you another tricky wicket as concerns exporting as a cross tab to Excel along the way. So the first thing we want to do on this sheet is we want to add the sales field to rows five more times. And once we do that, the second one, we want to do the drop down and we want to change the measure to average. For the third one, you're going to go back to the drop down and we want the median. The fourth one, we want the count. The fifth one, we're going to go for the maximum. And the last one, we're going to choose minimum. So, and then we're going to add another field to columns, and that's going to be order date. And we want it in front of market segment. 
and we'll leave it on year. So this is really not an, a lot of data. I mean, we have several measures on here. We have a date. We have one dimension. We'd probably need a lot more things on here for it to mess up when it will require a correction in Excel. So now we're on the worksheet menu. We're going to hover over export and we're going to choose cross tab to Excel. So it may take a little bit to load everything into Excel. So this came over pretty clean. I forgot that we had category and color over there. So we actually have two dimensions and six measures and a date. And it came over really cleanly. However, it's not going to perform that way all the time. And you just need to be prepared for that. So it just depends on the data load that it's processing. Now, I mentioned that there's a tricky wicket when it comes to exporting to Excel as a cross tab. So let's leave this Excel book open and it may have opened in the background behind your tableau, but we're gonna leave it open. And I'm gonna bring up the sorter view again. And we'll go to Let's go to pie chart two. And on this one, we're going to go up to worksheet, export, cross tab to Excel. And now, let me minimize this. Now it's going to work. Sometimes if you export to <laughs> Excel, and you haven't saved the previous workbook, it will give you an error message. But of course, because I wanted to show you that error message that says cannot export to Excel as a cross tab, it's usually because you have a sheet hanging out open in the background. But since I'm trying to show you that error, it's not going to happen. So you need to kind of be prepared for that as well. I'm going to close this one and I'm not going to save it. And actually, I'm not going to save either one. So typically, if you have one that's open and hanging out there, it won't let you do another one until you save the previous one or discard it. So just want to prepare you for those situations. So before we get into blending data, I want you to have a little bit of an understanding of blending. So blends, unlike relationships or joins, never truly combine the data. Instead, blends query each data source independently. The results are aggregated to the appropriate level. Then the results are presented visually together in the view. Because of this, blends can handle different levels of detail and working with published data sources. They're also established individually on every sheet and can never be published because there is no true blended data source, simply blended results from multiple data sources in a visualization. Data blending is particularly useful when the blend relationship linking fields need to vary on a sheet by sheet basis or when combining published data sources. So we have those two Excel files that are in the video description that we're going to be using for this data blending file one and data blending file two. So if you haven't already grabbed them, you want to put them in whatever directory you've been using for those files. And we're going to open both files before we actually go back to Tableau and blend the data. So on the left side of my screen, I have data blending file one. I'm just going to adjust that column. 
And then on the right side, I have data blending file two. So in the first one, the tab is employee data. It has the name, the employee ID, and the salary. In file two, it also has the name and the employee ID, but in addition, it has a department ID and a bonus. So we're going to blend this data so that we can use fields from each file in the same visualization. You can go ahead and close both of those Excel files. and bring Tableau back up. Now in Tableau, what we want to do is save Sample Superstore Live again, and we're going to go to File, Close. We will be using it again. So you want to bring the first file in from Excel. So we're going to go on connect to Microsoft Excel, and we want to grab data blending file one. So it brings us to the data source view and we're going to go to sheet one. And the way this works is you bring in the first file and you drag a field from that file into the view. So we're going to drag the name field to rows. And then we're going to go to the data menu and choose new data source. And we're going to go ahead and grab the second blending file from Excel. So when we bring that in, it also brings us to data source view and we're going to go to sheet one. So now at the top, we can see that we have two different data sources here, file one and file two. Now, the File two is what we're currently on. And you'll notice to the right of the name field, there is a orange link. It looks more red to me, but it's described as orange. And that means it's blending them based on the name field at this point. Now, sometimes you might see a gray link and that would mean there's something wrong with the connection between the files or no link, which means it wasn't able to automatically detect for some reason the common file or find name in the other file for some reason. So if that happens, if you don't have the, the orange link, you would want to go to data, edit blend relationships, and notice over here, it's showing both name fields, right? It's saying the primary data source and the secondary data source. But sometimes if that's not there, you would have to go to custom, add, and then you would be able to choose name. And once you do that and you okay, so I did it and it's going to replace it with the same one. So I'm going to say, okay. And that's only because it did map it, but if you have to map it, that's the way you would do it. And you would just okay your way out of there. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna display my show me pane. And I'm on the second data source and I wanna drag bonus. I'm gonna drag it right in to the table. It's going to change the type of this. That's why I have show me open. I'm going to force it back into a text table. And then I'm going to go to the first data source 
And now you see that we added a field from the second data source. It has the orange check mark on it. I'm back on the first data source and we're going to just drag salary into the table and it didn't change it. It left it as a table. That's cool. And then we're going to go back to the second data source. And we want to drag in department ID and employee ID. And then we want to arrange them. So I'm going to click on the employee ID header and hold, and I'm going to just drag it over and drop it in front of bonus. Then I'm going to put department ID to the right of employee ID. Salary, I want to be after department ID. So you should have employee ID, department ID, salary, and bonus. Now take a look at Yana. Yana wasn't on both of those sheets. So she was on the department sheet, but she wasn't on the other sheet. And so we'll say that she left the company, but she wasn't removed from the sheet. So I'm going to right click on Yana and choose exclude. And I can collapse show me now. And let's go ahead and name that sheet data blending. And you can save the workbook with the same name. And then we can go to File, Close. And we're going to reopen Sample Superstore Live. So our last lesson in this module is optimizing tips for efficient, fast visualizations. And so the first tip is reduce the scope. The fewer sheets and data sources, the faster your viz will perform. You would also want to consider limiting the number of filters. Each filter in the view requires a query in order to populate the options. If you add a lot of interactive filters, it can cause the dashboard to take a long time to render. Also reduce the number of marks. More marks mean more processing power and memory to render. Keep in mind that too many data points can reduce the visual analytics value by causing information overload. To avoid this, compile related views and connect them with action filters so you can go from an overview to a more granular view as you explore the data. And you would also want to remove any unneeded dimensions from the detail shelf. So let's use an optimizing tip. Let's go back to our sales by state map dashboard. And I should have pointed this out earlier. The dashboard tabs have the plus sign in the box in front of them. So I'm going to go to sales by state dashboard. And I'd put the sales by state cross tab as floating over in the right pane. So an optimization tip would be not to do that, right? So I'm going to select that sales by state cross tab. And if you hadn't put it there, you could, you know, do this just to undo it. And I'm going to do the drop down arrow and I'm going to remove it from the dashboard. And I'm going to use a dashboard action instead to connect to that cross tab. So I'm going to go up to the dashboard menu, click on actions, and we're going to add an action and the action is go to sheet. So we're going to name this 
sales by state cross tab. So the source sheets is the sales by state map dashboard. And then the target sheet down here, we want to look for that sales by state cross tab. Now for this one, we could put it on a menu or we could put it on select. I think the menu gives you better control and I'm going to click OK and I'm going to click OK. So now instead of having that additional data on the dashboard, I can right click anywhere on my map and you'll see that the sales by state cross tab is on the menu. And when I click on it, it takes me to that sheet. And we can go back to our sales by state dashboard because they want to do something a little bit different. And so because we took that off and we put it on the menu, it might be a good idea to have a caption or a text box explaining that you, you know, for the end user that they can right click to get to that. So I'm going to go ahead and add a caption for that one. So I'm going to worksheet show caption. And actually, I think we should keep the caption that's there, except that we're going to select all of it, make it bold, make it orange, and we'll use a text box to explain how to get to the other sheet from here. So I'm going to choose floating grab the text box and I'll put it over on the right and then we'll have to resize it down. I'm going to make it left justified and I'm going to type right click on this to go to the sales by state cross tab. sheet for another view of this information. And then of course, I'm going to select it, make it bold, make it orange. And then I'll just size it so that it fits over on the right. And we can go ahead and save our file. Whenever you access a dashboard sheet and it takes a little while to render, once it does, just as a reminder, you can look down on the left side of the status bar to see how many marks are on the dashboard. If you have an exorbitant amount of marks on a dashboard, it's going to take up more processing time. So that's when you want to think about other ways like that dashboard action that we just used. If you have additional supporting information, it would be better to leave it on its own sheet and not overwhelm the dashboard. Now we're going to do something really interesting. We're going to add an infographic to your Tableau dashboard. On the module slide, I showed you the link where you'll be able to access more shapes. Now we're not going to use all of the shapes that you put in your files for video description shape files in this module. We'll use some in this module. We'll use some in the next module. And then there's a few extra ones in there for you to play with on your own. 
So I have all of the ones from the video description selected and I'm going to hold down my control key. And this is my Tableau repository shapes, my shapes folder where we put the learn it logo earlier. So I want to hold down control and copy all of these shapes into my Tableau repository shapes, my shape. Otherwise we won't be able to access them. And now we can go ahead and bring up Tableau. The first thing we need to do is create a new sheet. And let's add region to color. And we're going to drag sales to rows. On our marks card, we're going to change the shape from automatic to shape. And then we're going to click on the shape mark and we're going to choose more shapes. And over on the right, the first thing you're going to want to do, well, I'll show you this so you'll know if you forget what to do. So let's do the drop down next to default and we're going to select my shapes. Now, even though we drag those into the my shapes folder, they're not showing because down here you have to reload the shapes. And now you're seeing all the shapes in that folder. So what we're going to do is we're going to select the data item and I'm going to use the people shapes and we'll select the blue one and just click okay. So since we have region and color, it changed the color of all of those to match the region legend. Now we're going to drag the region field to filters and we want to select none and then select central and click OK. So you only have the blue shape on there for the central region. We're going to go to the size on the marks card and I'm going to increase the size of that shape. And then I'm going to go up to the toolbar and change it to fit the width. And that's about a good size for the shape. What we're going to do is we're going to go to the label on the marks card, show the mark label, and we want to format that label. So let's go down to the font, change it to 20 point, bold, and we're going to give it a corresponding blue color. Now we're going to hide the title on the sheet and we are going to name the sheet central graphic. And now we're going to copy the sheet. On the copy of the sheet, we are going to change the filter. So I'm going to just right click and edit the filter in the shelf and uncheck central and check east and then OK. So now it updates to the east color. And what we want to do is we want to go to label and change the label color to match the graphic. So now what I'm going to have you do on your own, you're going to copy the sheet two more times. You can copy East graphic and you're going to change the region and change the color of the mark. So the label, 
and uh, go ahead and do that now. And then I'll be doing it on my end and we'll compare when we're done. So go ahead and pause the video. So here is my West graphic, which is my last sheet. And here is my South graphic. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and move on and create the other things that are necessary to make this into an infographic dashboard. So we're going to make individual dashboards for each region ultimately. But before we do so, we're gonna create another two visualizations that will also go on the dashboards. And so let's bring up a new sheet. And on this sheet, let's drag order date to columns. We're gonna leave it on year. Sales to rows. Region to color. And we want region to be in the filter as well. Let's go ahead and filter for central and click OK. Let's go ahead and change it to fit with. And we don't like seeing it up at the top. You can go ahead and hide the title. And by the way, we can get rid of that region card on the right. We can hide the card. And we want it to scale better. So we're gonna change the axis. I'm going to right click on the axis and choose edit. And on the right, I'm going to uncheck include zero. And you see how it sizes it more appropriately. And we can close the edit access box. Let's go ahead and show mark labels. And let's format the font, make it bold and make it blue. There's another cool feature we haven't covered yet. Right click anywhere on the line and choose explain data. And the data guide will open on the right side of the screen. So it lets you know whatever mark, I happen to have a mark selected, so I'll deselect the mark. So it gives you the viz details. You could enter a description that helps users understand this viz. And we don't have to do that. Additional resources, you can add a link, any applied filters, the data that's in this viz, no outlier marks found. If I click on a mark, then it updates to let me know the data in that is represented in that mark. And it gives you an explanation now, explore, explore underlying values for central. And then it gives you the high amount for sum of sales, so on and so forth. Down at the bottom, what is unique about central 2021? Oops, and now it's executing the query for me. So down at the bottom, it says 16 of 34 fields analyzed. So it analyzes all the other dimensions. And then it gives you other dimensions of interest, right? And up at the top, there is a back pointing arrow. So we can go back to the first page of the data guide. And I'm going to deselect that mark. And we're gonna name this sheet Annual Sales 
by region. And then I'm going to do a colon and a space and type central. So now the cool thing is you're going to get to do this on your own three more times. We need one for East, West and South. So just like we did with the graphics, before we start doing that, go back to your central graphic and notice that the data guide is showing there as well. Let's go to the region card and hide the card. And we're going to do the same for the other graphic sheets. I forgot to have us hide the card. If we had hit it on the first one, then it wouldn't be on the copies, but better late than never. We're just not going to need that on the dashboard. So now I'm ready to copy the annual sales by region central sheet. And again, you're going to just do one sheet for each region. Go ahead and do that on your own, pause the video, and I'll be doing it on my end as well. So here is my East one. I just actually renamed the sheet, changed the filter, and colored the label to match the line. Here's my South, same thing. And here is my West. So we've created the graphic sheets. We created the individual line chart sheets. Now we're going to create another sheet that has a different type of visualization on it. And it's going to be for all regions. So we won't have to duplicate this one at all. Let's go ahead and bring up a new sheet. And for this one, we're going to drag order date and sales to columns. And we want region to be in our rows and also region on color. We don't need a filter here. We can go ahead and hide that region legend card. We're going to hide the title. And we want to show the mark labels and go to the font so we can format them as bold. And then let me go back to label and for the alignment, we're going to choose the horizontal center option. So they're inside the bars. We're going to name this sheet all sales by region and year. And so your data guide updates for every visualization that you're on. A couple of the lines had an outlier, but this one has two outliers, meaning the values are dramatically different than the other values across all of these different regions. And now we're ready to bring up a new dashboard sheet. Once you bring up the dashboard sheet, change your size on the sheet and save your file. So I've made my size on this one. I did this one at 1600 by 900 because I want to accommodate for this data guide on the right, which carries over. And when we're done with creating this dashboard, we're going to collapse this panel. So there'll be more space. If you can make yours wider, go ahead and do so. And now we're going to start building this dashboard. So the first thing that we want to do is we're going to, I'm going to scroll down in the list so I can see all my graphics. 
We want to make sure this is on tiled at the bottom. It should be. But we're going to grab the central graphic and drag it into the view. And then instead of entire view, we're going to do fit width. And even though we hid the title on the graphic, it's coming over here. So let's go ahead and hide the title. And I'm going to just move this panel over a little bit while we're working. And then I'll resize it a little bit bigger at the end. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to, where is it? We're going to grab our annual sales by region central and drag it on the bottom half of the dashboard. And then we're going to drag it its top edge up so it's right underneath the graphic. And now we're going to grab all sales by region and year and drag that on to the bottom. And for that one, instead of standard, we're going to do fit height. And let me check the line chart. For the line chart, we'll just change it to fit width. So the first two are fit width. And then the last one is fit height to fill the rest of the remaining space down there. I'm going to go to the dashboard menu and choose format. And for dashboard shading, I'm going to do that pale orangey color. Just so we kind of have those white spaces filled in with something. We're going to name this dashboard. We'll name it Central Region Sales. And then we can go ahead. I'm going to close the format dashboard pane and show the dashboard title. Eh, that's kind of okay. I think um, I'm going to right click on the title and format it. And I want to change the font or the shading of the dashboard title to match the color of the graphic. So some kind of bluish color. I think that might work. Uh, I don't really like that. So. I am going to do control Z, the handy undo. And you can fiddle with that color for the title on your own if you want. I mean, it's not bad, but it's okay. Let's go ahead and we're going to hide the title on our line chart. And we're going to hide the title on the bottom chart. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the format dashboard pane. And up at the top where you have your dashboard and your layout tab, there's a left pointing arrow. Click it so you can collapse that pane. And then I can widen the data guide to take up more space. And so let me do something here. It's like the top of my head is cut off. I'll fix that later. So whatever visualization you're on, the data guide will update. And this would be something that I would put a caption on it, you know, just explaining what's on here. So let's put the caption on the graphic one. So we'll go to worksheet, show caption. And so we're going to edit that. I'm going to select all of the information. I'm 
and I'll put the infographic is showing the total sales amount for the particular region. I press in, oh. And then I'm gonna type the line chart is showing the sales by year for the same region. And then the bar chart is showing the sales by year for all regions, something like that, and apply. And then I'm going to select it. So since we have that dashboard background color thing happening there, and the captions coming up with that same color, I'm going to leave the font black, but I'm going to make it bold and then apply. So it kind of stands out. And that is your central region sales dashboard with an infographic on the top. You have your line chart for that region in the middle, and then you are able to assess all region sales by year at the bottom. So you're gonna have another opportunity to create three more dashboards on your own. I would suggest copying and just switching out the graphics. So go ahead and get started on that, or you can build them from scratch. Go ahead and pause the video. I'm going to build mine as well. So on my central one, I right clicked on the dashboard title and I went to edit height and I changed it to 24. Then I formatted the title so that it's bold and it's on the left side. So it's not sitting right above the graphic. And here is my east, my south, and my west. And I actually went to central and copied the text from the caption so I could make sure it was consistent across all of the dashboards. And I named each one accordingly. So that is one way that you can have an infographic on a dashboard. And like I said, in that folder, there are other shapes that you can play with on your own and make them into something. Go ahead and save your file. In this module, we started with string manipulation and we created a calculated field that combined the customer first, separated by a space, and then the customer last fields. Now, you know, when we originally started, we hid the customer name field. As mentioned, we could have unhidden it and used that, but it was more fun to show you how to combine. And then we did another calculated field where we arranged it so it would be last name, comma, first name. We talked about potentially having the correct data exports from Tableau to Excel. You learned that Tableau arranges by dimensions, then measures, and each is arranged alphabetically. And really, you're more likely to have to correct data exports when you're using a larger amount of data than we're able to with this file. So we reviewed it and you learned a little trick. It didn't happen. I wanted us to get an error message, which I know sounds strange, but sometimes once you do the export to Excel, if you don't save or close the Excel file and you try to do another export, you'll get an error message. In lesson three, you learned how to blend data we opened both of the Excel files first so you could see 
the difference in the data and the similarities in the data between the two files. You learned how to bring in the primary data source and then how to edit blend relationships if necessary. You learned that the primary data source will have a blue check mark and the secondary will have an orange check mark and an orange bar down the side of the data pane. Once you use a field from the secondary data source, all of the fields will have an orange check mark on them as well on their pills. We learned some optimizing tips for efficient, fast visualizations on dashboard. And so we removed a sheet from a dashboard and used the dashboard action of go to sheet and wrote some explanatory text so they could see a more granular level of detail without having both of those visualizations on the dashboard. You also learned how to look at your status bar to see how many marks are in the view. If you have a lot of marks, you want to consider using some optimizing tips. And we ended by creating infographics, which we ended up using on our dashboards so we could see sales information for each individual region. We created four dashboards, one for each region. And you do have that link at the bottom where you can grab some more images that are not included in the files for video description for your future use. In module 15, we're gonna cover visual best practices. Now, most of this stuff we've been doing all along. We've been coloring our numbers. We've been using dual axes charts two different ways. We talked about pie charts and how they're good as a supplemental chart, but not so good just on their own. And we've been sizing our marks in order to make the information more prevalent. The one thing that we haven't done is in lesson three, where is the three dimensional data? That's gonna be a really cool lesson. In the meantime, for the other lessons where we already have experience with those topics, I'm gonna have you do some things on your own while I'm doing some things on my own, and then I'll show you what I've done in order to meet the criteria. So let's go ahead and get started. So in terms of coloring your numbers, I'm going to have you go to your top 10 products by sales value sheet. And you're gonna do this on your own. I'll be doing it and then I'll show you what I've done at the end. But what I'd like you to do is I want to leave this particular sheet intact. So you might want to make a copy of it, or you can start from scratch, your choice. And what I'd like it to be would be the top four products by sales value by region. And I'd like region to provide the color on the bars. And I'd like the mark labels to be bold. So top four products by region and sales value. I would like the region to provide the color and I would like the mark labels to be bold. Go ahead and do that one. So this is what I came up with for that challenge. And you can see which shelves and marks that I used. And I changed the filter so it reflected top four. All right, so the next challenge for you, what I'd like you to do, the topic is dueling with dual axes. I would like you to create two dual axes charts, 
one by using show me and the other by dragging and dropping it when you see the dashed line. And then I'll show you what I do to that effect. You can use any dimensions and measures that you would like. So this one I did for the United States cost and profit by year. This one I used the show me pane. And that's why I hid my explain data panel over there. And then the other one I did, I used drag and drop. And this is for the United States sum and quantity. Well, quantity and sales by year. So you can drag and drop. Sometimes you have to use the show me pane. If you put both measures on the rose shelf, it may give you a different kind of visualization. So I actually use drag and drop for this one and show me on the other. So the next topic in order is connecting to 3D data but we're gonna do that at the end of this module because we're gonna be using a different data source. So I'm gonna come back to that topic. In the meantime, I have another assignment for you. And this one is eating humble pie, pie charts or not. What I'd like you to do is create two pie charts using whatever measures and dimensions you like. When you're done, I'll show you the ones that I am creating. My first one is max cost by region. Nothing on the shelves up here, everything on the Marx card. And my second one is profit by state province group, the group that we created and I'm showing mark labels on both of them. Our next topic is sizing to make a data story. So with my first pie chart here on the screen, you can see that I changed it to fit the entire view. And so even though it's fitting the entire view, it's still kind of small. Now the next thing you'll notice, and you've seen this before with a pie chart, size is used for whatever measure you're using on your pie chart, as well as angle. But even though a size is automatically being used for that, once you make it into a pie chart, you can still use size to increase the size of the pie chart even though it's filling the entire view. So this one you don't have to do on your own. I'm just gonna go to size and I'm gonna drag the bar to right before the next mark on the bar. And you see how it fills up more of the view, which is better to look at it that way. You can actually see it better. And then I'm gonna do the same thing with the other pie chart that I created and now that's also sized accordingly. So what we're gonna do now, we have one more topic in this module. And like I said, this module was, since we've done a lot of these things throughout the course, I wanted you to be able to do some things on your own and then see my result at least. And so we're gonna be using a different file for connecting to 3D data. And so what we wanna do is go ahead and save and close from the file menu, your sample Superstore workbook. When I reviewed this slide with you afterwards, I realized that I didn't put the files that we're gonna be using for lesson three on the slide. So I've edited it and added that because the slideshow is also in the files for the video description and I want you to have it as a reference. So for lesson three, we're gonna be using an Excel file called 3D data 
And we're going to be using some more of the shapes that we've already put into our My Shapes folder in the Tableau repository. So if you haven't grabbed all the files from the video description, I need you to grab the 3D data Excel file. And when you put it in your working directory, go ahead and open that file. We're going to start by looking at that file and getting some information from it. As you can see, this file has two sheet tabs. The first one is profit ratio broken out by subcategory. And the second one is called densification. And let's take a look at that one. And so data densification is a process in which marks are generated in Tableau and added to the view, even though those marks aren't supported by records in the underlying data source. So the densification technique being used here will help us plot multiple points between zero and 100. And if you notice, on the profit ratio, we don't have those values. So we're going to force them to happen, even though they aren't supported by any records in the underlying data source. So the other thing is, and I'm going to write it down so we remember, I'm going to make note of the highest profit ratio, which is 44. So I've noted that down we can go ahead and close this Excel file and connect to it in Tableau. The first thing we're going to do is drag profit ratio onto the canvas. And then we are going to double click on it to get to the physical layer and we're going to drag densification onto the canvas. So it's going to want to create an inner join. That's the most common join type where it's really bringing in matching records, right? Only records that match. And so what we're going to do is create a join calculation for both profit ratio, which is listed here for data source, and then for densification. So we're going to go ahead and click on create join calculation, and you're going to type the number one and click OK. And I'll explain it after we get it in. And then you're going to do the same thing underneath densification. So you're going to go to the drop down arrow, create a join calculation, and type the number one. So when you do that, the tables are joined on an inner join using the join calculation. So I'm going to go ahead and close the join box. And to show you why we did that, if we look down at the data, you'll see that for every subcategory, there are two rows. And if you look over to the right in the densification column, it's giving you a row for the upper limit of the path that we want for the lower limit. So 100 and 0 for each of the subcategories in our data. That's what that join calculation did. So our next step is to go to Sheet View. And we're going to create a bin for the path measure there. So we're going to right click on path, hover over create and choose bins. So you worked with bins when we did the histogram earlier in the course. And all we want to do here is make the size of the bin one. And then we're going to click OK. So some of this will tie together in a few more steps. So we created our path bin, and now we're going to create a calculated field. 
and we're going to name it index. And the calculation we're going to do is going to be 100 minus, and then we're going to use Tableau's index function, which if you look on the right side, you see that it returns the index of the current row in the partition. Example, for the first row in the parti partition, index would equal one. So we want 100 minus the index. We're going to go ahead and click OK. And that calculation will plot the X axis values from 100 through zero, which is what we want. And now we're going to create another calculated field and we're going to call it profit ratio value. And this calculation, we're going to use the window max function to get the max of all the data, the max value of all the data in the view. And then we also want, we're going to type max and use the max function again. And we want the maximum profit ratio. So here you'll see, we want the one that's a measure that's green and it says profit ratio. And then in parentheses, profit ratio, that's the one we're choosing. And so we want to be able to compare the max profit ratio from the window with the max profit ratio. And we're going to go ahead and click OK. So now we have our index and our profit ratio value calculated fields. Now we're going to create another calculated field. So again, bear with me. Once we start putting it all together, it will make a lot more sense than it does doing the individual steps. We have one more calculated field to create. And we're going to name this one row. And we're going to use an if then else construct here. So I'm going to grab the if function and I'm going to reference index and not the function, but the calculated field that we created. So if index, and we're going to do less than equal, and we're going to grab profit ratio value calculated field, Then we're going to grab the then function and we're going to reference our index calculated field again. Grab else function and we're going to use the null function and we need to give it an end statement. So if the index is less than or equal to the profit ratio value, then use the index or else leave it blank or leave it as a null. And we're going to click OK. So now we have our three calculated fields. We're going to change the mark type to shape. And we're going to drag subcategory to columns. And we're also going to drag subcategory to shape. We're going to grab our path bin and we want to drop that on detail. Looks weird right now. And we're going to drag our row calculation to rows.
and we want the row calculation to compute using the path bin. So we're going to right click on it, hover over compute using and choose path bin. So right now, look at the numbers on the axis and we want them to be from zero to 100. So in order to make that happen, we're going to do a few things. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to edit the index calculated field. And we're going to use apply here. Let me collapse this right side, move it over. We're going to use apply when we do our changes and leave this window open so we can keep changing things. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to delete the 100. And apply. And you notice now, because we left the minus sign in the calculation, it's going from zero to negative 100. All right. And that's not what we want. The axis is negative. So now we're going to edit it again and we're going to do 50 minus index and apply. And since we want the axis to have a range of values of, you know, equaling a hundred, now it's going from positive 50 to negative 50 because we're plotting 100 points. Change it back to 100 and apply. And so our highest value is 44. And that's why it looks like that right now. So go ahead and click OK on our index calculation for right now. And we're going to go to shape on the mark shelf. And we're going to do the drop down next to default, go to my shapes. So in my shapes, we use the people shapes earlier, right? And we're going to use these 3d square shapes. So I'm going to select copiers and give it the first 3D square. Select the envelope, give it the second one, and continue going down the list, assigning the squares to the different subcategories. And we're gonna go ahead and click OK. Wow, we're getting there. Not quite done yet. Not quite done yet. Let's switch it to entire view. And we're going to go to the size on the marks card. And I'm going to increase the size. Let me go a little bit more. Looking pretty good right now. We have some other cleanup work to do here. On the left side, let's um, right click on the axis and get rid of show header. And then I'm going to right click on the rose pill and go to format. Actually, I'm going to right click inside the chart and go to format. And I'm on the sheet tab and we're going to go to the lines. And for the sheet, 
We don't want to see any grid lines. That's already on none. We don't want to see zero lines. And we don't want to see axis ruler lines. And then go to rows. And it's the same thing. We want none on the top two and none for axis rulers. So you get rid of all those grid lines in the background. And then we can go ahead and close the format pane. And we're going to drag profit ratio value to label. So you see at the bottom of each shape, you're seeing the profit ratio value. And what we want to do is we're going to go to label and let's go to the font and make it 12 point. I'm going to color it like a darkish gray color. And then I'm going to go to the text. And at the end of that, I'm going to type a percent sign and click apply. And you can see the change at the bottom. Now we really want those percentages at the top. So I'm going to click okay on the edit label and I'm going to go to the alignment and I'm going to do the top aligned under vertical. So now they're on the top of our 3D shapes. And we're going to right click on the subcategory title and format it. And we want to make that font 14 point. And so a lot of steps in the process. However, the end result is this, a pretty nice looking 3D chart. And what we're going to do now is we're going to name the sheet. We'll just call it 3D chart. And you're going to save and close this file and you're going to name it. You can call it 3D data as the workbook name, close it and reopen Superstore Live. This module, you got a lot of hands-on and on your own practice with things that we've been covering throughout the course, like coloring your numbers, dueling with dual axes, eating humble pie, pie charts or not, and sizing to make a data story. What was new here is the three-dimensional data. So I know that that process is kind of long. I mean, we had three calculated fields. We had a bin. We had all kinds of stuff going on. We used the shapes, but the end result was really, really cool. So now you have an example of how to do three-dimensional data using those custom shapes in Tableau. In our final module, you'll learn how to share your information. We did a little bit of this earlier in the course. In the first lesson, you'll learn how to package your workbooks. Lesson two, how to publish to Tableau Public. And lesson three, mobilizing your dashboards. Let's get started. So earlier in the course, much earlier, we created a packaged workbook. We used our vehicles and pricing file in order to do so because we have both of those Excel files saved locally. Sample Superstore is different because we got this from within Tableau and we don't have the data source or images saved locally. So what we're going to do here is let's save and close our sample superstore file. 
And let's go to our start screen and reopen 3D data because we have that Excel file stored locally. And when you export a package workbook, it contains the locally saved files and images. And so we're gonna go to the file tab and we're gonna choose export packaged workbook. And we'll name it 3D data dash packaged. And just a reminder, it gives it a different extension dot TWBX. And the icon has like a, I don't even know what color that is, but it has a vertical band on the left hand side. And of course you can always look at the type and we're going to save. So you can literally send that to anyone that has Tableau desktop, Tableau reader, and they can open it and have access to the data source and the images. Go ahead and create a dashboard sheet. And you're going to go and just add this visualization to it. Let me change my size first. Now we're not going to do anything else to it on a dashboard because I want to leave this for you for, to play with, you know, later on your own, adding other objects to it or dashboard actions or coloration, whatever you want to do with it, adding captions and stuff like that might be helpful. So I just wanted to put it on a dashboard and I'm going to name the dashboard 3D sub category. And this is profit ratio. And then I'm going to hide the title at the top. And I'm going to show the dashboard title, which will be the same as what we named the sheet. And now let's save. And we want to publish this to Tableau public. So in order to do that, you're going to go up to the server menu and at the bottom, you'll see Tableau public and you can save, you can open from Tableau public, save to Tableau public or save as we're going to choose save to Tableau public. And Tableau public is the free version of Tableau. If you don't have an account, you can go to the bottom and create one now for free. I'm going to, if you do have an account, you just need to log into it. So I'm going to do that now and sign in. So this is good. I tried to show you an error earlier and couldn't make it happen. So this is saying that the Tableau server you are publishing to, which is Tableau public, does not permit external database connections. Use the data menu to create an extract for the following data sources. So I'm gonna click okay. And I'm gonna go to the data, actually I'm gonna do it like this, let's see. So right here on the data menu, you're going to hover over profit ratio plus 3D data, and you're going to choose extract data. And specify how to store data in the extract. So store data using one table for each logical table. So we're going to go down. And it says, use this option if you need to use extract filters, aggregation, or other extract settings. If I 
do the option button for physical tables, it wants to know like how much data to extract and everything is kind of dimmed out here. You can't do anything but go to extract at the bottom. So let's click extract at the bottom. So other extracts that you have, you know, they have the uh, dot hyper extension and we're going to leave the same file name and save. And then now I can go back to the server menu, hover over Tableau public and save to Tableau public. And so anyone else on Tableau public can look for and find this visualization. And by the way, I should address this. It's, it's my name is Trish Connor Cato, but it says Veronica Young here. I'm using another account from my company with a different employee name. So that's what's going on there. But here is the details, the date it was published, 3D data, so on and so forth. There's some controls at the bottom where this visualization can be shared, right? It can be downloaded and you can look at it in full screen. So that's kind of how that goes. Now I'm back in Tableau desktop and I want to focus on the left side of the screen. I briefly mentioned that there is a phone view here, right? Where when you have a dashboard and you switch to phone view, it lets you see how it would look if it was viewed on a mobile device. Now Tableau does have a mobile app and it's available for both Apple and in the Google store. And it doesn't allow you to do any edits. It basically allows you to view stuff. So this view gives you an idea of what it's going to look like. And depending on the size of the mobile devices that are being used. So if you hover over an edge, it will pop up. Do you want to turn off the auto generated layout and create a custom one? Well, this looks about the size of, of most people's cell phones. So I'm going to say no here and leave it like that. And then right underneath where it says phone, you have device preview. So now you get a little bit of a toolbar up here and it's showing you the phone dimensions and you can adjust it even though we said no. So here's specific phones. Like if you know everybody's using iPhones, that kind of thing, you can go ahead and change it to the type of phone that is being used. And so just by doing that, I'm going to put mine on a Samsung Galaxy S series layout. That's kind of how that works. And it will auto generate a layout for you. However, it's best if you look at it and make sure it's appropriate for the devices that are being used in your organization. Go ahead and save. And now we can change it back to default. And something else I want to show you is the layout tab at the top, All right? So we only have the 3D chart on here. I mean, some of this you can do from the dashboard, show title, whether it's floating type of thing. You can actually put in position and size coordinates. You can apply a border to it. And it kind of shows inside the pane there, the border, right? So, and you could make it thicker by using these boxes if you'd like. So I took the border away. 
And sometimes it depends on what kind of data is on the sheet or what kind of visualization I should say. Sometimes the outer and inner padding, you can kind of play around with that as well. So go ahead and save one more time. In this module, we begin by packaging our workbook with the 3D data. And we use that one because we have the actual data source and shape files saved locally, which become part of the package. Then we moved on to publishing to Tableau Public. And we use the server menu for that. Tableau Public, again, is the free component of Tableau. And when we tried to publish it, we got an error message. And the error message basically led us to having to create an extract in order to be able to publish to Tableau Public. So we were successful with publishing it and we viewed it on Tableau Public and you saw that people can share from there, they can download it, so on and so forth. And in the final lesson, you learned how to mobilize your dashboards. You learned that Tableau has a mobile app available both for Apple and like Samsung phones, Androids, I should say. So available for both Apple and Android in their respective stores. And you learned how to change the layout and how you could even assign it to a specific phone. And so depending on what your organization uses, you also learn that when the mobile app is being used, it doesn't allow editing. It's just for viewing. In this extensive course, we started by connecting to a variety of data sources, in particular text, Excel, and access database data sources. We spent some time learning how to make dashboards relevant. We did some string manipulation. So we used the concatenation character to put customer first and customer last together again with a space in between. And we even did the reverse where we had customer last comma customer first. We also concatenated region and state fields with slashes in between. I tried to have an error come up when we were correcting data exports from Tableau to Excel, but you learned how Tableau arranges the data when you're doing that, and you learned what to look out for. Then we got into blending data. So we had two separate Excel files that we used. You also learned how to edit blend relationships and about the color coding. So the primary data source will be with a blue check mark. Secondary has an orange check and an orange bar down the side of the data pane. And when you use a field in the view from the secondary, that field will have an orange check mark on it also. And we learned how to exclude one bit of data. We went over some optimizing tips for efficient, fast visualization, and we removed the state by sales table from the state by sales map dashboard. And we used a dashboard action to link to the sheet instead. Then we got into the fun stuff by adding an infographic to the Tableau dashboard. And so we went through that process partly with my guidance, and then you got to do a lot of it on your own, which is always good. And we ultimately ended up creating an individual dashboard for each region. We went over visual best practices. So you got a lot more hands on here what was really new here, so you got to do some examples of coloring your numbers, dueling with dual axes, and pie charts or not, 
and sizing to make a data story. The new information here was creating three-dimensional data. So we went through the process of doing that. We had like, I believe three calculated fields, a bin. Um, you learned a little bit about the densification technique, so on and so forth. And I thought that ended up being a really nice 3D column chart. And then we ended by reviewing how to package workbooks with data. And then we published to Tableau Public. And when we did that, we got an error, which basically said we had to create an extract in order to be able to publish. So we did that and we were able to view it in Tableau Public and see what options are out there. Then you learned about mobilizing your dashboards. You learned about the Tableau mobile app that's available in the Apple store, as well as the Android store, the Google store. And we learned how to affect the layout in mobile view. Thanks for watching. To earn certificates and watch our courses without ads, check out learnitanytime.com.